Are we ready? Yep. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the 9.30 a.m. public portion of the closed session of the September 22nd, 2020 meeting of the City Council. If you wish to com comment on a closed session item, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. In this part of the meeting, the Council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the public line will be closed and inaccessible. Please meet your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note, there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your tele television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meetings. I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, and I will note Mayor Cummings is now with us. Uh, council member Byers? Aye, here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Golder? Present. Watkins? Uh, Council Member Watkins is currently absent. Oh no, here, she's joining. Um, Vice Mayor Myers? Here. Mayor Cummings? Here. And back up to Council Member Watkins? Here. Okay. Okay, first item on our agenda is our closed session is there any member of the public who would like to comment on items that are on our closed session agenda today? If there are members of the public who would like to comment on closed session items, now is the, the time to call in using the numbers on your screen. Once you call in, you'll need to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you'll be given two minutes to speak. No members of the public who would like to comment on our closed session items. Um, we'll go ahead and move into closed session. Um, if there's any staff on the line who are not participating in closed session, I'd like to ask that you please uh, come back and join us uh, when we go into open session. Okay, so the webinar's been locked. Hello, Mayor Cummings. Morning, Susan, how you doing? Good, thank you. Great. All right, do we have how everyone about you? I've been doing good. I've been um, busy with, well, after tomorrow, I'm actually leaving to go uh, do some drone flights of sites that have been burned from the fires. So just trying to oh. get everything together and get ready to head out to the field. So busy. So. All right, I think we have, do we have everyone? Yep, looks like everyone's here, so I guess we can go ahead and get started. Okay, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to our 10.30 a.m. session of the Santa Cruz course of the City Council. A few announcements, and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating remotely today, and I want to thank the community for staying home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, please call in at the beginning of the item you, uh, you want to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note that there's a delay in streaming, and so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it's time for public comment, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and when it's your time to speak during public comment, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. The time will then be set to two minutes, and you may hang up once you've commented on the item of interest. With that, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Byers? Here. Matthews? 
Here. Brown? Here. Golder? Here. Watkin? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. I would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Waswa speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsun tribal band comprised of descendants of indigenous people taken to Mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore tr traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historic trauma. Uh, before we begin with our um, first item, I would like uh, to take a moment of silence to honor the passing of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Appointed by Bill Clinton in 1993, Justice Ginsburg was the second woman to serve on the Supreme Court after Sandra Day O'Connor. Ginsburg was a strong advocate for gender equality and women's rights and will be remembered as one of our country's most inspirational and powerful women. On September 18, 2020, Justice Ginsburg passed from complications with metastatic pancreatic cancer at the age of 87 after serving 27 years on the Supreme Court. She will be remembered for her courage, and we thank her for her years of service, dedication, for standing up to defend rights of all Americans, and is an inspiration for future generations. And with that, I would like to uh, see if members of the council, our staff, could join us in a moment of silence. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much. Uh, the second announcement I would like to make is that I want members of the public to know that given the pandemic and other crises that we have been faced with in our community, many items that would have come earlier on the city council agenda have needed to be shifted and be postponed in order to ensure that um, our meetings are done in a timely manner. As we near the end of the year and try to return to some form of normalcy, we're doing our best to adjust the agenda so that our meetings are manageable. Uh, m many members of the public have been contacting us to inquire about the Felix Street project application, and I want the public to know that we are intending to put the Felix Street application on the next regularly scheduled council meeting, which will be occur on October 13th, 2020. So council members are receiving emails. Um, you can let folks know that we will be um, intending to put the Felix Street item on our agenda for October 13th. Okay, so with that, we'll move on to our first presentation. Uh, this is the city's consolidated online payment portal, My City of Santa Cruz, and will be presented by Ken Morgan, Director of uh, Information and Technology. Is everyone viewing my screen? Yes. Great. So, good morning, uh, Mayor Cummings and City Council. My name is Ken Morgan, uh, IT Director for the City of Santa Cruz, and I'm really excited to talk to you this morning about the city's new consolidated online payment portal. Uh, for some time now, uh, IT and a number of departments have been working on this portal. Uh, we've had some distractions in 2020, but we regained momentum, and the first phase of the platform is moving from our user acceptance testing environment to production on October 1st. Um, as you can see from the screenshot, My City of Santa Cruz is the name of the portal. Uh, and My City of Santa Cruz was created because of an uh, ongoing need to provide a location that uh, aggregates the, the payment platforms that the city offers and really make that customer transaction process as uniform as possible. Uh, the city currently has about 10 different payment types uh, for various business needs. Uh, each has their own individual portal uh, for processing payments and doing business with the city and some with no online presence at all. So this first phase of My City really 
really provided the foundation for consolidating these transaction types to a single location. Uh, but at the same time, it, it was designed to go a step further and really aid as a business center and automate some business processes that are currently performed manually and really saving uh, quite a bit of time, not only for city employees, but for our customers and kind of increasing visibility for providing these services. Uh, we partnered with Interfile on the project. Uh, Interfile has been doing business throughout Europe uh, and South Africa for many years. They have developed and implemented this uh, payment portal tool for uh, organizations the equivalent size and scope is the IRS. Uh, so we're doing a two-phase implementation with them, and we are anticipating that much of the implementation costs that the city spent on phase one, uh, as well as upcoming phase two, will be offset in credit card transaction cost savings within the first 12 to 18 months. So we're really excited about that. And as you can see, our initial phase includes utility billing, uh, business license applications and renewals, our residential rental inspection services applications and renewals, and then uh, COBRA and donations. Uh, and I just want to talk briefly about the transaction types and then jump over to the site to give you a little preview. So um, utility bills is really kind of the big kahuna at the city. It generates the largest volume of online track transactions. On average, we're seeing about $2 million a month in online payments for UB. Uh, and uh, we have 15,000 existing uh, customers using uh, online billing. So while we knew it would be a challenge to uh, convert these 15,000 customers, we also knew that once we have successfully migrated them to my city, we inherit 15,000 anchor accounts in the platform that really sets the stage for streamlining customer uptake in the future and for any future transaction types that we might add to the platform. So it was really important to include UB in our first phase. Uh, a huge thanks to the water department there in the midst of a, uh, a lot of uh, daily distractions and responsibilities and, and agree to partner us with, uh, for this first phase, so super helpful. As for benefits to our, our utility billing customers, we have all the features that existed on the previous platform exist on MyCity. We've added additional payment types. We now can do e-checks, which uh, the utilities team is really excited about, uh, ACH, which is really just that kind of bank-to-bank -bank transfer of payments. This is now an automated process, whereas there was a four-week uh, application process that existed previously. Um, we now have the ability for real-time payment recognition, and this is bidirectionally between our internal uh, billing application and my city. So rather than the customers or our UB staff having to wait the 24 hours or so for reconciliation, this is now automated. Uh, and then uh, the feature that we're, we're most proud of is the ability to delegate accounts. So. For example, if I live in a co-housing scenario, I can now delegate permissions to my housemates or tenants to view or pay those bills. Or if my home is being uh, managed by a property manager, I can delegate various roles to that manager to pay or view those bills. Uh, and then alternatively, if I am that property manager, I now have the flexibility of managing 15, 20, all of my, my rentals from uh, a single My City profile. So a big win for that community too. Um, benefits to the water department and really the city as a whole, by consolidating payment portals to a single site, we are also consolidating credit card processing merchants to a single vendor. And uh, in the case of my city of Santa Cruz, we're using Card Connect. So from a financial perspective, this really allowed the city to leverage uh, our added transactional volume to a lower per transaction cost. And with utility billing alone, we're anticipating a $2,000 a month savings, uh, so uh, a big win for the, for the city there. Um, and then other benefits to the water department. I, I mentioned the real-time payment recognition that's going to be part of the platform. We're doing a lot of this using some automation software that communicates between my city and our internal apps. Um, we've also put this automation software to work executing the entire morning reconciliation process that our UB team uh, take the, uh, processes each morning. And this is a process that requires 60 to 90 minutes of staff time. Uh, we have an individual that comes in at 6 in the morning to start this process. We have this completely hands-free now um, using our automation software, and we have it down to about 20 minutes. So we're going to be putting that into uh, production in October as well, and the utility billing team is really excited about that. Um, 
Moving on to business licenses, uh, business license was a big win when it comes to process improvement, both for the city and our business community. Our current application uh, includes uh, a number of checks and balances and fee calculations, uh, visits to our planning department, and really the tendency for a lot of uh, back and forth communication between customers and finance staff and planning staff. So it was a pretty unorthodox transaction process for all those involved. So my city really improves that for the employees. We have digital workflows, uh, work queues, email notifications, um, but for our business community, the final result is uh, an end-to-end -end digital self-service solution that really allows for the entire business license application and renewal process to be done online, um, which was not the case before. Our customers will rely on email-based notification systems or logging into the portal to kind of step them through the sequential steps of a business license application. We do address validation. We do zoning clearances. Uh, you can upload supplemental documentation. There are online affidavit agreements. Uh, and in the end, when approved, uh, you are issued a PDF business license that can be printed and, and posted in your place of business. It's um, actually a pretty elegant process compared to where we came from. It really does reduce a lot of the uh, ambiguity of responsibilities between our finance and planning departments. Uh, we're an anticipating some transactional cost savings here with, uh, with business licenses as well. And then I think most importantly, with our public counters being reduced, this really does supplement the city's ability to navigate COVID times and really diversify how we're serving that business community. Similar to business licenses, our rental inspection services program also translates to quite a bit of manual work for our staff. Uh, we do hours of data validation. We send, receive, and process physically enveloped to mail bills. Um, and the, the, the number of hours spent processing you know, mail alone was not insignificant and really was ripe for, for automation. So that is what we did. We created an online billing platform that did not exist previously. Uh, we reduced the need for snail mail processing. Processing, and this, of course, saves our employee time and reduces paper consumption. And like utility billing, we have now provided customers, and specifically those property managers, a way to uh, manage multiple properties from a single profile. So uh, again, a win for that community. Um, and then last, after uh, a few of the larger transactions, we, we needed some less complex uh, transactions, so we, we chose COBRA and donations. COBRA is a way for separated employees that want to maintain the continuity of healthcare. Um, again, this platform did not exist previously, and then uh, donations is something that uh, Finance had requested as a way for the city to kind of create ongoing or, or ad hoc uh, donation campaigns, which uh, I'll show you in one second. I think that's a good time to jump over to the site. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, phase one moves to production on October 1st. This means the site is uh, scheduled to be available to the public, uh, and of course, we'll be linking to it from the city's webpage. Uh, we're working closely with the communications teams to uh, spotlight the transition and, and communicate uh, this, this change to the public, especially those 15,000 utility billing customers. Uh, a lot of them are on auto pay. We want to make sure that uh, no one's asleep at the wheel and misses this, this transition. Uh, we have our staff trained, and we uh, should be prepared to respond and inquire and process those transactions come October 1st. Um, you can see we did our best to maintain a similar style guide as our city's primary site. Our font selection, our color scheme uh, matches our standard as well as the same sort of horizontal paint delineate the, uh, the various uh, uh, functional components of the site. Um, this top pane is our login screen. My city does require uh, registration. Uh, we will be adding the ability for those one-time payments or those guest payments, uh, but for this initial phase, we are requiring uh, registration. Um, the middle section, of course, is the business transactions that we're including in phase one. As we get to phase two and we add additional payment types, they'll be populated here. Uh, and then we have just some news events and then links to uh, contact business if there are specific questions. So. I'm going to hop back up here and just log in real quick. So 
you'll see after logging in, I'm kind of presented with that primary action page. On the left-hand side, we see a navigation pane that really replicates uh, most of what can be accomplished from these bigger buttons. Uh, I'm just going to jump through real quick. Our account manager, obviously, is for viewing and paying uh, or managing those accounts that individuals are registered for. Um, manage profile should be uh, something that you're familiar with, just updating those uh, individual attributes, uh, phone numbers, email addresses, uh, billing addresses, et cetera. Um, the submit a question has some um, nice functionality in that I can select the type of question I, I have by the transaction type uh, and then the specific account that I have. Uh, and then when submitted, that question will go directly to the, the city offices that would be able to best address those questions. I also have the ability to view the history of my questions here. Um, on the second row here, <clears throat> Our uh, residential rental inspection services. Uh, this is really where the fun starts when we talk about my city uh, as a business center and a tool for automating business process. Um, previous to, to my city, the uh, form that you will see here was a paper form that was filled out, it was mailed in, it was brought to our city offices. Uh, now folks can register in the program from the platform and once the application is submitted, they can track their changes uh, remotely by logging in or following the, uh, the status uh, update emails. Um, going a step further, once I am registered, the program uh, requires an annual renewal. So my city will, of course, notify customers that there's action to be taken and, and direct them to the portal to complete the process. You can see here this particular application is up for renewal. Um, and as part of the program, I need to approve an annual self-inspection uh, affidavit. Um, on my city, this is now an online declaration. Uh, I can simply uh, open up the document and if uh, nothing has changed, I confirm the details of my property by clicking accept at the bottom uh, and complete the process pay with a payment and I'm good to go for this year's self-inspection. If there were changes to the property, it, trigger, it triggers the uh, rental team to kind of re-engage in the process. But again, this is all completed digitally now. Um, for our zoning, and business licenses, similar to rental. This application uh, is now digitally transformed. This was a paper process previously. Uh, you can see there are a number of steps to complete in this task, uh, touch points with our planning department when it comes to address validation and zoning clearances, our finance department with regard to stipulations around business license approval and payment. Um, but again, all done online without having to come to our counters. Um, I have a couple of good examples to show you on some applications that I processed. This top one here I have submitted. You can see that the zoning application has been submitted and that the application is queued to be assessed. This means our planning department has been queued via email. They can log into the administrative portion of my city, uh, process the zoning assessment, and move it back to the customer for the business license application, and then to finance, to payment, and ultimately a certificate, which on a completed business license application, I can view my business license, I can print and download my business license, and I can place it uh, in the window of my business as per the ordinance. A couple of other things, and I'll be done here. Uh, I wanted to show you our account manager. Again, this is for accounts that I have registered for in my city. Most people probably won't have three accounts. Most people will probably just have a business license and or a water bill. In this case, I have three. I have my, my rental, I have my family utility bill, and then uh, a generic business. Uh, for the utility bill, we have access to preview the bills that are mailed to customers, either via USPS or through email. Um, we keep two years of archives. We have more, but two years typically seems to suffice. Um, I can go in and look at the details of that account. I can view payment histories, or I can pay this account. And we have multiple options for payment. We can do save banking information if I have a credit card on file or a particular bank account on file. Uh, we can do a one-time payment using the different payment uh, types that we offer, including ACH and eCheck, as I mentioned, or I may have set up a recurring payment for this account or an auto payment on a scheduled date. So. Um, 
Um, last thing is donations, and <clears throat> donations, again, is just the ability for the city to throw up ad hoc donations. We have a few campaigns that we uh, already selected, our K-9 program, our memorial benches and museums. Uh, this is obviously a test environment, so I threw up IT relief fund. Um, I can quickly run in and donate money to the good people of IT, whatever that may be. It's tied to a general ledger account on the back end uh, so that finance can, can reconcile that. Uh, and then last is just uh, some of the communication capabilities of the platform. Um, I mentioned uh, we now have the ability for SMS or text messages, um, but not only that, you can delineate the type of communication you want by account. So if I have my business license account uh, and I want email notification for that, and for my uh, uh, rental account, I want a text message, or, and for my utility billing account, uh, I want to opt out entirely. I can do that specifically by account. So not only does it give more granular control to the customer, but it also, this is the first time the city has uh, uh, added the capability of communicating via SMS with kind of an, an opt-in uh, from the customer's perspective. So. That, that is essentially the, the platform, uh, and we're going to be moving on to a phase two. We know there's going to be some opportunities uh, with our uh, planning department and um, also the parking tickets uh, as well as, as TOT. Yeah. We're looking forward to, to adding transaction types uh, in, in the next uh, six to 12 months. But before I let you go or ask questions, I just wanted to give a thanks to these people. Uh, these people worked really, really hard and provided a lot of time that they probably couldn't afford to, to make this all happen. So we're uh, from, from IT and, and the city as a whole, we're very thankful for, for them and, and all the time that they allocated. So thank you. Thanks for that presentation and it's really cool to see all this coming together and you know being able to streamline this technology and, and um, you know, make these payments easier for members of the public. Yeah. I'll turn it over to Council uh, to see if there's any questions. Council Member Watkins. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. This is fantastic and really efficient and just wonderful. Um, I just have a brief question in terms of if we have a Spanish-speaking um, member of our community, how do we um, help anticipate help supporting that uh, that population? Yeah, that's going to be a work in process. That's a good question. We, we have talked about it. Um, the initial release of this, as is, you know, our, our existing platform, InfoCin, which we currently use, is, is English only, too. But um, we've talked to the comms team about, you know, how we might be able to help facilitate that with, without doing a direct translation of the site entirely. So um, we'll, we'll get back to you as that the service improves. But uh, the first iteration of phase one is, is English only. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. No, I appreciate that you're thinking about that and working towards a solution. Yeah. Vice Mayor Myers. I had a similar question to um, to Council Member Watkins, but um, so thank you for asking that or answering that. Uh, and also, I just wanted to pass on my compliments. I think um, it's it's great that uh, you know people can get in and do what they need to do online. And I just compliment everyone. Obviously, you had a huge staff team working on this, so just many, many compliments for leading this up. And uh, I think it'll be a great, uh, greatly received by the community. So thank Ken to your entire team and to all the all the staff that worked on it. It's really impressive. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Councilmember Golder. I also want to say thank you. It looks super organized and efficient, and I love that. Um, but then I was also going to answer Councilmember Watkins' question and um, let her know that we've been working with the the parents through the schools, through our ELAC group, and teaching parents how to add extensions to their browsers where they can translate any website to whatever language they need. And so I think uh, that, I mean, it's not, not really something that the city can do, I guess, but, but um, anyway. It's the one way, maybe the county office can get the word out to their people too. Are there any further um, questions or comments? Councilmember Matthews. Uh, very quick, uh, congratulations and thank you. And I know the phase two, the um, lodging industry has been very interested in getting TOT payments online and, and I assume the neighborhood parking permits and that sort of thing are, are coming up. So it's really a big improvement in customer service. So thank you. Thank you.
appreciate it. Well, if there's no further questions or comments, thanks again, Ken, for all the hard work, and thank yeah. you. thanks to the staff for pulling this together. I'm sure it's going to you know, really help people be able to pay their bills on time and, and make this process very efficient. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, next item on our agenda is a presentation uh, uh, from Mayor, did you want to reboot the meeting? Or? Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, so before we move on to our next presentation, we've been receiving some phone calls that the call-in numbers haven't been working. So um, we're going to try restarting the meeting into rebooting Zoom, see if that helps solve the issue. And so if um, everyone can call back in in the next minute, um, we'll try to see if that solves the issue of other members so, of the public being on. So that's all of us should hang up and dial in again? Yes, okay. correct. Goodbye. So we know that you're here. We can go ahead and get started with our presentation. It looks like we have all of our council members here. Uh, I just want to let members of the public know that uh, we're having some technical difficulties with Zoom, and so the toll-free numbers are not working. Um, and so, but the toll, the non-toll-free numbers are working. So, what I would recommend is that members of the public would like to comment on an item that uh, after the presentation, when we move on to public comment, that you call in uh, for that item to comment on, which will reduce the amount of time that you're on the line and any charges that might incur. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, move on to our next presentation, which is by Susan True from the Community Foundation. Um, and I would just like to say, you know, let the community know that the Community Foundation has been doing a wonderful and fantastic job with all the support they've been able to provide our community during these very challenging times. And Susan, I wanna thank you and your team for all the hard work that you've been doing throughout this process. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Vice Mayor Myers, for inviting me to um, be with you today. And we're able to do what we do because this community has been so incredibly generous, both um, through COVID and now with the fires. So it really is a reflection of this entire county and uh, the generosity that we have. So I prepared a few a few slides. Is it okay if I share my screen, Mayor? Okay, I'll just do that. And. Good, so some of you um, may first be learning about the Community Foundation because of these two disasters, but we have a long history in Santa Cruz County and um, our mission is to bring together people, ideas, and resources to do two things, inspire philanthropy and accomplish great things. We say accomplish great things in a general and um, broad way because we wanna support the incredible opportunities that happen in this community. Um, I love to think about all the efforts from soccer fields to libraries that community members want to see happen that we're able to support getting done. Um, and of course, our vision is to make Santa Cruz County a place um, where all people can thrive. And uh, we see that for now, but also into the future. We're charged with thinking long-term about our community. And um, we're a grant maker to nonprofits, and we're also a place where generous locals can come um, to plan their charitable intentions um, and to give back. We've made about $110 million in grants just locally since 1982. Um, in 2019, we're, in a, we're definitely in a growth spurt. In 2019, we did about $12 million in, in grants. And in the first half of 2020, we also did 12 million. So 12 million was our biggest year last year in grants out to the community. And um, we already have exceeded that uh, by July of 2020. So we know that there's a lot of activity related to supporting our community re related to these disasters. 
We also have a low interest loan program that we get really excited about. We can do things like pay for, you know, um, be the lender for pre-construction costs, say for Habitat for Humanity development, or help teachers buy their first houses, or um, loan money to FarmLink to help um, immigrant farm uh, farmers to have long-term leases in their land or dig a well or those kinds of things that are just hard to access capital that we're able to be a lender that's a different sort of lender. Sometimes we partner with our commercial lenders like Santa Cruz County Bank and sometimes we lend on our own. We have a really strong history of um, investment performance, so we take very seriously the stewardship of funds that have been given to us to caretake for the future. And um, we have about 100, depending on market performance, it's been a rocky year, around $140 million in assets. Um, and we came together because of a disaster. For those of you who were here in 1982, um, we got about 25 inches of rain in about 24 hours. And um, those floods in 1982 you know, caused loss of life. You can see the bridges down. Um, it was it was a um, terrible time in our community, except for that just like today, we came together to help each other, neighbors helping neighbors. And uh, this history, has, this community has such a long history of coming together to solve problems, and indeed we're seeing that today. Um, uh, Vice Mayor Myers asked me to talk a little bit about what we've been doing with um, both COVID and with the fires. So. It feels like ancient history now to go back to um, March 13th, but the evening of March 12th was when the superintendents um, announced that they would be closing schools. And we knew that we had to act swiftly. We knew that families were gonna be um, in great need starting, starting right away that weekend as they tried to make alternate care arrangements, tried to understand how they could keep working. Um, we had no idea what was in front of us, none of us did. But we launched our fund and we deployed grants immediately on March 13th. Those emergency grants were to our family resource centers. They were to Second Harvest Food Bank. We just wanted to make sure that the nonprofits that hold us all together um, were shored up for what was ahead. And right away, we decided we wanted to fill gaps. You know, philanthropy and especially local philanthropy cannot replace public dollars. We can't supplant existing resources. But what we can do is identify where the gaps are. So we right away prioritized, and we have continued to this day, to prioritize undocumented and mixed immigration status families, people who are left out of the federal stimulus, low-wage essential workers, seniors, and people with severe illnesses. And so those gaps have been where we have attended um, most of our resources. We've also really learned and, you know, taken great care with relationships that, you know, people who have been harmed by COVID, either the economic or the health impacts, trust people. And much as we love our systems, this has all come back to people, to people. And, you know, big shout out to the folks, you know, in the city like Holy Cross Food Pantry and Sendero and others who have just been so, who have pivoted what they do to much more broadly serving the community, you know, organizing around um, outreach on how transmission happens. Holy Cross Food Pantry has an incredible job of that. Um, Senderos has gone from, you know, a cultural and arts organization to an organization that makes sure that people don't lose their homes, that families don't lose their homes. And it's those kinds of relationships that are really getting us through. So we fund those organizations um, and stay in very close contact with them. We've also learned that how important it is to just build bridges, that our systems haven't always worked. This has been a stress test like no other, and our leaders are starting to fray. This is just such a hard time, and so a lot of what we do is just try to bring people together. Um, we have an Economic Recovery Council I'll talk a little bit about. We're trying to bring together leaders of color to talk about what the needs are to come out of this stronger. We try to bridge public and private um, you know, donors and nonprofits. It's a lot of what we do is just that bringing people together. Um, this is just a, a story from the executive director at Families in Transition. Again, people, we just we went into this and I just said, I just don't want another homeless family in our county um, to result from lost wages, reduced shifts, et cetera. And um, we've stayed in really close contact with the human services organizations that are serving families. We every month reach out to them and say, you know, what do you need? <laughs> we've been paying rent. I'll show you a little bit more about those grants. But um, you know, when COVID hits, along with reduced shifts in already unstable situations, it's just too precarious for so many families here. You already know that, so um, no reason, no reason for me to go on. 
um, we've granted almost three million since since those first grants on March 13th. Um, the majority has been for basic food and you know household financial assistance. So about three quarters has gone to just keep people afloat. Um, we're doing more and more now on digital divide issues. You'll be seeing um, in the media soon a new partnership with Cruz IO called Equal Access Santa Cruz County to work on bridging that digital divide. But you can see it's about a half a million a month that we've needed to do. Again, we're just in touch with those human services providers. We talk about how many families they're, they, they're serving. You know, what the, basically, it's like what the community grocery and rent bill is, and that's what we've been funding. And we fund that entirely through donations from this community. It's pretty fantastic um, what, we've, what we've done. And I also just wanted to point out um, a lot of philanthropy goes to white organizations. And a lot of times, people of color-led organizations are really left out of the mix with private philanthropy. And given um, the, the disproportionate impacts on people of color, not just in our community, but nationally of COVID, both economically and um, with a health lens, we really wanted to make sure that we were directing resources to organizations that are led by and for people of color so that um, those organizations and these communities come out of this um, disease stronger. So about 61% of our grants um, have been given to organizations led by black indigenous people of color in the community. Um, in addition to this $3 million that we've granted so far, five and a half million from our donor advisors has gone out to the community um, since March 13th. So again, donor advised funds are a way that people work with the community foundation um, to um, help organize and uh, and have more information about their grant making. So those donor advisors have been very, very active in the last six months. And I'm just gonna, there's, um, this is hyperlinked just so you can see that um, at any time you can go through and look at our grants on our website. So we've tried to be very transparent about, about this. We update it as we're doing, um, oops, sorry about that. Um, I thought that was on the grants page. As we, as we put grants into the community, we update our website. So you can go in and you can look at what we're spending on what, for whom, and kind of who these trusted partners are. So I encourage you to, um, to take a look at that at any time. And you can see there's a lot of city, um, a lot of city organizations, but the vast majority because um, the hits have been so strong in Watsonville, we have a lot of South County as well. Um, oops, I get that wrong one here. Sorry about that. We also formed the Economic Recovery Council, thanks to many of you who helped us um, populate that council. Um, and big, big thanks to Bonnie Liscombe, who's been participating um, as part of the city as well. So our first meeting was back in May. And the purpose at that time, which seems completely out of date now, was to support the safe reopening of Main Street businesses. We were really focused on bricks and mortar businesses that needed customers to come to them to survive. And at that time, we were focused on the stage two and early stage three industries um, in the governor's uh, roadmap. That, of course, has all changed now. And also it's changed. We wanted to work with the health officer to help her make informed decisions that, where she understood the constraints and opportunities of the business community. That, of course, has changed a lot now because the health officer isn't making as many local orders. The governor is. The governor's order, or the governor's staff are, and the governor's um, whole roadmap has changed to the tiered system. Of course, you all know that. So um, the, there's some shift in focus for the ERC now. But we have done a lot to establish that dialogue between small business owners and the public health officer. Um, we work with each member and their networks, whether it's the downtown association or the Capitola merchants um, or you know small immigrant-owned businesses in South County. We work with them so that they're knowledgeable about public health resources and they can push out those resources to their networks. And then um, we've worked to educate the community about essential information. I think we have thousands of views on our town halls with Dr. Marm Kilpatrick and Dr. Gail Newell. We've done the, um, you know, don't kill grandma for, for younger employees. We've done several um, Spanish language town hall, um, one for nonprofit workers that was, you know, attended by hundreds. So we've tried to do a lot to educate the community around transmission and what's happening locally. And then the lightning struck. So um, 
we found ourselves, you know, thinking we were just starting to get the hang of this COVID thing. And like many of you, found ourselves in a whole new fund and new situation. So um, as of today, we put up a fund for um, fire response, I think on August, whatever it was, 19th. Um, and as of today, we have about $2.6 million that's been committed to the fire fund. Um, our largest gift was a million dollars, but our smallest was five. And I think this is one of the things that is really touching to me is that those small gifts are often from people who just Santa Cruz mean something to them. You know, their grandma lived here, they visited their grandfather in Bonnie Dune, whatever it is. But you know, just never underestimate the power of <laughs> every individual's generosity. We've already granted out around four hundred thousand um, dollars, and I'll, I can show you what those grants are to in a moment. But, you know, the kind of buckets of need that we've found from other communities that have been through um, fires, you know, Ventura, Napa Valley, Sonoma, they tell us that there's this immediate need, and that takes about 20% of what of the funding that is raised. And then there's the rebuilding of homes and insurance advocacy. Um, we're already starting that. We have a contract already with United Policyholders to help home homeowners um, work with their insurance companies and get the maximum payout. We know there's an environmental restoration. I'm excited to hear what you learn, Mayor Cummings, from your from your drone research. Just preparing for the for the future. Fire, of course, floods. I know. I think Rosemary is, is on the call today, but I mean, you know, the protection of the San Lorenzo right now is, of course, top concern. Um, and then starting teams and bringing people together who are really hyper local. You know, what is downtown Boulder Creek going to do? What's going to happen in Davenport? Really, kind of hyper local responses. Um, those seem to be the big areas of funding needs. And I'll just click on really quick, just again, so you can see, please always feel free to check our website if you're curious about where these funds are going. We really see them as the community's funds. Um, so initial grants, um, again, you know, the, the, the Family Resource Centers, again, here, Davenport, Mountain Community, and Valley Churches have just been incredible in that first line of response. You know, farm workers who lost two weeks of wages during the evacuation needed a lot of help. Seniors who couldn't get out of Boulder Creek turned to Mountain Community Resources. Um, of course, Second Harvest, I talked about United Policyholders. So you can see right now, it's been a lot in that emergent need um, kind of funding. And now we're definitely starting to shift. And, um, and you know, you'll see that more as we move towards this rebuilding. So that's what I had prepared uh, for you. I wanted to make sure to have uh, time for questions if you needed, um, had any on your mind, but I um, just really appreciate all of your leadership. This is just such a time of all of us coming together and trying to figure out, you know, what's next, what's the next action we can all take to, to keep our community safe and hopefully get us thriving again. Susan, thank you again for all the hard work that you and the folks there have been doing to really help bring our community together. And it's, it really shows through the giving that we've seen. And, um, you know, I think now more than ever, we really all need to come together to try to support one another during this, probably one of the most difficult times we've all faced in this community. Um, I'll turn it over to council members if you all have any questions or comments. Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, Susan, I just wanted to thank you. I know you're really busy and I really appreciate you taking the time to come update us. Um, I've just been watching the progress of the Community Foundation really since day one, spoke with you really quickly right after the COVID thing broke. Um, and, um, you know, as someone who's worked in the nonprofit field for a long time, I mean, nonprofits are really the place that really pick up for the social service and the kinds of things that our community need immediately that is unfortunately really hard sometimes for government to provide. So um, really impressive that 8.5 million has been put out under the COVID relief fund. Um, that's, that's phenomenal. So I hadn't seen that number. Um, and so that just shows the level of commitment that people do when, you know, Santa Cruz uh, is in trouble and when, you know, we need to help each other. So um, really appreciate understanding a little bit more about how you're strategizing on putting um, these resources out for our nonprofits and um, how quickly you're able to respond when things are shifting. Um, that's an incredibly um, necessary thing with this changing landscape of COVID. And um, 
appreciative also within, again, a few hours of, of the fire starting up again, emailing with you and boom, off, you know, you had your, your the next fund up. So um, just the rapid response, the ability to really provide that support and service to people who are in extreme need is just, um, yeah, it's just not something that government can do. So uh, I appreciate you as such a strong partner um, countywide and also with our city nonprofits and our city res residents and citizens. So thanks for your work and um, yeah, great, great update and very helpful for us mm -hmm. to know especially going into some of our budget issues as we, we look to the future. So we, we know that there's people helping in our community and that, that really that makes, makes a big difference as a, as a policymaker that's gonna have to make some hard decisions. So thanks for your work. Thank you, thank you, Vice Mayor. Council Member Matthews. We do have an exceptionally generous engaged community and just a fabulously strong foundation. So thank you to you and your board and everyone. If someone were motivated to, vol to donate, how would they do that? They could go to our website, which is um, <laughs> communityfoundationsantacruzcounty.org, cfscc.org, and right on the front page, you'll see a, um, you know, donate to the, to the response fund for both fire and Thanks. COVID. You can find it right there. Yeah, yeah. thank you. I actually had a similar question, which was if someone needs resources, I guess what's the uh -huh. best way for them to have access to resources? Yeah, you know, we do our funding through trusted nonprofits rather than, you know, give resources directly to individuals. So the best thing is to work with those nonprofits. For example, if you have been affected by the fire, to reach out to Mountain Community Resources, Valley Churches, or Davenport Resource Service Center would be a great place to start. We do have a resource page on our website that we keep up to date. Um, sometimes we can be, a, you know, a few days ahead of um, the county's website on resources, so feel free to use that resource page as well. We know people are having a really hard time just wayfinding and, and making sense of, mm -hmm. of this new new evacuated reality for so many. <laughs> and if they called 211 for United Way, would they also be able to get access to some of the organizations that are offering these resources? Absolutely, 211 is up and running and um, actually got through a really big backlog. So hats off to our friends at 211 um, who are able to just plow through a lot of those um, responses from the early days of the evacuation. And of course, um, the recovery center at the Kaiser Arena is still up and running and a great place for, for victims of the fire. Great, thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown. Uh, I, I think all my questions have been answered and thank you so much for the presentation. I just wanted to take the opportunity to really appreciate all the work you do and the which demonstrates the collaborative spirit of our community and also the ability of uh, this institution to really harness that and, and really make a difference when it's during critical times. So thank you so much for, for being oh, here. Thank you. And for everybody. Yeah, it's been interesting to go back to our roots in disaster and realize why we were formed um, in this time because the community wants that central place to, to have a quick response, to be able to act on behalf of our neighbors, and um, we're really honored to be in that position to, to help. Great. Well, thank you again for taking the time today yeah. um, for joining us for that presentation, and we look forward to continuing to see how we can work together. Great, thank you for including me today. Thanks for all of your work, and I know we've got we've got big work ahead, so let's stay in close communication. Thank you. Sounds great. Take care. All right, so moving on, I have a few announcements, and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, the instructions will be provided on your screen. We have been having some technical difficulties with our toll-free numbers, so we ask that you use the non-toll-free numbers to call in to comment on items of interest. Uh, we will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be open for public comment. Please note that public comment is heard only on items the council is taking action on and not regular updates or reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are numbers seven through 20 on our agenda. 
Um, before we begin, I'd like to ask if there's any statements of disqualification today. Councilmember Matthews. When you're muted. Uh, I will uh, be uh, disqualified from item number 12, which is the um, contract with an owner's representative for the library mixed use project because I own property within 500 feet of the designated site. So I will leave the meeting for that item. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Are there any other statements of disqualification today? Seeing none, I'd like to ask the clerk if there's any additions or deletions. No, there are not. Thank you. Um, I'd like to make an announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on our agenda. Oral communications will occur immediately after item number 20 and will last for 30 minutes. So if you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in towards the end of item number 20 on our agenda. I'd like to ask the city attorney to provide a, a report on closed session items from today. Yes, good morning, Mayor Cummings, members of the city council. Uh, this morning, the council convened in closed session at 9.30 a.m. via Zoom uh, for two uh, items of discussion. The first was a conference with legal counsel uh, on liability claims. Those are the claims of CSAA IG and the claimant, second one is the claimant unlock. Those are also listed on your open session agenda as item 13 on the consent calendar. Um, there's no action on that item. Second item was a conference with labor negotiators. The council um, met with and received a report from its uh, labor negotiator, um, human resources director, Lisa Murphy, uh, involving all bargaining groups and there was no reportable action on that item as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, moving on, I'd like to call on the city manager to report and provide updates on city events and business items. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, today we wanted to give you an update on the eviction moratoriums and developments around, uh, as you'll recall, the city council adopted an eviction moratorium and there's been some developments at the state level. So with that, I was gonna turn it over first to Lee Butler, who will give you an update, and then also uh, our city attorney and our economic development director will also provide relevant uh, information around this topic. So turn it over to Lee, thank you. Thanks, Martine, and good morning, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development, and I'm gonna share my screen here. and see if I can get this. All right. Are you seeing this, the uh, presentation or the presentation in the slide and the uh, speaker notes as well? Just the presentation. Cool. I don't have any notes, but it would make it much smaller. So uh, back in um, June, we were looking at um, what we can do to um, really help the folks in need here, um, particularly those who have been affected by um, COVID-19 through loss of income or um, through um, uh, healthcare costs and so forth. So we uh, put out a survey and we had um, a lot of our community partners helped distribute this. Um, the Community Action Board, um, Housing Matters, COPA, Community Bridges, the school district, as well as a number of the council members um, uh, sent this information uh, out to their contacts. And um, we, we had a good response. We had um, 800 responses. Um, 771 in English and 29 in Spanish. And you'll notice that there is some overlap here, for example, in the Spanish-speaking uh, survey. Um, one member was both a renter and a landlord. So um, we, we had a, a great um, response and um, found some good information. Um, the, First question that we uh, dug into is whether folks had been laid off or lost their job. And 
Um, only 25% of the English-speaking respondents had lost their job, um, which, you know, that's still a really high percentage. Uh, but when you look at the Spanish-speaking, you know, 57% of those um, that responded indicated that they had lost their job. So, um, you know, big impacts in the community, um, which was played out here as well um, in um, pay reduction, 52% of respondents had lost pay in the English-speaking um, survey and 62% in the Spanish-speaking version had lost pay. Um, we had a smaller percentage, you know, only 6% had experienced a threat of eviction in the English-speaking community and um, the respondents in the Spanish-speaking community, um, 3% had a threat of eviction or an issuance of eviction if they were a landlord. And then um, the rent increases, similarly, you know, they were there but not uh, really prevalent. 10% um, of respondents in the English-speaking version had, um, again, since March 1st, um, received a rent increase whereas 3% of those um, in the Spanish-speaking survey had received a rent increase. Um, there were um, about 10% of the respondents who, you know, so out of 160 or so folks who um, were paying a mortgage, 10% said that they had. You know, some folks may have answered this as no, when it was really not applicable. So, you know, this is this is clearly not a scientific survey. You know, people could go on and answer it twice. Um, but, um, you know, it gives, it gives an idea of the magnitude of some of the issues. Um, and there were, there were two respondents um, who uh, identified themselves as landlords in the Spanish-speaking survey, and none of them, uh, neither of them, I should say, uh, identified that they were at risk of uh, default. Um, and this is this was one of the things that we really wanted to get a better understanding of when um, we were looking at options on how we might be able to assist those who have been affected. So the first part of this survey was, you know, have you been affected and how, and uh, that uh, those questions gave us that idea. But but we wanted to really understand um, what. As an affected individual, what do you think might help you um, uh, get through these difficult times? And so we had these options of eviction moratoriums and rent increase moratoriums, rent increase caps, additional time to pay. And um, there has been recent state legislation that um, affects our ability to put these measures in place. And so Tony's going to talk about that in a moment. And then Bonnie's going to talk about the resources. You can see, you know, of those uh, respondents, you know, there were a lot of folks that said um, all of these things could really help. And we've got limited options on a number of these. And then with, with the resources, and this is just the English-speaking version. I'll show you the Spanish-speaking version in a sec, which is similar. But uh, of the resources, we broke that down and we said, all right, are there uh, legal aid uh, benefit, legal aid things that might benefit you, or rent abatement templates, and so forth. And um, the other COVID-19 federal aid programs ranked the highest. I mean, all of these, again, were, were pretty high um, information on mortgage uh, forbearance and so forth, all scored relatively high. But the COVID-19 federal programs was, um, it was the top vote getter there. And um, Bonnie will talk more about each of uh, the things that we've been doing to assist the uh, renters and homeowners. You'll see a similar thing when we go to the Spanish survey. Obviously, you know, fewer respondents, but resources were a high number, and uh, other COVID-related federal programs were also uh, of interest to those that responded. So I'm happy to take uh, questions, but I think that uh, it would be best to, to move into Tony's and Bonnie's um, presentations, because they're going to explain um, both what we can do 
moving forward and um, some of the things that we've done so far. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tony. Uh, thank you, Lee. I have a, a slide presentation as well, so bear with me a second while I try to pull it up on the screen here. Is that, is that, uh, can anyone see that? All right. So, uh, as, as you're aware, the, the patchwork of local eviction protection rules that um, have been implemented by uh, virtue of Governor Newsom's executive orders has now uh, largely been replaced by 803088 and the City Council's emergency ordinance that was adopted uh, back uh, in March and extended most recently uh, at the June 26th meeting to the end of September uh, is, is now set to expire and has been uh, supplanted largely by AB 3088, which was um, passed by the legislature and signed into law on August 31st as emergency legislation. So that, that took effect immediately upon its uh, uh, adopt or approval by Governor Newsom. Um, what AB 38, uh, 3088 does is it uh, First, prohibits a landlord from evicting a resident for non-payment of rent or other charges that came due between March 1st, 2020 and August 31st of 2020 if the resident provides the landlord with a declaration stating that their finances have been negatively affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, High-income residents, as defined by the statute, uh, can also be required to provide documentation of their COVID-19 related hardship, um, provided that the landlord follows a, a specific uh, procedure to require that. And a high income resident is defined by the statute as a person uh, or household earning 130% of the median income for the county as defined by HUD or $100,000, which, whichever is um, higher. Um, landlords are also prohibited from evicting a resident for non-payment of rent or other charges that came due between September 1st of 2020 and January 31st of 2021 if the resident provides the landlord with a declaration stating that their finances have been negatively affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and again, uh, documentation if required for a high-income resident and by uh, January 31st, 2021, pays 25% of the rental payments that are due between uh, September 1st, 2020 and January 31st, 2021 um, that were missed because the resident uh, experienced COVID-19 related financial distress. So to be clear here, um, a, a, a resident who has provided the necessary declaration to their landlord stating that they are unable to pay their rent because of the financial impact of COVID-19 um, that cannot be evicted even if they're paying no rent until at least February 1st of 2021, so long as by January 31st of 2021, they pay 25% of the rental payments that were due for the period starting September 1st, uh, 2020. Um, landlords also cannot evict a tenant who hasn't paid during that earlier period uh, for non-payment even after February 1st of 2021, uh, but they can thereafter pursue the tenant uh, uh, civilly uh, by making a civil claim. Uh, landlords are required to give informational notice about the new law to residents who as of September 1st, 2020, had missed more than one, uh, missed one or more payments that came due between March 1st and August 31st. And um, the new law also changes the rule with regard to what under current unlawful detainer law is called the three-day notice to pay or quit. Um, under the new law, the, the uh, period is uh, extended to 15 days, and it does not include Saturdays, Sundays, for holidays. And so what that means is um, as of October 1st, if, an, if the tenant has not paid any rent 
um, since March 1st or has missed payments since March 1st and has not provided the declaration required to the, to the landlord, then an unlawful detainer process can move forward. Um, the, the new law also extends the just cause eviction protections of AB 1482, which, which was enacted and went into effect on January uh, 1st, um, but it extends the protections to all residents until uh, February 1st of 2021 with certain limited exceptions. Um, under the current law, AB 1482 exempts single family homes, townhouses, condos, and duplexes when one of the units of the duplex is occupied by the owner. So um, uh, AB uh, 3088 uh, extends those protections to those categories of tenants as well as uh, those that live in uh, multifamily. Um, the temporary court rules that effectively delayed most evictions uh, in California have also been lifted by the new statute. However, the state uh, extends the pause for non-payment of rent eviction cases until October 5th. Um, so this pause is not a reason to, to do nothing in order to be protected from eviction for non-payment of rent due uh, before October 5th, a tenant must provide the landlord with the declaration of COVID-19 related hardship. Um, so, so that's a reminder for tenants who um, have either, uh, who have not paid rent and have not provided that declaration to their landlord. Um, Essentially, uh, though, non-payment of rent between the March 4th, 2020 and January 31st, 2021 period uh, is not grounds for an eviction. All rent from March 4th, uh, from March 1st, 2020 through January 31st of 2021 is still owed by all residential tenants and must eventually be paid back. And landlords are permitted to start recovering unpaid rent beginning March 1st of 2021. Uh, mostly, most likely how that rent will be collected is through the small claims court process. And uh, the new statute also expands the jurisdiction of small claims court to allow landlords to file claims for unpaid rent related to COVID-19 that exceed the current jurisdiction of the small claims court. Uh, currently, you can file a small claims action uh, but the but the amount that can be recovered in a small coins case is limited to I think ten thousand dollars. So, if a landlord um, uh, seeks to recover rent in excess of the small claims court's jurisdiction uh, due to the COVID nineteen uh, issue, then the landlord can pursue the full amount and is not limited by that uh, restriction. The legislature also take, uh, took steps to create uniformity throughout the state. Um, the new statute blocks the city from extending its, its residential eviction moratorium for non-payment uh, beyond uh, September 30th of 2020. So the, the ordinance that the council has in effect adopted that is currently scheduled to expire cannot be extended. Um, existing local ordinances may remain in place, but any future local ordinance has to be consistent with uh, AB 3088. And all existing and future local ordinances must uh, also comply with the repayment schedule provisions of AB 3088. Um, and so if the local ordinance was in effect and required repayment to begin after March 1st, 2021, or conditioned the beginning of repayment period on the end of the state of emergency or the local emergency, the act now deems that the repayment period will begin on March uh, 1st, 2021 and requires those uh, repayment periods to be completed by March 31st of 2022. I know this is a lot to swallow, um, and I can make these slides available um, after this presentation. Uh, the act specifically excludes tenants of commercial property from the definition of tenant. Uh, consequently, commercial properties are not covered by AB 3088, and commercial tenants do not receive the same statewide protections uh, provided to residential tenants. Uh, some cities have adopted their own eviction moratorium ordinances for commercial tenancies that extend beyond September 30th. However, the governor's executive order that authorizes local eviction moratorium ordinances 
for both commercial and residential tenants expires on September 30th. So the legal underpinnings of such ordinances are, are um, on somewhat shaky ground. And that is my uh, brief summary of the current status of rental protections under the new statute. Happy to answer any questions or if you prefer, um, reserve them until after Bonnie gives her uh, share of the presentation, that would be fine too. I'm wondering if maybe we can go through the full staff presentation and then come back to questions because I'm sure, that, I just want to make sure in the essence of time that we kind of get through everything and then we can ask relevant questions at the end. Great, thanks, thanks Mayor. Um, I am going to show some of the resources that we have um, been providing at the city, um, both on housing assistance, um, tenant assistance, and sort of uh, where you can go to find this information. As both Lee and Tony said, there is a lot of information out there and it's happening in real time on a daily basis. And so we kind of have a clearinghouse of where you can go and I'm, I'm going to show that if I can effectively share my screen here. Okay. Okay, so um, what you are seeing before you is on our main City of Santa Cruz page um, under, if you go to City of Santa Cruz and go to the Economic Development Department, you will see on the left-hand side of the screen, housing assistance information. And here you can scroll down and you can click on the newest posted information, um, some of which you know, both Lee and Tony went through um, just now on the federal eviction moratorium with links um, to this information so that you can read about it. You can go directly um, to the bill language of AB 3088 and read about it. You can download it, you could print it out. You can go through and see all of the um, resolutions that were approved um, by the city council as well as related housing um, legislation resources at the state level through League of California Cities, bill tracker legislation, housing related housing package legislation. And then at the bottom of this page, we have additional housing resources um, for our partner agencies. So for Housing Authority of County of Santa Cruz, and I'll go through those programs briefly on another page in just a second. Our affordable housing network, senior network services, and also our housing resources brochure, which we've shared with you in the past. There's so much information here, I'm not gonna click on any of these, um, but they're easy to find and navigate through going to the main City of, Santa, uh, City of Santa Cruz economic development page and click on housing resources. We also have information here on security deposit assistance that we fund through the city with our partner agencies um, at Housing Authority and Community Action Board, and I will show those briefly. And then we have just some linked resources for um, you know, elsewhere with, within the city and code compliance through community development um, if you are having um, some tenant landlord pro um, problems. Um, disputes or if you're homeless with uh, various uh, homeless assisted resources. I also want to show, this is just another city page link, if you go to our Choose Santa Cruz site, um, and um, this is choosesantacruz.com. It's also a part of our economic development resources. We have additional resources printed here as well and links, and this is very, uh, simply, you can go to choosesantacruz.com, click on housing and resources. And we have the countywide services, um, information on our inclusionary um, Measure O program, more detail um, assistance on security deposit, voucher eight, section eight voucher program, low income rental units in Santa Cruz County. So you can get the list of what's available countywide, as well as our emergency rental assistance program with CAB, as well as affordable housing um, projects um, that have been city public assisted projects within the city. So all of this is on our Choose Santa Cruz uh, webpage under housing resources as well as all of our age agency partners from Housing Matters, River Street Shelter, Salvation Army, you know, any of these resources that you would need um, if you find yourself in need of housing or housing resources. So I just wanted to take a few minutes and um, show these resources to you and where to find that on the city site. And then I briefly um, wanted to update you as well, I should say, the uh, program funding that council has made available, we have two rounds of this uh, for tenant-based low-income legal services, and you can find the link to that on our site as well. 
Um, I also wanted to briefly update you on where we are with our CARES funding that we received at the city. And I know that council will recall that we received our regular, our regular community development block grant funding um, around 500,000 with additional um, home funding this year. But then we received a 280,000 of specific CARES related, COVID related funding, which we did grant out to eight organizations in the community. And we'll have that first round reporting due at the end of October. And I would like our housing team to come back, back to you at that time and give you an update of how that funding has been distributed and what the impacts of that funding has been in the community. Um, with that said, I wanted to just briefly um, give you a recap of a couple of the programs um, and where they are and sort of this point in time. Um, specifically, um, we have awarded funding to Meals on Wheels related to COVID-related assistance. 51,000 has been fully distributed to the community. And as we, um, and I'll talk about in a second, are getting a third round of CARES funding, um, we'll come forward to you with recommendations um, and suggestions for that funding as well in the community. That's been a very impactful program. Um, and all of that funding has been distributed to over 20, almost 27,000 meals provided through the funding, um, through the city's funding of the CARES program. Dentist has 50,000. They've spent about a 20% of that funding to date um, and to help with um, dental and dental screening related to COVID-related impacts. Second Harvest has spent, um, has received 51,000 um, for their outreach. Hope Services, 18,000. And then related to the topic, really related to the topic, as well as the supportive services has been the tenant-based rental assistance. And through our regular CDBG funding and additional um, COVID CARES funding, we've distributed over 270,000 to Community Action Board for Emergency Eviction Prevention Program. Um, we, through the program, uh, CAB has received over 258 applications for this funding. They've made contact to over half of those individuals and are in the process of providing funding to a number of those individuals as, as well. And I, I look forward to when we have the full reporting um, later in October to come back to you with our housing team to fully give you an overview of the impact of those funding um, that the city has awarded through our CARES grant um, for the community. Um, also, I would say the farmer's market impact to the community for those impacted by COVID um, as far as providing additional housing and funding for food in the community has been very impactful. We have a third round of CARES funding that is coming. It's almost double what we received in the second round over the early summer that we distributed. So I know that the impact and the outreach will continue um, to be able to provide additional resources to our community for which we're, we're very grateful. And with that, I'll stop um, screen sharing and um, happy to answer any related questions. Thank you. Thank you for that update and presentation on all the topics related to <clears throat> um, COVID-19 resources for people who are facing uh, hardships. I'll open up to questions. Are there any council members who have questions on any of the items presented? Council Member Brown. Thank you so much, uh, Tony and Bonnie, for the update and uh, helping helping the community and council members make sense of the kind of sh ever shifting terrain. Uh, and I just wanted to ask a quick question, though, about um, the resource page, which is awesome. Thank you, Bonnie, for showing that to us. Um, just wondering if uh, where uh, legal uh, services, like tenant sanctuary, is not listed there, and they do provide legal services that complement CRLA, the CRLA director uh, or uh, former director is involved in having established that group and they are continuing to provide legal uh, advice and they have an attorney on call for, or on staff to work with them. So I'm just hoping that we could include that as well in the list of resources um, and they do provide the um, the resources that the city has um, made available as well, um, they give that information to their folks. And I can send you the, the information to, to link. That would be great, yes. We'd be happy to add that to our page. Great, thank you. Council Member Golder. So 
Kathleen, you're muted. Awkward. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if the state or if um, Tony has any information about where property owners or homeowners could get resources. I was told yesterday by um, a friend that had to go on unemployment during COVID that they tried to um, stop, I don't know what it's called, the forbearance, I guess, on their mortgage, and they tried for a couple of months, and they asked if they could tack it on the back end of their mortgage, and they were told no. They said at the end of the three months or whatever, they were going to have to uh, pay it all in a lump sum, and so they were lucky enough to have a 401k, and they pulled money out of that, but I just think, boy, it's going to be a real uh, huge crisis for everybody if the mortgage companies aren't being also part of the solution. Uh, yeah, I know that federally backed mortgages, there are some protections that are available on, under those, but I'm not as familiar with uh, the protections for um, for homeowners and those that are uh, having to pay a mortgage. I'm, I'd be happy to look into that further and provide a follow-up report to the council, um, but, I, but I don't think that those protections are as robust as those that have been put in place for um, renters. And that's certainly a problem for people who um, you know, have been impacted by COVID-19 and are required to make a mortgage payment every, every month. So we'll be happy to look into that. And Councilmember Golda, I'll just add, we do have a couple of resources for um, homeowners on our website too, through the City of Santa Cruz page under the housing assistance. We do have some links to the Cal HFA, California Housing Finance Authority uh, for mortgage assistance through a federal income tax um, credit program. So we do have a number of uh, programs that are for um, homeowners as well. Yeah, it's just my concern is like obviously that they could potentially lose their homes or if they're tenant occupied homes, if they're not getting the, if they're, you know, hand them out already themselves, that we could see people getting evicted by the banks when they have to foreclose on the home, you know, in the coming months, if that was a possibility. So thank you. Is there any other questions from council members? Councilmember Golder, thanks for asking that question. I had a similar question to that. Um, I just I have one question. And I want to keep us on time because we have a pretty long meeting today. Um, for the city attorney, I was curious um, with the um, lack of being able to extend our local ordinances, and just given some of the questions that we had from the community around, you know, um, I think at some of our previous meetings, we had members of the public asking if we could. Uh, defer, you know, payment of rent after the eviction period was over for up to a year or, you know, um, after COVID was over, allowing people up to a year to pay back, back rents uh, without facing eviction. Is that something that AB 3088 blocks because, it, you know, the state uniformity? So, um, well, it does uh, – restrict the city's ability to enact um, additional uh, renter protections involving the repayment of rent. However, the current statute, uh, so long as the tenant uh, is able to provide a declaration of inability to pay due to COVID-19, and if they're a high income tenant, um, supporting documentation uh, or, or documentation in support of that, then they are not required to commence paying rent until March 1st of 2021. Um, and non-payment of rent between March 1st of 2020 and August 30th of 2020 is not grounds for eviction even after that period, um, but they can be pursued in civil court and a landlord can obtain a money judgment against them. Um, obtaining a mon money judgment is not the same thing as collecting money. If a tenant uh, has financial hardship, then the court will take a look at that. And and um, and so the, the landlord, even with a judgment saying that their tenant or former tenant owes, the, uh, you know, $15,000, say, um, still has to pursue that through a court process. So there are protections in place, but the city's ability in light of AB 3088 to enact further residential rental protections is is limited now. 
Okay, thank you. And just in the absence of time, I'm going to see if there's any further comments from council members or questions on this. Seeing none, uh, I want to thank you all for providing that update with that information. And then I think it would be great if we could continue to uh, let members of the public know where they can find this information on our website so that if people are in need of resources that we can connect them as best we can. So thank you all for that. Next, um, well, actually, I should ask: Are there any other? Uh, ask the city manager if there's any other updates that you'd like to provide. No, that, that was it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next item on our agenda is the uh, city council meeting calendar, and so uh, I'd like to uh, call on the clerk. One of the things that we were hoping to do, there's a number of study session ideas um, and that have come up and needs to schedule some meetings. And so what we were hoping to do is see if we could um, figure out when uh, council members, if they had preference for between days or evenings, and if there's any dates that would not work for council members to have some of these study sessions. Uh, the study sessions are one that's on the rental data item that's still out, and that will be receiving a presentation from the company 3DI uh, on the kinds of things that their technology could do to help with that. Um, there's been a lot of communications from members of the public around wanting to learn about the different types of mental health response programs that we have, so um, receiving presentations um, from a number of the Folks, the programs that we have that respond to mental health, so our liaison program, the downtown um, team, and then receiving a presentation from CAHOOTS on the types of programs that they do in Eugene and what that could mean potentially for Santa Cruz. Uh, there's a budget uh, presentation that we were going to have a special meeting for, and then uh, a recovery planning meeting towards the end of the month. And so um, I think that's all. I know Ralph has been working on this too, so Ralph. I don't know if that captured everything. Yes. Yeah, you got it all. Okay. Um. So I guess if council members have any preference or if they have any conflicts um, for the month of October and for early November, now would be a good time for us to know so that we can um, and figure out those com those conflicts and then try to set some dates and times for when we can have uh, these special meetings occur. Council Member Byers. I was, from your introduction, uh, Mayor, how many study sessions? I didn't quite get that. So currently there are four. We need four, four dates. Okay. And if I may add a little bit more uh, information. Yeah, so there's four different uh, items. Um, with respect to the budget, uh, we would recommend trying to do that on October 6th, um, just because that was deferred from um, today. Um, and then uh, with respect to the, uh, the uh, interim recovery plan, uh, we'd like to schedule that the week of October 26th, so it could be October 27th if you want to do a council meeting. And that is a, a, a all-day session from 9 to 3. It's equivalent to essentially doing a council retreat. Um, so you could schedule that on the 26th if you are available from 9 to 3. And then the budget could be in the evening of October 6th. Um, and then you could uh, also add, uh, if you wanted to do the rental data, you could do that also on October 6th, uh, perhaps in the afternoon. So uh, something like uh, uh, 3 to 5 and then uh, or 2 to two, 2 to 4 or 2 to 5 and then do uh, in the evening at 6 o'clock do the, uh, the budget potentially. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Uh, I had a, sorry, I, I couldn't write all that down. Um, uh, is there a way that we could type those up and maybe put them up on the screen? I can't, I can't track all that. And then just trying to compare it to my uh, calendar is going to be a little rough. Um, oh, I, could I, 
Thanks, Bonnie. Um, could you, I'm not clear what the rental data one is about. I'm not quite clear and just have a so, proposal that, um, for consideration. Go ahead, thank you, Mayor. Yeah. Uh, so earlier this year, we had the uh, rental data item come to the council and that item um, did not move forward. It was a tie vote. And so that item needs to come back to council for another vote. And given that there was interest in learning more and um, under better understanding what that program could look like, um, we thought it would be good for the company 3DI who gave us a presentation on that program to give a presentation to council as well. Um, given that we've had, that our agendas have been pretty full recently, um, we thought that it would be good to uh, invite the public and council to have that presentation be separate from the city council meeting so that council could learn more, we could get more feedback from the public and then um, make a final decision on whether to move forward with that item. And so that um, is kind of where we're at. And uh, I think it's just good. And council member Brown and I are meeting with some uh, members of the, the landlord community to talk to them in the near future to also invite them to the, the study session. But I think people learn more about what's possible and then for council to take a action on whether to move forward or not. And so is that, is that, um, is that the rental registry or rental data? So you said rental data, is it really the, it's really the rent, the idea of having, actually having people register. Um, right. It's the rental registry piece, okay. Um, Okay, just as an alternative, yeah, okay. I, I mean, I, I guess one, one thing I would be very interested in, and, and maybe it's too late to add it to this long list, but um, just backing up maybe a little bit bigger would be just further uh, study session on all the 2019 and 2020 housing legislation that was passed. We never really did a study session on that, and it does impact, I think, some of the things around um, how we're trying to understand our rental, our rental um, uh, stock and use and um, some of the issues around that. Um, so I'm just curious about whether or not that might be um, something to do prior to the rental registry. Um, I'm not, they're not exactly the same, but I'd just be curious about um, both a housing legislative update as well as broadly in terms of state legislation um, and then possibly housing blueprint recommendations update because those things are already in place and the registry could kind of fit into sort of a tool that we should consider in the context of that larger policy um, report out. Just a, just a concept to throw out. Thanks for putting these up. I think, that, I think that they could go together actually because I think they very well complement one another. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mayor Cummings? Yeah. Oh, are, are we being asked to say now what our availability is? Yes, so I'm gonna go through, um, but I did see some hands up still, so I'm gonna go on to Councilmember Matthews, Watkins and then Brown, but yes, we're trying to figure out what dates could work. And then I also, with the rental data one in the, the housing, I'd also like to hear from staff if that's something that we'd be able to put together within that timeline. I know that the, the data collection, that's a um, third party that would come in and give that presentation, but I'd also like to hear of whether we could get an update on some of those housing elements or if that would need to come later in the month, just given what we're working on right now. So, Council Member Matthews. Yeah, I, I like the idea of combining updates on the state housing legislation with the rental data. It doesn't seem to me that the rental data presentation should take up to two hours. That's a component. And then I'm wondering what's still out there from the, um, planning staff point of view of uh, items that were in the housing blueprint and things that we actually have considered. Um, some things have been kind of put on the schedule and taken off. I think ADU um, revisions, that fits in with the state legislation and stuff we wanted to do locally. So maybe a bigger picture of where we're gonna spend um, 
policy and resources on housing issues. It just seems so right. I just say, parenthetically, on the Seabright project, I was just so confused by the changing landscape of state laws on that one project. I spent a good chunk of time yesterday with the planning staff saying, okay, what was it when it was submitted? What is it now? Et cetera, et cetera. So it just seems there's so much. I, I think it would be a service to council members and the community to, to get that big picture. So I vote for that. Even more two hours if we can do one big housing thing. And then on budget, do you anticipate that taking three and four hours? Or, or, I'll pass I, have, I have not been yeah. at, at all involved with the budget process. And you know, my recollection from years past is we had a whole day to, devoted to budget. And I guess we've kind of done that in chunks along. So my question is just how much time are you looking for for that one? Our, our, it, at this point, it's just amending the budget to, to make the reductions. Obviously, there's some difficult decisions that you have to make, and there'll be some public input. Um, so our thinking is that it would be between three and four hours um, is what it would likely take to do. How, how do people feel? I don't like to start at six. That's, I mean, don't people eat dinner? I'd, I'd rather go seven to ten or something like that, if, if you yeah, can it's, allow it's up to you. OK. And then I would defer to Lee and Bonnie with respect to your question about the being able to be ready with the, the legislation, the, the housing legislation uh, for the sixth. Uh. Um, we can do the sixth if need be, um, having some more time to prepare that. I mean, there were a lot of updates and we, yeah. um, we use those on a regular basis, but they are really complex. And so um, putting um, that whole package of information together, um, you know, having a little bit more time would uh, be helpful. But if, uh, that works, if that's what works for the council, we'll make the sixth happen and um, do our best to get you a comprehensive uh, analysis by then. I'm wondering. <clears throat> I was just going to add, uh, yeah, we would appreciate a little more time as well. Yeah. It, yeah. We want to make sure if we're, you know, providing uh, information to the public that we're, you know, making sure it's accurate and up to date. And there's just so much out there um, and new resources each day and updates. And, you know, mm -hmm. we're, just, we're juggling a lot of things right now. Um, and also just the preparation for the budget in the evening as well um, is, is on a lot of our minds. Um, so we'd appreciate a, a little more time if that's possible. We can do the, the 20th, I was yeah. going to suggest possibly. That's the next sort of available Tuesday, off Tuesday. Because uh, it also seems like there's a conflict on the 6th in the evening. So maybe the budget can be in the afternoon on the 6th, and then the uh, rental legislation and uh, rental data on the 20th. Okay. With with the other legislative, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the legislative and the uh, rental data on the twentieth. Yeah. You know, my own feeling is that's not critically time dependent, and I'd much rather give the staff enough time to to do a good job on it. And my own thought is for that. Um, again, is that this is going to be a really important study session. We should make a point to invite. Um, uh, certainly our planning commission to that and um, council candidates, you know, there's going to be new people grappling with all this and um, and certainly broadly to the public as well. A look at, at big picture housing opportunities um, deserves adequate time and publicity. I, I would say even later, I mean, even you know, the next week or so, just, just to get a, a good solid job on that. Um, Councilmember Watkins. Yeah, thank you. 
you, Mayor. I, um, I agree that I'd like to see more of a holistic um, conversation around our housing policy and um, absolutely welcome a deep dive, especially into the housing blueprint uh, recommendations because a lot of work went into that with a lot of community input. And there are, um, and Lee can correct me, I think there's 99 recommendations, right? So we, you know, we have this foundation, we should absolutely use it and keep it alive. I think that it makes a lot of sense to have that conversation, um, obviously for the reasons that have been referenced, but also because we're having the interim recovery conversation on the 26th, which I think will help us have a sense of where we're thinking about going in the next 12 to 18 months, um, which will then, I think, lead to how we want to expedite uh, specific or talk about specific housing policies. So I, um, I kind of appreciate that. And then um, just, I think Tuesdays, I guess, just in terms of scheduling are generally uh, the best days because I try to my calendar open for this, this type of work on those days. Um, and I'm open to having the, the 6 p.m. afternoon session um, as opposed to an evening session. Well, with that being said, especially with the, within the context of the planning, I'm wondering if then, so, about four weeks out, I'm just proposing the 20th, 20th again because we're going to talk about housing within the context of planning and our interim recovery planning and how this all fits in, if the 20th would then make sense for the housing data or if we want to do it towards the end of that week of October 19th because it would make sense for us to have that conversation before that meeting with the interim recovery planning if that's going to be the case. And just kind of based on conversation. If I may, I think for me, I think it would be more helpful to have it after the interim recovery because I think at that time we'll have more information from the community survey as well as the information that's been gathered from the council members as to the priorities that will help, I think, inform um, where we would want to go with the information around housing. So for me, I think the, the, um, the sequence would be after, so I would use the information that we heard from the, from the kind of interim recovery efforts to help inform the housing information. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Uh, Council Member Brown. So, thank I, um, you know, I don't have any real strong opinions about what dates any of these are on, you know, and I'm happy to incorporate the housing policy thing. I mean, I think we've been asking for that for a long time, and it's good to hear that uh, some of my colleagues are um, coming around to wanting to do that. Um, I just wanted to say that I, I do, I teach class until three o'clock, um, Monday through Thursday, and I make special arrangements on council days to have my class taught asynchronously. Um, so to the extent that we can start at three or later, it would be really helpful for me. Um, but I can try to find ways around it. I just can't do that too many more times in the semester. And I'll also just say, I think part of why initially going into this conversation, I was really trying to find out what people's availability is, is because um, rather than trying to pinpoint exact dates for different topics, I think more importantly, trying to figure out when people are available uh, is, is helpful because if um, we can find dates that'll work and then uh, work with staff to understand when some of these uh, because we also have to work with the schedules of the, the people who are inviting for some of these study sessions. So um, just wanted to put that out there that really trying to find when people are, are best available. And we thought this was a good opportunity to do so, but also if it's better to send out a doodle poll and try to use that. Um, yeah, we're just really trying to figure out when people are available and work with some of the other partners to uh, to figure out when we can have these sessions. Uh, I'd like Mayor Myers and then Council Member Byers. Um, I was just looking at the scheduling um, and also just reflecting on um, Bonnie's uh, uh, comment in the last presentation about, um, I like the idea of also moving all the housing discussion to after the uh, interim recovery. And also I think Bonnie just mentioned that at the end of October, they'll have an update on the full reporting for all the various um, housing assistance types of um, resources that have been put out. So it just seems like 
having something after later in October, early November on sort of the housing piece might just be a, a good wrap up for everything because it would be nice to have all that information based on what our um, uh, resources that we've been able to provide. Uh, I think it would make for a good um, discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. So I would support going more towards early November. Mm -hmm. Um, I know I've spoken with uh, the police chief and members from <clears throat> um, Cahoots, and there it sounds like um, mid that October and early November it, it's fine for them as well. So um, maybe if we could do that on the 20 or not the 27th, um, the 20th, I can double check it. If, sure, if Tuesday the day that works to discuss that with the police chief. Um, but I, want, I just wanted to put that out there as well in case people had a comment on that. Uh, Councilmember Watkins and then Councilmember Matthews. I, um, I, I appreciate the interest in wanting to do a deep dive in a lot of these topics. And, and I know some of them, like for example, the budget is a priority, um, the interim recovery is a priority. I'll just personally say I'm happy to do a doodle. I think the next several months for me um, are gonna be very busy. So um, if there's times that we can have um, kind of more of a deep dive into good availability, I'm happy to, to go that route if that's, a better, is that, if that's a better path at this point. Yeah, that's my feeling too. This is trying to pack an awful lot into one month, my, my impression. Budget and interim recovery are the priorities necessarily. Um, you know, if I had to um, prioritize the other two, it'd probably be the uh, rental and housing program and then the mental health one. I mean, the world will continue to turn after the month of October. So. Um, don't, I would not get people too strung out. Figure which ones need the most staff time and, and give people the space. Probably do the poll is the best way to go. Okay. I think we have some um, sense then of when, uh, at a minimum, the budget and mental health can be scheduled. So. Um, so I think we'll try to move forward with the budget. Um, and I'd just like to ask if for the budget meeting, um, given that there's a number of conflicts on the 6th, if the evening of the 7th could work of October because um, given the conflict for, for Council Member Brown and I think there's another conflict with the 6th, if that might work, just so we can move forward with at least the budget, the rental data, or sorry, the interim recovery, and then we can Work out with the council to schedule other two. Uh, Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. What? I Mike guess Smith. I may have a. I, I'm supposed to be at the League of Cities conference that day. It starts that day, so I'm I'm supposed to be there all day on that. Um, I'm happy to do something in the evening, though, of the 7th, but I can't. It doesn't look like I can do anything during the day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's the 7th, right, we were talking about? Yes. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Well, we'll take that feedback into account, and we'll try to – I'll work with staff to try to figure out if we can um, send some doodle polls out and, and get some of these scheduled and then get back to the council and the community in, in the next few days. So, thanks. So, just to confirm, we don't have any new dates yet? Um, it looks like, uh, no, we don't. Um, I think we got some feedback. Um, it seems like that. So, in terms of the budget, um, just because that one's sooner, Mm -hmm. the, the doodle poll works. Sometimes I just don't get very quick responses. And since that one is in, what, a week and a half or, or so, I would just need to get that on calendar so everybody knows. So could you 
did council members just well here yeah, council member buyers mm -hmm. so Catherine you're muted by the way yeah on the sixth I can meet any time the seventh I can meet in the evening <laughs> would, would the would the six in the afternoon work the yes is no yeah I think Councilmember Brown had a conflict, but oh, I'm sorry. if you're able to make that work, then I guess we can just schedule that. I don't. My conflict is just until 3 p.m. Yeah. And that's what I was suggesting. Maybe from three to three to five or something like that would that work? On what day, fourteen? On on the sixth for the budget. I just know that we might have. Um, more, more. A high amount of public comment on that item, and so. Okay. I sure. okay. think so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm available on the sixth. I think that if it happens on the sixth, it's, it's likely going to be um, a pretty long. Yeah. I think it's going to be four to five hours at least. So, just want to put that out there because I know there's some yeah. concern. So, I mean, there's, if it's possible to move it to the Monday, if that's not a conflict for council, we can do it on the fifth. Um, in the evening, but again, you know, I think that okay. it might be worth us following up. I just think that it would be good for council members to please keep an eye when the doodle polls come out and try to answer them as quickly in a, in a very, yeah, be time sensitive because we really need to get this information out and we're trying to just uh, figure out folks' availability so that we can move forward. We thought this would be a good way to do it, but apparently uh, we should probably just stick to the doodle poll. So I want to thank everybody and thanks for the, thank the public for kind of sitting through this. But we'll, we'll try to follow up and see what we can get scheduled. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so the next item on our agenda is um, our consent agenda. And I would just like to let the public know that item number 12, which is the item related to the contract for the mixed use library owners representative contract to Griffin um, structures, that that item has been already been pulled from uh, consent and we're gonna receive a public uh, presentation from staff on that item. So the items on our consent agenda are items number seven through 17 with the exception of item number 12. And so if members of the public would like to comment on these items, um, now is the time to call in on items 7 through 17. There are instructions on your screen uh, to call in. So um, please remember to, stream, to mute your streaming device, press star 9 on your phone to raise your hand, and listen for the cue saying that you've been unmuted. And additionally, um, please remember to use the non-toll-free numbers that are provided, and should you be concerned with charges, uh, we would recommend that you call in at the beginning of uh, public comment. And again, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand for any items on consent. With that, I'd like to ask if there are any council members who would like to pull any item from consent numbers seven through 17 with the exception of item number 12. No council members that would like to pull items on our consent agenda. Um, I'll um, move it over to, to public comment. This is an opportunity to, to comment on items that have not been pulled from our consent agenda, items number seven through 17. So if any member of the public would like to speak to these items, now is the time to call in. Once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you will be given two minutes to comment on items on our consent agenda, number seven through 17, with the exception of item number 12.
Yeah, hi, this is Garrett Phillip. Uh, gee, so many to choose from, but let's talk about uh, item seven. There's been a considerable loss of public confidence in government and considerable loss and permanent loss of economic activity due to the government's state, county, and city's response to COVID. This is due to the constantly changing goalposts for flatten the curve and having somewhat arbitrary declines in tested cases of COVID required, not deaths, arbitrary designations of essential workers, and no real change, of course, despite new information that is now available, mysterious political objections to examine all kinds of different approaches and treatments, a decline in human rights where healthy people are essentially put under house arrest or fine who are not sick, and there's so many questionable declarations of death by COVID, the big money available to health care providers for COVID, and the gold rush by Big Pharma, to name a few. At this point, isn't it about time you specify exactly under what conditions your emergency declarations would cease, especially since you're under no obligation to declare emergencies just because other authorities do? If you are, please explain how that choice has been removed from an independent body. We now find out the virus is quite small and isn't really stopped by cloth masks. Cloth masks provide a false sense of security. We find out huge swaths of the population aren't particularly at risk of dying at all. We find that in some cases, 90% of false positive test results are from COVID RNA remnants, which can exist months after someone was actually uh, no, no longer capable of transmitting COVID. We find out, as in Nashville, city authorities hid contract tracing results from the public that indicate that bars, restaurants were responsible for only a tiny fragment of cases, and the vast majority came from nursing homes and construction. I would ask, what have we learned so far from contact tracing, and what proof exists that it is actually slowing the spread of COVID, since it is such a time-sensitive and individual rights-sensitive process? This seems increasingly like a government power grab, blindly executed, without regard for, in many cases, common sense, and the fact individuals are actually better at evaluating personal risk management than the government, given real information. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Are there any other members of the public who would like to comment on items number 7 through 17, with the exception of item number 12? Now is the time to call in. Please press star 9 on your phone to raise your hand, and you'll be given two minutes. been uh, provide an opportunity to speak. Well, good afternoon, City of Santa Cruz City Council. My name is James Ewing Whitman. This relates to several different subjects. Um, where are the citizens on patrol? How many refer, you may refer to me as Miss Millwright. As all the inhabitants on planet Earth are heading into a Bolshevik winter at best, the plan for the middle class... I'm going to have to mute you and pause your comments. This is to comment on items that are on our consent agenda. If you'd like to comment on items that aren't on our agenda, you can call back in during oral communications, which will occur after item number 20. Uh, but for right now, if you could please identify the items on our agenda that you'd like to speak to, uh, we will provide you with two minutes to, to speak. Hello, this has to do with the um, extension on the rent control, but maybe you could just answer a question for me, please, and that would be, um, at what time do you think public comments is going to be open? Thank you. Uh, just looking at our agenda today. Uh, We're estimating that oral communications will occur around uh, 5.30 this evening. Um, but again, we've been, um, it might it might go longer. We're, we're anticipating that we're gonna have oral communications after item number 20. So, thank you. Justin and council members, thank you very much. I will go back to work and I will get back on this later. Thank you so much. Okay. Seeing no 
no further comments, I'd like to bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Um, is there a council member who would like to move the consent agenda? Council member Watkins. I move consent with the exception of item number 12. Council member Golder. I'll second. Okay. Um, is there any further discussion from council members? And I see hands raised, but I think those might have been for seconding, but council member Matthews no. or Brown? I have council a member Matthews. Council member Matthews, yeah. Yes, um, I'd just like to make a comment on item number 11. Um, I appreciate the motivation behind this. Um, as I reviewed it, I found that there were um, many um, assertions and conclusions, et cetera, that I felt didn't have adequate documentation and I didn't see the direct nexus with the city. And so I would like to register a no vote on that one exclusively. Council Member Brown. Yeah, I was. I just wanted to make a statement about this particular uh, agenda item. It was brought to us by uh, members of the community who are part of a broader uh, friendship and solidarity network uh, with um, to end the embargo and uh, to work uh, with Cuba to lift restrictions on um, uh, collaboration with with Cuban medical professionals. Um, I they, I know that they had planned to participate in uh, making some statements and. Uh, so a couple of them have indicated to me that they've had trouble getting on the call and I don't, if they're not trying anymore, then I just wanted to speak to say that was the intention to give a little more background on this. And um, this is definitely a resolution that is intended to just uh, suggest that the city uh, uh, supports the um, lifting those restrictions on medical cooperation with uh, Cuban professionals. They've been uh, uh, dispatched to, you know, over 20 countries and you know, 1,200 medical professionals right now helping to save lives around, you know, around the COVID-19 pandemic in other countries. Um, they are not able to come to the United States due to our 70-year uh, embargo. And this was just a, a piece of that, um, that broader effort that we wanted to highlight. So um, that's why it's here. And um, thank you for your consideration. And um, I guess I'll say that on behalf of the local group as well. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mayor Myers, and then uh, Council Member Watkins. Um, thank you, Sandy, for the, or Council Member Brown for that additional information. Um, I'm going to register a no on this. Um, it's I, I talked to several medical folks. Um, I, I just, I'm just not quite completely clear on, on some of the outcomes of it. And I just, um, I, I am very supportive of, of healing the relationship with Cuba and uh, understand their benefits in the medical world. Uh, I learned a lot from asking uh, different folks in the medical field about the history of Cuba um, with regards to some of the things that they can provide. Um, I'm just, I'm just gonna register a no. Uh, I'm just not quite clear how this completely fits into um, sort of some of our goals and objectives. So thank you for bringing it forward, though, and um, and that's that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mayor Watkins. Um, thank you, Mayor. I too had I just I too had questions about this one, and I. I um, wasn't quite sure about kind of all of the details of that. So I was wondering if maybe you would want to return with a, a sort of a more complete understanding so we can use that information to help better inform our decision as we move forward. Um, but absent that, that information, I too don't feel comfortable moving forward at this time. So I'll go ahead and register a note unless you want to maybe postpone it. And, and I know if you said people can't uh, speak to it who were part of it, uh, maybe we'd want to have their voices heard as well. I, yep. yeah. So that's fine. Um, you know, it's hard for me to imagine that uh, we're not going to have these same kind of technical difficulties at every meeting we kind of seem to. So I'm not sure that that's going to get to uh, getting folks on the line unless we better coordinate that and make our uh, meetings more accessible to the public. Um, but in terms of getting your questions answered, I'd be happy to save this for uh, our next meeting. Um, and um, get you know you, if you want to send me those questions, I'll make sure they get answered. 
<laughs> but I, having not asked that it be pulled, I'm just wondering, uh, Tony, if you can advise on how to pro how to proceed. Um, I, I I think maybe to pull it would probably be the make the most sense. Mm -hmm. I'm in the between devices, so I'm wondering if you can hear me at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. I, I mean, if somebody wants to pull it, fine, um, and that, that's fine with me, but I'm not going to pull it if you want to vote it down as part of the consent agenda. I know. We, I, I'm just going to say we often have these resolutions that are largely symbolic and meant to demonstrate, um, you know, our, you know, our values and our, you know, our interest in, um, you know, medical internationalism seems like a good one, um, but if it's not um, uh, something that folks are, are willing and able to do right today, then um, go ahead and pull it and uh, move that it be deferred. Okay. Is there a member of the council who wishes to pull item number 11? Council member Watkins. Item number 11, and at which time I'll move that it's deferred. Okay. Item number 11's been pulled, and so now we're voting and commenting on items numbers 7 through 17, with the exception of items numbers 11 and 12. Council Member Byers. I was, I'm sorry, I was back to the other one. Um, my hand has been up on. So, real, real quick, I think uh, for me, I believe. Councilmember Brown answered it. it. It appears to me it's very <laughs> symbolic. There's nothing in it causing our city to do anything or take a position. It just is a symbolic gesture. So, uh, anyway, I think you confirmed that when confirmed that feeling when you just spoke. So that's all I wanted to say. Okay. So item number 11 has been pulled along with item number 12. Um, Just looking for a mo I think we had a motion yeah. on consent by Councilmember Watkins and Golder. Um, so I guess we'll go ahead and ask the clerk to call a vote, call a roll call vote on items number seven through seventeen, with the exception of items numbers eleven and twelve. Thank you, Councilmember Byers. Aye. Um, Matthews. Aye. Uh, Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cumming? Aye. So passes unanimously. Now we'll return to item number 11. Uh, which was pulled, and I'll also ask the city attorney, since, this, since we already had uh, public comment on this item, do we need to return to public comment? If the only member of the public who uh, asked to speak on this item has already spoken, then no. Okay. Okay, so we'll go ahead and um, bring it back to council for action deliberation. And so I'll look for a motion on this item. Summer council members. Council member Watkins. I'll move that we defer this item and um, request that we get some more information and, and if possible, even hear from our uh, local HSA agency around um, their thoughts on this. Okay, so a motion by council member Watkins. Second to the motion. I'll go ahead and second that motion that it come back uh, with the with the request that it come back at the next meeting. Um, that's okay with the maker. Sure, as long as I mean, or the or the meeting after, as long as we get the information. And I'll leave it up to your discretion, Mayor. But we want to have, I mean, ideally the most information possible. Okay. Councilmember Matthews. 
Um, I would just say this is absolutely not urgent, and it might be um, result in a better product to say just defer to a future meeting and give these supporters time to understand the objections and uh, rework the, the agenda item without being specific on the date. The motion before us is to bring this back at a future meeting after providing more information to council members, or is that captured correctly? Or if not, for the make of the motion, just restate the, the motion. I think to defer to a future meeting and I have backup information to help us better understand um, the intention behind the resolution, as well as if possible to hear from HSA interest or thoughts on this. Okay, Bonnie, were you able to capture that? I was, yes, yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, with that, let's um, go ahead and conduct and do a roll call vote on the item. Council Member Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? No. Boulder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor coming. Aye. So that passes with um, Council Members Golder, Watkins, Byers, Matthews, Vice Mayor Myers, myself voting in favor, and Council Member Brown voting opposed. Okay, so that is the end of the items from our consent agenda. Um, well, actually, we have one one more item which was pulled from our consent agenda, so um, it will be heard next, which is the award contract for mixed-use library owner's representative contract to Griffin Constructions. And I'll turn it over to um, staff from our economic development department, Amanda Rotella and Bonnie Lipscomb. Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, if I could just um, mention here, I will be leaving the meeting at this point as announced previously. I have a conflict of interest on this, so I'm going to close out on the meeting and we'll watch it on TV. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and uh, Council Members. I'm going to just briefly introduce um, the item, particularly um, just a little context of moving it to the regular agenda from consent and then turn it over to our project manager, Amanda Rotella, who's going to give an overview of the proposal contract and um, work scope and process to date. Um, so I first just want to acknowledge the volume of correspondence um, we've received on this item and a desire to clarify questions that have been raised by members of the public um, for letters that the council has received that we've received over the last day. And um, we really do recommend the trans full transparency and having it on open session. I will say that from, from a process standpoint, um, we were following up on a previous direction from council on the June 23rd meeting, which was to hire an owner's representative um, to represent and work with staff and act on the city's behalf to move some very complicated elements of this project forward. So from a staff perspective, we were following through on prior council direction, which is why we placed it on consent. But we had already prepared a presentation, just recognizing there's a lot of uh, public interest in this project. So apologize for any confusion that caused um, in the community for those who are following this project closely. Um, and we're available to answer questions and would like to have the opportunity to address some of the questions raised in the public correspondence. Um, we're on the agenda today because it's approximately three months um, from the council direction on June 23rd when you directed us to come back within three months. 
I will say the direction on the 23rd was about two pages of direction to, to staff at that point. We did voice some um, concern over our ability to be able to provide that list of uh, responses and work product at that time. However, we did commit to coming forward with the owner's representative contract, which is why we are here today. We're in the final stages of negotiating some of the elements of that contract, um, which is why we came forward today to ask for your support for moving forward um, on that contract, but we don't have that final contract for you today. With that said, I just briefly wanted to overview that from June 23rd, we took about three weeks at the staff level. Um, Amanda worked really hard to get the um, request for proposals out um, to the public um, by July 20th. We gave consultants um, and respondent teams one month to reply. We received seven robust applications on August 20th. And over the, just the last month, we have quickly moved forward to vet those, interview those, and make a recommendation of the most qualified um, uh, consultant for you today and get on the council agenda. So I just wanted to clarify that process to date because there were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of confusion um, and out there in the community. And uh, there was also some comments about housing and housing creation, and I would like to overview at the time when it's appropriate related to this item, the support of affordable housing um, actions that we have taken to support this project since the council direction of June 23rd. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Amanda Rotella, who's going to give an overview of the process to date and the proposed consultant work scope. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Amanda Rotella. As Bonnie said, I'm a principal management analyst in the economic development department, and I am working to share my screen here. All right, there we are. Um, so yes, as Bonnie mentioned, we are bringing forward the contract for the owner's rep. Um, and again, as she mentioned, you know, this is following up on discussion for, or, um, direction that we received from you on June 23rd. You can see that direct direction there, um, authorized staff to proceed with selection of an owner's rep to manage the overall project. So that's what I've been scrolling away at for the last couple of months, uh, working forward uh, to bring that before you today. And just sort of a recap around next steps. So really getting this owner's rep hired is our first step. and. Um, Bringing them on board is really crucial to be able to move forward with the other direction that you provided with us, um, namely, you know, uh, direction to return with detailed financial information, timeline, um, general schematics. All of those require some professional expertise to be brought on board. So in particular, the owner's rep would be helping us pull together a budget and timeline. So those first two bullet points you see here from the June 23rd direction, um, specifically around that three month deadline, which is today. So really step one, bring on the owner's rep. Step two, bring back this additional information. Um, additionally, you directed us to work with the owner's rep to hire a design team, and which would include a community outreach process. And we would need to bring on that design team before we can come back to you with some of those, um, you know, specifics around schematics of how all the how all the pieces fit together. So kind of just sort of looking at a flow of how this project would go. We start with the owner's rep. They help us to get additional information around budget and timeline. They help us to bring on a design team who then can answer some of those more detailed questions around how all the pieces fit together and really get into the detail. So really this is just step one of keeping us on um, our really, you know, um, our, our goal to move this project forward, recognizing that delays have costs. And so owner's rep is really the professional expertise that are gonna help us keep moving this project forward and keep us on time and within budget. That's sort of a big piece of why we're bringing on that sort of professional team. A little bit of background about the RFP and selection process. As Bonnie mentioned, um, we issued this RFP in July um, of this month. It was posted on the city website in two places, on our bidding page and also on the uh, downtown library subcommittee's webpage. Um, cityofsantacruz.com slash downtown library. So it has been up there since that time. Uh, we were super excited to receive seven proposals. Um, I was blown away. I was expecting a lot less and so was um, quite pleased to receive so many um, proposals and so many teams that were interested. Um, because we received so many great proposals, we interviewed four teams. 
Systems. And we had, uh, I really appreciated a, a great panel um, which had representatives from pu um, public work, planning, um, economic development, and also the library. So we came together to really review the candidates and come up with a selection. And we're very excited about Griffin Structures. They had a extremely strong proposal and really, um, just really an amazing interview with them. They bring 40 years of experience. They have a project team with a variety of expertise that they bring to the table. They have experience working on complex mixed use projects. Um, and significant related past experience, um, you know, related to all components of this project that we're bringing forward. And included in their um, team is a uh, community engagement and outreach professional who will be assisting us with the communication piece. And part of their proposal included regular um, updates to the community council and staff. They've got sort of a detailed schedule of when those outline, when those updates go out, um, which we were really excited about knowing that the community is really eager for as much information and updates. So that's something that this team brings with them. A little bit of background information on the scope that's included um, in this contract. You can see here development of that budget and timeline, which is those crucial pieces that we'll be bringing back to you. Um, really doing an assessment of our program and the process. How, what is the best way to bring forward? What expertise do we bring on? Um, soliciting of that design team who helps figure out what does this building look like? How do all the pieces fit together? You know, commu a community engagement piece as part of that. And then you can see sort of those additional as we get into the um, design phase, all the documents and processes that are involved in that. And so Griffin would help to oversee all of those things like the permitting process, um, like environmental review. And then again, having a community engagement and outreach component um, built into this whole thing. So we are recommending breaking their scope up into two pieces. The RFP included um, Big request that we were looking for someone to manage the whole project, um, you know, from start to finish. Um, we've decided that it makes a lot more sense to break it into two pieces. That we would have this first phase where we would they would oversee the pre-design, design, and permitting, which would take about two years. You can see. Um, oh, move this out of the way. Um, you can see, you know, that'll take us into about July 2022, this first initial contract. And and then at which point we will have a product of, you know, what is what is our building look like? What is the design? Um, and we would come back to you to issue a, a second contract for overseeing of the construction phase um, with a, you know, that separate scope. So you can see here a little bit uh, a sense of how we're breaking those phases up and sort of the timeline for when we'd be we doing that. So this contract will, would last us the next two, uh, this fiscal year we're in now, and then um, fiscal year 2022. And I'm just gonna skip over this recommendation and come back to it. I did wanna let you know that I have also been working hard to update the project page. So this is the cityofsantacruz.com slash mixed use library page. Now this page, which hopefully will be opening up, can you see that? I wasn't sure, I'm gonna assume yes. Um, and so this page I've been updating, this was the one that was created back in 2018 when, um, when council had voted to move forward with this project. So I've updated it with new information um, and created these little tabs. So I've got a project update page, which I will be working to update regularly, background information, um, you know, everything that all the background materials are here, any council meetings that we've had, there's links there. Um, really trying to get all the information in one page. And then I haven't quite built out, but I'm in the process of getting set up an FAQ page and then more information about the library um, programmatic goals and sort of the specifics around that. So this page will be available to the community um, to really, again, try and keep people as updated as possible. I know that there's been um, a lot of questions and people wanna know where we are in the process. And and again, um, I'm really excited to bring on Griffin Structures who can really help me um, build out some additional capacity in order to get that information out. Um, at the moment, I'm a one woman show. Um, and so I'm really pleased to bring, be bringing them on to assist. So just looping back to our recommendation here before you, this is the motion to award a contract for the mixed use library owner's representative for phase one to Griffin Structures. And it's in the amount of $240,000 and we're asking to authorize the city manager to execute an agreement in a form as approved by the city attorney. And with that, um, I'm here for questions. Bonnie is also on the line and I, I believe uh, we've got Susan Nemitz as well from the library. So if there's specific questions around that, we've got it, uh, the whole team here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So 
that, I'd like to open it up to council members for questions. I actually have a couple of questions. Um, so with regards to the contract, um, I guess, is it possible, like, can you just walk us through that, that process and, um, you know, whether the contract will be made public before it's, before it's agreed on by council members or if there's any way that the public could have it, could look at the contract that's going to be proposed. Because I think one of the big concerns that um, I've been hearing is that there's concern that um, the, I think there's a lot of concern around the affordable housing piece and how that fits in and any guarantees that that's going to happen within the project. Um, Mayor, if, if I may, I could go over the related, this might be the appropriate time to go over the related items around affordable housing that we've been working on since the June 23rd um, direction from council that do support this project. That'd be great. Okay, I'm gonna attempt to share my screen again. Okay, can, is, is that, can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so on June 23rd, actually on the same agenda as the council direction around the Library of Mixed Use Project, um, we had two related actions. And um, this is um, through our Housing Division of Economic Development. Both of uh, the first two items, the state match for our local trust um, housing program, um, is for actually the state program for our local affordable housing trust fund. Um, that program uh, specifically, we were able to leverage to the maximum grant award of five million. We had to show matching funds and council did support that action. Um, after that meeting, we did submit our grant, our grant application for the full $5 million match. We are um, anticipating um, hearing fairly soon about that war, reward, award. And the affordable housing in the Library of Mixed Use Project is one of the projects that we specifically slated. We had to identify projects of which we would um, use uh, for this funding it received. And this is one of the two projects, um, main two projects we mentioned. The other project, um, I, I'll just mention now, is the metro, uh, south of the metro station, 85 unit, 100% uh, affordable housing project that you also have approved um, key actions for, and we have additional funding being secured for that project as well. So the next item is the state permanent local housing allocation program known as PLHA. Um, for that one is a non-competitive grant process, but we still had to apply the grant application and meet all of the criteria. Uh, council, you did approve us to submit that application on June 23rd. We had to submit um, following your approval, a five-year plan to HUD, and we included in that plan the Library Mixed Use Affordable Housing Project as part of that. So the funding that we will receive, um, we'll be able to spend it in each of the next five years, will become a permanent affordable housing funding source. We identify the Library Mixed Use Project for that 1.5 million over the next period. So that was um, moved forward um, on the same evening and we submitted that in July and are also waiting um, for that. It's now included in our budget, our additional budget um, amendments that are going forward to council. Um, on July 2nd, um, and this is related to the Front Street um, on a purchase and sale agreement for the Metro housing project. And this is just showing additional affordable housing in the community. There were some of the questions to the, um, to the project that we weren't moving forward on affordable housing actions. And we've actually been quite, quite busy this summer um, on this related project. Um, they will potentially share some parking um, in the library mixed use project, which is also one of the reasons I'm mentioning it here. Um, we can go forward now and improving 100% um, affordable projects without providing public parking. It's ultimately going to be up to you at the council of what level of parking you would like to support these two affordable housing projects. So I just wanted to mention that. We are in the final round for finding out if we've received 10 million of transit-oriented development um, funding from uh, housing and community development for that project. And um, we just received some additional project-based vouchers. We're now up to 47 for that project as well. We're having ongoing meetings with Santa Cruz Community Health Center and Dentists and working through some conceptual rendering. So we are moving this forward. 
And then at the last meeting in August, Council, you approved the Arbor Cove Senior Commons lease extension, which is a preservation of 35 um, senior rental apartments and ADA improvements, um, really securing and preserving um, those affordable units in our community. And then just on the last agenda, and this is through the work of our Community Development Department, um, Council, you approved uh, AB 2162 support uh, for supportive housing projects. And um, this will really help move forward um, housing by right for uh, affordable housing projects in our community, um, specific ones in our community. And it does acknowledge at the state level now that for projects 50 units and under, um, they can move forward by right approval um, in our community for affordable housing with supportive housing development. So these are the developments that have happened this summer that support overall affordable housing creation and specifically that support this project. We are actively moving forward and securing affordable housing for the library mixed use project. It's something we take very seriously at the city. We recognize every outreach that we do in the community um, brings up affordable housing as one of the top issues that our community is facing. We recognize we're in a severe housing crisis and we're fully dedicated to having that be part of this project. I just wanted to respond and provide a little detail um, on that specifically because so many members of the public um, weighed in with those questions. Thank you. And Justin, just to answer your, your question around um, the contract, um, I, as we did with a lot of, with the, all the proposals we received as part of the downtown library subcommittee, I have posted Griffin Structures proposal on this website under the background information section. So that members of the public can get a sense of what, what's included in their, in their scope and, and what was included in the proposal. Um, and, and really the contract is our standard contract and then would include the details that, um, that were included in their proposal. So that information is available to the public now. And I would just add, because I forgot, Amanda, um, th thank you for bringing this up, that the Griffin Structures has two specific um, experts in affordable housing development and financing that is part of their team. And that was really one element that was um, made them really stand out from some of the other consultants on this project. And it was one of the, the top factors that we really felt strongly about in recommending um, that we move forward with them. Thank you. Uh, council Member Brown, and then I'll, I'll, I have another question, but I'll open it up to other council members. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, so I, I do have some questions because I, I feel like there's maybe a little disconnect in, in my mind, at least, about the what we're getting today vis-a-vis -vis the direction that was given back in uh, June, and so I'm, I'm just trying to kind of go through here and, and um, pull some of them out. But the big, I guess the big question is, um, you know, the direction was to move forward in this way, um, but it also included um, getting some detailed financial information about each component of the project that, and this is kind of just a follow up to um, Mayor Cummings' question. And so I'm, I'm feeling a little, um, a little. Uh, mm, I feel like that information is missing, and that there could be some set steps to help us understand the financial viability before um, taking on. You know, this is a this is a pretty significant cost right now when we are in dire financial straits, and I recognize that this is dedicated that the Measure F funding is dedicated for this purpose, but the other funding could be used for other purposes, the housing trust and and uh, the parking fund. Um, so one, I'd be interested in trying to understand how, what amount, so of the $240,000, what, um, where, in, in what amount of those, the various fund sources that you mentioned in the agenda report, um, how, you know, how that's broken out, that would be one thing. And then, um, and then kind of following up on that, um, if there's additional information we can get about um, the financial, uh, you know, kind of where the, how the parking piece would be financed. Um, I, I recognize that you're working on the affordable housing uh, piece and I, I absolutely like 100% commend you and really, really appreciate all the work you do to try to get us um, access to the greatest resources that we possibly can to subsidize those units. Um, but I, I'm just still a little confused. Um, the other piece is you know, for the library presentation we got at the committee and um, was sort of based on this um, 
some additional money needing to be raised. You know, we are now have 25.5 million um, for, for for the that's my understanding approximately that amount for um, for Measure S funds. And um, but there's there's a gap there, right? So four to six million dollars, depending on what um, version we use and what kind of you know additional internal um, amenities or, or features we include. So we dedicate all time to moving you know just one project forward. But we have a lot of different projects and programs on our plate. Having Griffin uh, structures on is this is their primary responsibility, making sure that we are looking at the most efficient way and, as Amanda said earlier, on time and on budget process. So the 240,000, we have the ability to terminate with 10 days' notice for any reason whatsoever this contract. So if at some point in the process we come forward and this project, um, you know, we are able to uh, get a grant award for critical affordable housing financing, I don't foresee that happening. But if there is some point in the process, we can terminate and we will not owe the balance of that contract. So we're only going to spend the services rendered by the consultant at, and in real time. And I think that's an important element to convey. As far as the four affordable, for the four funding sources, we have four. Um, they're briefly referenced in the fiscal impact, but we can go into a little more detail. It's the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. It is the Measure S funding. It is the parking fund. We have two $500,000 set aside for parking that were secured through uh, the sale of uh, 100 Laurel Street um, for, for the parking um, division for that offset of that public parking lot coming offline. And then as a, a development public benefit on the sale um, on the uh, project on 555 Pacific. The developer also contributed 500000 to go towards future parking. So we have that as a funding source um, that is available for this project that we secured specifically for parking. Um, we additionally have the Economic Development Trust Fund. Um, with what we plan on doing, what Amanda plans on doing, is sitting down um, with Griffin and going through these four funding sources and looking at a proportionate um, costing. Um, right now, just as a benchmark, we were just sort of holding 25% for each of these four as how we would set up that project. But that could change depending on uh, if we do it by square footage of what that final part of the overall project is. We're looking at having an equitable sharing of costs from each of the funding sources that's appropriate. So there won't be any subsidizing of Measure S funds for parking or any of the other components in the project. The ED trust fund is the gap funding um, for the overall project moving forward. Um, you asked about the parking funds, and I think Jim Burr is here on the call. He could probably specifically provide uh, some uh, feedback on that at this point. I will say that is, again, part of Griffin's scope is to really help us finalize in more detail um, what funding sources we have available, what is the correct path forward, are we doing parking revenue bonds, how can we support that, at what point do we need to secure those funding. Part of securing affordable housing funding for this project, in addition to what we've already applied for, additional funding, um, for example, if we were to move forward and try to secure uh, infrastructure grant funding or affordable housing sustainable community grant funding that are transit-oriented development projects, we need to have project entitlements for those. So there will be, at certain points in the project, funding that's available based on where we are in project approval. We've applied for uh, funding for our affordable housing trust fund, which we can use throughout the process and specifically secure for this project. So we do have that in place um, already at this time and um, you know several million um, in the works to be able to support this project. Um, and with that, I think I'll turn it over to Amanda, who may have some additional information um, to provide. Yeah, I mean, um, just wanted to, to sort of speak to the process again and, and where we're at and sort of the, I think part of the, one of the challenges from the 23rd is that we were the last item and it was the 11th, you know, 11 p.m. And so trying to sort of set all of these into a timeline of what could, what needs to come before what. So I, I, I do apologize that we didn't have a better sense of like how all of the direct, all, all of the council directions sort of lined it up, then what needed to come before what, you know, all of that, um, you know, I can certainly work on that now too to try and maybe reconstruct and represent that information from that direction. So um, do apologize that there is some, you know, 
understanding that there was an expectation that was set up at this meeting that we were going to be able to come forward with information that we just realistically couldn't come forward without having brought on this expertise. So I definitely want to, you know, honor that and, and take ownership for that piece. Um, but do want to just acknowledge that we do bring on owners reps for projects. Um, this isn't a new approach to project management. You approved uh, project managers for both the Branson 40 and Garfield Park libraries. We use this for the Marine uh, Sanctuary Exploration Center, the Tannery, um, you know, bringing on this professional expertise has helped the city to be successful. Um, so want to just sort of note that there is sort of precedent for, for going, taking this path and, and using professional project managers to help move forward complex projects. Um, and with that, I don't know if we've got any other um, departments that want to weigh in specifically regarding the funding pieces. Um, I'm not to happy. put anyone on the spot. <laughs> Well, I'm happy to jump in and just quickly. Am I there? Yep, we can see in there. Jim Burr here, Transportation Manager, Public Works. I'm happy to jump in and just quickly remind council that we did bring a whole rate analysis with um, the potential for funding a new garage uh, in June of 2018. Um, that was a five year plan. Obviously, COVID has had an impact, and we won't know the full the full, you know, uh, severity of that impact for, you know, a, a few months or maybe even another year out. Um, we have recently updated our, um, our permit wait list, and um, which is some indication of the demand on parking downtown. We found that we did lose um, almost a couple hundred people off the list uh, due to COVID, but we also gained uh, almost 30, and we are still at over a thousand people on the wait list for uh, downtown uh, parking permits. So, I think I think the downtown is going to bounce back, and we're going to and we're going to come out of this, and we're still going to need that supply. And um, again, we did establish that rates study uh, to fund uh, the parking portion of the project. Thanks. Council Member Brown, there was one other thing you mentioned, which was air rights, and I, I wanted to just give you a brief response to that. Um, as that was presented, we were at that time when we um, gave an overview of that was related to some work that Group 4 was doing as part of that scope for the Council Subcommittee, and that is one potential funding mechanism if Council, if, if you want to go forward, that could be utilized in order to really maximize um, the air rights fee that a developer would pay, we would almost certainly need to have some market rate housing in the project. And at this point, you know, our feeling is we absolutely are moving forward with the affordable housing. If you additionally decide you want to add on top of that some market rate housing to create a, a fund that can help fill a gap on the library portion, that is your direction to make towards us. We plan on with Griffin to go go forward and see, including within the development um, height envelope that we can do, how much additional housing on a market rate we could provide over the affordable housing component. So I think what we would like to do is bring forward to you um, some options as far as maximizing number of affordable housing units or a combination of a minimum of 50 affordable housing units and a certain number of market rate and what that development air rights fee potentially could be for the project and really have you make that decision of which direction you'd like to go. So that is some future uh, financing work that we need to do for you and we really like to do that um, with both our internal housing uh, team, um, some of our financial consultants that we use technical assistance for affordable housing and the consultant team on Griffin if that contract, if we move forward with that proposal. I see council member Byers. And Catherine, we don't see your yeah. video or audio yeah. there. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, for me, I need to really back up a bit. Uh, we've gotten tons of details today in this little space of time. But before I do that, I, I just want to make clear, I, oh, I understand hiring an owner's representative. We, I'm familiar with it. We've done many projects I've been involved in. So I'm not, I'm not objecting to that. 
at this, and I want to answer Jim regarding the parking garage. We have got to have a conversation on that parking garage. It's been promised to us, but it hasn't happened. So for you to just now, even with COVID, making it questionable, uh, we need to go over that whole um, study that was done that I don't think we've gotten into. So um, hopefully that's coming and that's going to be part of this big project um, we're looking forward to. But why I want to back up a bit, more than anything, I haven't seen anything in writing. I cannot move forward on a contract for $240,000. Haven't seen anything in writing. I know we've gotten a lot on our screen. I, thank you, Bonnie. I think you sent it to me. I didn't get it. I looked at this morning and I see something from you, but I can't, the thought of doing 240000 without seeing what was sent, what was the scope and what they are providing. Now, I know you've given us enough presentation on it, but I, that's just too much money without looking at the detail. Uh, I'm disappointed because uh, I think one of the things the 23rd, which to me would have answered all my questions, to come with us financials on these projects. Um, I think um, Councilmember Brown spoke, uh, spoke on that. I, you know, I don't need the details uh, down, but just a sense of how we are approaching these three projects. Uh, and that, that can be whatever it is that you can provide, but I was so looking forward to that. And then this, the $240,000, would fall above that. So I want to go back and, and still ask, at some point, provide to the council what we asked you to do, the financials, not this, you know, the financials that your, you and your staff see uh, on these projects. Um, I don't think there's any hurry. I would like it to come soon. And I'm sure everyone wants to keep moving this project along. But that was a critical um, request. Uh, and sort of the first to start floating us into this financial world. So I'm disappointed I don't have that. I, I, I put out right now, I, I still have not seen either the, um, well, I think you, we did talk about what, what we asked the consultant to do. But getting back um, from what I've, I've just heard today, I didn't, not convinced that, that this consultant will do the financials that I was looking forward uh, within these last three months. So I can't possibly be ready to, to vote on this. It just, uh, I, I think all council people should have this in front of them. It's $240,000. So anyway, I just hope that there will be more discussion about it. Uh, uh, the little t uh, pieces, I think I, I understand where we're going to get a consultant. Absolutely, we're going to need to do that. I wouldn't doubt it at all. But I do hope there's a lot more discussion, like on the parking garage and on the affordable units. And thank you, Bobby. You've done great work on affordable units this summer. I know you've been very busy. Keep bringing them to us, and we so far keep approving them. But anyway, let me just, I think I don't need to say it over and over again. Uh, I, I just... I just need to study these things and not just give the presentation on Zoom. Any other questions from council members at this time? I actually had a couple follow-up questions. Um, the first one, is there, is there any way to estimate the cost of the housing and the parking components just to get a sense of, you know, if we, based on the schematics provided by Group 4, um, and you know, knowing that there's been conversations with some um, affordable housing developers, is there any way to get estimates on what the part, because we know what the, the library costs will be. Is there any way to get any kind of just base estimate on the parking and housing? We could. I, I think the, the challenge is putting a number out there publicly when we're not quite sure yet what the design is going to be because that really influences cost. So, for example, if we're doing a double-loaded corridor versus a single-loaded corridor, how we're stacking those units, what efficiencies um, we're able to make with the, a base, is going to be based on the layout and the design of the project. 
you know, we had um, had some feedback from council and in some of the versions of the library where we had a skylight going all the way up with, uh, you know, open, you know, and some garden that's coming in. And so that changes what the housing can be on top as well. So, uh, you know, rule of thumb, you know, 300,000 per unit um, could be, a, you know, a ballpark estimate for the uh, cost of affordable housing development. Um, but that number can go up significantly or down significantly depending on how many units we have and what some of the other efficiencies are. So I think to give you a really a accurate number, we again, you know, we would need to have just a little more uh, flushed out with what design we're going for, and then we can cost that out. But um, so, I, you know, typically for a project that's, you know, 50 million or more, if it were a standalone affordable housing project, you know, that could be anywhere from 30 million, you know, and, and up. So um, we can come back with that detailed information, but it seemed a little premature to put real numbers out to the public when we don't have yet, you know, a design or even a conceptual design that the council has supported that we could then provide costing for. We did include in the presentation by Group 4 and Amanda's presentation previously earlier in the summer um, estimates for the library portion. Um, that was specifically a scope that you had us move forward on as part of the council subcommittee work. So we did provide that information. But to really do accurate uh, cost modeling around the affordable housing um, we're, we're going to need to have, um, you know, more information on the project that's going to be forthcoming after we hire specific consultants. So that's why we don't have that now. We have very general estimates and we could, you know, separately we can, we can bring something forward and talk about that sooner than later. But it seemed premature to put real public numbers out there yet when we don't have what that design will be. And I think just to reiterate, you know, we think about all the work that we did on the library as part of the downtown library subcommittee. We had to bring on professional architect consultants to get us those really rough, you know, get us those estimates around what a renovation would cost, what a mixed use project would cost. And so without that expertise, it's hard to be able to put those hard numbers. I mean, you know, you looked at the two volume <laughs> report that group four put together in an attempt to get to those numbers. And so we, you know, as I mentioned in my presentation, really gonna, going to need to bring on this professional design, um, you know, consultant um, team to, to help us get to those numbers. And it's sort of a difficult cart before the horse thing, knowing that you want that information, but that there are kind of these other steps that we need to get to before we can, you know, have those hard firm numbers, um, recognizing that it's, a, it's not a, straightforward number, it, it's dependent on a lot of other things. Okay, and then I guess I'm wondering if somebody from transportation can comment on the parking, if there's a way to get an estimate of what, you know, based on what we heard from group four around the 400 space parking garage, how much that would cost. Hi, Jim Bergen. Um, yeah, we did the original rate study, again, that was June of 2018, I believe based on one of the first concept designs, um, which I believe was between 23 and 27 million uh, for the parking piece. That um, footprint has now shrunk with the, as a result of sort of a, a remix of the use on the property. And uh, I would expect that number to come down, um, although we're, we're fighting inflation um, and especially construction inflation as the longer we move forward uh, without uh, building. So that's what the original estimates were based on and uh, we estimated a 30 year bond payment uh, for that price tag. Uh, we inflated it somewhat and then estimated 30 years and uh, set the five year rate study uh, appropriate to uh, pay back that bond. Is, does that answer your question? Yeah, someone, and I have a follow-up. I'm just curious um, because I think that from what some of my colleagues have said, that there's kind of an interest in you know having these some of, some of these estimates in a report that they can read and that the public can read before um, you know making a final decision. I'm just kind of wondering how we might be able to put some of this information together for the public so that people can understand you know more or less what the costs are, what the sources of funding there are. And, opportunities for, um, you know, funding. So 
it sounded like, for example, if we get to some of the later phases and um, kind of design and moving forward, there might be other state funding for affordable housing. But I'm just wondering, I'm trying to get to, you know, address some of the concerns from the community to see how we might be able to put this information together in a report and what the timeline might be in order to do that. If I could just sort of jump in, um, just because I was recently working on this, that the web page that has the background information, I have detailed every single council meeting where this is um, where this is, has been discussed, and I give a little blurb about the information that was provided. So I've provided links to the meetings and the staff reports and any attachments. So for example, the meeting that Jim is uh, referring to where they came forward with the downtown parking rate, I'm looking at it now, it was June 19th, 2018, we had a study session. So there are links to all that information from that report. Um, and again, you know, I've, I've cataloged it all the way back to 2016 where we received that initial council direction to, to do that exploratory work. So um, just as a resource so people know that that's there, that I've gone through and wanted to make it really easy for people to get the background and find all the information. So that does exist um, as sort of background materials. And as we receive more information, as we move forward on this process, um, we'll be posting that information as well to the site that Amanda is, um, the very robust site that Amanda has been building. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, I, and that's great, and I'm so glad that, you know, that information is available on there. I just think that for some folks, when they see the reports come forward and they don't, you know, they, they tend to not, you know, remember or know where the information is. So I'm just wondering if, you know, um, you know, moving forward, you know, we can have some kind of like summary of either where people can find information or, you know, if people are interested in knowing more about parking or affordable housing or even, you know, having information about, you know, what sources of funding can help pay for the, um, the project and what are the different phases for that, you know, to happen at the state level. If we move into design, this funding will be available for affordable housing, what we currently have, just so that people are aware, because I think that sometimes it, it becomes difficult to find this information as well. So um, I think that would be useful. And then I did have a question. I know when we were having these, um, when the subcommittee had met, there had been conversations uh, well, we had been um, made aware that some affordable housing developers had stepped forward and had mentioned that they were interested in um, potentially being involved with building the projects. I was wondering if you could speak to that or like who some of those people are and, and are there still conversations happening? Yeah, so we separately, um, but in anticipation of the fact that we have a council direction, this ties all the way back to the housing blueprint subcommittee work, um, to look at the city's surface lots and city-owned property for the potential development of affordable housing in our community. So we specifically, with sort of the metro project in mind, potentially this project in mind, and other opportunities um, on city lots, um, put out a request for qualifications um, to affordable housing developers. Um, I'm trying to think exactly when we put that out. I want to say we did that in the spring. Um, we received nine um, robust responses, and actually it was from that pool that we put out um, a subsequent and really worked with um, in selecting uh, for the future housing for the Metro uh, 85 unit project going forward. So we right now have a qualified pool um, as I said, it was nine developers. There's five that um, have projects that they've done uh, in the greater sort of uh, Bay Area um, that are interested in developing affordable housing in our community, particularly if there is city um, both funding and or land available. It becomes very attractive for affordable housing developers if they know they have a city partner that's either providing the land and or um, has the funding to subsidize any gap financing on the project. So. We had a very robust response um, from very well-known affordable housing developers. We can separately come forward to you with an overview of that. Um, and maybe um, just from the previous council discussion on the item earlier, there was an interest in coming back, um, you know, around housing. And I know for some time we've talked about housing, having a, a housing uh, study session. So we could we could bring some of that information um, back to you. Okay. Thanks, um, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, 
Yeah, I just uh, just wanted to chime in. I uh, appreciate the staff's presentation, uh, clarifying the, um, the the point in time that we are in with this with this project. Um, I'm thinking back to some of the big projects we've approved this year, literally on consent. Even bigger projects, you know, some of our water projects are in the 60 million range, um, and I think um, you know there's a there's a process around. Um, hiring the companies that we need to actually, you know, accompanying our, our limited staff so that we need these projects up and running. And, um, you know, the best way to ensure that the investment that the, that the taxpayers have made really um, is to hire a qualified firm that can really provide the robust information that we need to move forward. So, you know, I see this initial contract as, as really our due diligence first step um, to be spending um, the resources smartly to have a, um, a company that has the breadth of experience and expertise across um, both affordable housing as well as libraries and the parking garage. So I think in a sense, um, you know, if you're gonna hire a contractor to build your house or an architect to design a new house for you. I mean, this is this is our due diligence step, you know, and, and this is this is the team who will actually, you know, advocate and um, review the information that really fits into the vision for what was um, you know, what was uh, approved um, three months ago. And so I think um, this is um, you know, I, I, I just you know, I hope my colleagues understand we, we can't get to understanding all the specifics until we start with the first step. And the first step is this, is, is, is the contract. Um, I did review the contract last night. Um, and I, I feel like um, based on some of the firms that I looked at through their, you know, I just feel like we've, we've got a really qualified candidate. Uh, I'm excited to get them on board. Uh, I, I do worry that as we continue to sort of, sort of, um, you know, Look for those bigger answers that um, that we're losing. We're losing resources as we go, and so um, you know, in a sense, that inflation does continue. Um, and and I think it's important that we we uh, move forward um, at at some point. I don't know if we'll do that today, but um, I very much appreciate all my colleagues' com uh, com uh, comments today. But I really do believe that this is our due diligence first step, and that's and that's the right way to do a big project like this. So um, I know there's a lot of questions about what's ahead, but um, you know I think back on the Tannery project, which you know is a project that everyone loves in this town. Um, I remember looking at those reports, um, the the amount of due diligence, the architects, the engineers, the cost estimators, the. It, it, these projects are so complicated, and, and at the end of the day, there's going to be dozens of people who advise us and try to bring home a project that, um, you know, when you build a project for government, um, you know, you you want to do it in an efficient way and spend those resources um, as effectively as possible. So, um, you know, we've done projects like this. We can do this project. Um, we can we can meet the objectives of our community, which is affordable housing, a new library, and replace parking downtown. Um, we have reduced the amount of parking downtown by over, you know, a couple hundred parking spaces. So again, um, this is our very first step. I think um, we uh, we just continue to uh, bring a, additional, um, really qualified resources into the into this into this uh, complicated project. And I think I think we'll succeed in the end. So I want to uh, thank the staff. They've been on a uh, a, a wild ride over the last few months um, to carry a project like this in normal times is hard to carry a project like this while also trying to, um, you know, save our lo local businesses, um, you know, get people the information they need out of federal government uh, funding. Uh, it's it's amazing that this even got done. So I really want to compliment Bonnie and Amanda because you're carrying a heavy load from COVID and, um, you know, it. it, 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 it just, so just thank you and, and, and for the public to know um, what they're able to do on top of all the other things around trying to save our local businesses and everything else. Um, this is a heavy lift and I'd, I'd really like to see us um, uh, try to get this, get this, let's get this moving. Thank you. Hey, Council Member Golden. 
I share some of the same sentiments that Vice Mayor Myers was expressing, and I would like to say I don't think $240,000 is chump change, but I do think it's a small investment compared to what the overall cost of the project is going to be, and I think it's responsible for the city because they don't have the expertise in this kind of like niche building to hire an outside firm with experience in um, bringing these projects to fruition. And I think ultimately this investment in their services will save the taxpayers of Santa Cruz money in the end and make sure that the project can be completed with um, with all of everybody's vision kind of in there and um, hopefully, you know, under or at budget. So um, when it's time after public comment, I'm prepared to make a motion um, to recommend the contract. Vice Mayor Myers. Oh, you're muted. Um, I just wanted to add one more thing. Um, I think the staff mentioned this, but you know, we have approved two other library contracts so far. Um, Susan Nimitz, who uh, is really heading up all the library uh, related aspects of this. Um, she was constantly updating us on the on the cost projections with the library uh, during our, our subcommittee work, so I really appreciated that. Um, and you know, she is well on her way to um, to completing really amazing libraries for our for our broader community around the county. Um, the Felton Library is absolutely stunning. It's um, an amazing place, and um, so we do have real time cost estimates. I think there's a lot of um, a lot of due diligence pieces in place already because Susan is literally building four, four libraries right now. Um, and so we are, going to have, we are going to have current costs. We're going to have engaged contractors who have built those, those types of buildings, bidding, bidding on this. Um, so this is not a one-shot deal. Susan is, is deep in this. She's been in it for over two and a half years now. Um, I really feel like we're a very, we could have a really well-informed uh, process to, um, to get this uh, get this up and ready. So um, just wanted to add that as well. Thank you. Okay. Oh, and I will second the motion. Are there any further questions? I'm actually gonna ask that we hold off on making motions until after we hear from the public since we haven't uh, actually opened this up to public comment yet. So um, if there are no further questions on this item, then I'm going to turn it over to the public for public comment. So if there are any members of the public who would like to comment on item number 12 related to um, the mixed use contract proposal, now is the time to call in. Um, there are numbers on your screen. The toll free numbers have not been working, so please make sure to call the non toll free numbers if you'd like to comment on this item. Um, once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand uh, when the when you have been called upon, you'll be asked to unmute your phone and you'll be given two minutes to comment on this item. And first speaker, you are on the line. Hello, this is Donna Murphy and I'm speaking in support of moving forward with the appointment of an owner's representative for the downtown library mixed use project. Please remember the voices not in the room or on the line, our children and teens, low income citizens and seniors who use the library for community, internet services, information and critical resources. Think of the 50 or so families that can have affordable housing downtown. And think of the workers commute into downtown. Every delay costs money and time. This project needs to move forward. Further delay serves no one. Please approve the owner's representative and keep this important resource on track. Okay. Thank you. Next caller, you're on the line. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Hi, it's Rick Longinati. 
Um, I just wanted to point out something that I think it's hard for all of us to take in, which is, you know, the, the situation that we're in economically right now. You know, we lost a number of businesses already downtown, 99 Bottles, Poet and Patriot, Pono, Hawaiian Grill, Nourish, Salon, the Square, Salvation Army, Walgreens, Starbucks, and I could keep on going. Uh, those folks are more in touch with the depth of the recession than we are. Um, but the public's going to look to the council to see how it's spending its money in these times. Um, you know, Jim Burr mentioned that there was a study in 2018 about the financing model for the for the garage portion. I want to read to you part of that study. This was done by a firm called Economic and Planning Systems. It says the model, in other words, the city's model, does not evaluate a worst case scenario for parking revenues where a major recession occurs. So the city's model is not worth much right now. The city needs to go back to the drawing board. But more than that, it needs to look at, you know, the, the, the economics of parking study that was done and paid for by the city but has not come to the council. And just to give a spoiler alert, the, Nelson Nygaard in that study said the most fiscally prudent approach to accommodating additional parking demand is to modernize parking management and better align parking prices to the cost of building and maintaining the system. So nothing about a new garage was endorsed by Nelson Nygaard. Now, folks, I've heard talk of due diligence today, but I, I really can't understand anybody on the council who would think you're doing due diligence if you have not heard from Nelson Nygaard in a $100,000 study that the city commissioned. If you have any... If you have any defense of that, I'd like to hear it. Thank you. Yeah. Again, if there's any member of the public who'd like to call in to comment on the contract for the mixed-use developer for the library project, now's the time to call in. Please make sure that you use the um, non-toll-free numbers that are on your screen. And when you would like to speak, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. You will then be unmuted and you will be given two minutes to speak. Okay. Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. It, uh, is this my turn to talk? Yes. Okay. This is Jean Brocklebank. My statement is not about for or against an owner's representative. This is about revisionist history, whereby staff has changed the narrative again. The minutes of your June 23rd meeting, which were approved by you, Council, in August, are a public record. These minutes include your directive to staff to return no later than three months with specified information. Three months is today. On August 25th, even the city manager repeated that that specified information requested would be available to council by September 22nd. Now the Environmental De uh, Development Department webpage claims that the owner's uh, uh, representative will provide the information sometime in the future. This blatant manipulation of the public record must stop. The RFP list of the scope of duties for the owner's rep representative does not include the information specified in the June 23rd minutes to be made available to the council no later than September 23rd. If any council member disagreed with the June 23rd minutes, they should have had them corrected for the record in August. No one did that. Therefore, today, the Economic Development Department and the Council is considering revising history once more. This is outrageous. I ask you not to approve this contract until EDD can come back with some ballpark figures. They ought to have ballpark figures at the very least. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Uh, hello, 
Hello, am I on? Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dustin. This is Pauline Seals representing 1,600 members in um, Santa Cruz Climate Action Network. Um, so I'm going to try to be brief. We don't want it. The vast number of people in the city who we have talked to, and we've talked to very many, uh, don't like this project at all. They voted for a library update, and they will say, we never voted for this. We don't need it. Rick Bongiannotti uh, mentioned that. And the, after COVID, a lot, a lot of people will still be riding the bikes they just bought and will still be working from home. And that will leave the city struggling to try to pay the huge debt that they will take out building this unneeded garage. Um, there are other ways to get affordable housing. And this is just a really long project to be pursuing. Um, the recent fires, nobody's mentioned that yet. Only two weeks ago, we were choking on smoke. Climate change is here now, and it's going to get worse. And we have to make drastic changes. Business as usual is completely unacceptable. Around the world, many cities are making drastic moves to become sustainable cities. Building a new garage is completely wrong. Thank you for all your hard work, and thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Oh, hi, thank you. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for your hard work and thank you to the staff for a fuller clarification today. It is needed. My name is Bob Morgan and I'm speaking on behalf of the Sierra Club. I heard earlier that there is no formal final contract to vote on today. I think that's an important consideration of this council when it makes its vote. Moreover, we believe in governance that is transparent and fiscally responsible. A no vote on moving ahead demonstrates to the community and the city that the city staff will be required to do their due diligence in giving the council more details on which to make a vote to embark on planning with an owner's representative. To date, fundamental details are lacking. Specifics on affordable, affordable housing units, thorough database critical analysis for the need of a garage and its expense and its financing, particularly during COVID and its um, aftermath. An explanation of the fiscal means to increase the size of the proposed library, now defined as air rights. And most importantly, a confirmation on state support through grant funding, something the Economic Development Department had said would be determined by now. All these details are not available to the City Council or to the public. The Sierra Club asks the Council, how can you proceed with a contract without this basic knowledge? We ask you to pause and to ask the City staff to provide you with these details before you proceed with this contract. Thank you very much for your hard work. Bye now. Mayor, you're muted. If you were calling on another speaker, is that is, am I live? The next speaker, you're on the line. Am I live? In case I'm live, my name is Mark Masidi Miller. I'm a longtime Santa Cruz City resident, and I'm calling today to urge you to vote in favor of awarding the mixed-use library owner's representative contract to Griffin Structures Incorporated. 
it is high time for the new downtown library mixed-use project to move forward. Since time is of the essence in this matter, retaining Griffin Structures as the owner's representative to expedite the design and construction of this needed facility is a wise and prudent action. Do not be distracted by the loud noise from a few. Rather, keep your eye on the benefits this project will provide to the people. A vibrant new library with dedicated space for children, teens, and the community at large. 50 or more affordable housing units in the heart of our downtown. A permanent home for the farmer's market and a shared use parking facility to serve Lower Pacific Avenue businesses, affordable housing projects, and the healthcare clinics planned for this part of downtown. Everyone knows time is money. Do not waste any more of our hard earned tax dollars. Move forward with this next step today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, you're on the line. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, my name is Robert Singleton. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of uh, the Council moving forward by getting an owner's representative. Um, I think this project has been, has gone through a lot of different iterations, uh, has responded to a lot of public feedback, but is ultimately still an incredibly valuable project for the future of our downtown. And the major decision to move forward with this project has already been taken by this council. So this is really just more of a procedural vote to make sure that we have, you know, a really strong advocate to make sure that we're getting the best deal for our, for our taxpayer dollars. Um, this project has morphed multiple times. Um, in responding to people's criticisms about parking, you all passed a recommendation that caps the number of parking spaces at 200. So I don't know why people keep saying that there's going to be a six-story monstrosity parking garage when you guys have actually cut it by more than half, and that the number of parking spaces proposed in this final project is actually less than we're expecting to lose over the next five years anyway. So downtown's going to have less parking in the future, hopefully a big brand new library, hopefully at least 50, perhaps uh, as many is 100 deed-restricted affordable housing units that you guys can actually help build as part of your explicit goals under the housing blueprint and your general plan and everything else we've wanted to do to help promote more affordable housing, especially near transit in downtown. Um, so I just do not see why people are still trying to drag their feet on a procedural vote when you guys should be moving forward, getting the best the best deal for our taxpayer dollars and making sure that we're following through with getting more affordable housing downtown, a brand new library, and just mitigating the loss of parking that we're expecting over the next couple of years. So please move forward. Please uh, approve an owner's representative on behalf of this project. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker, you're online. Next speaker, you've unmuted yourself. Uh, we're ready for your comments. Okay, next speaker. And this is Jane Barr with Eden Housing. Thank you for uh, allowing me to talk today. I'm calling in support of the um, approval of the contract for the mixed use project. Um, it, it needs to get moving forward. It's a, a project that needs to be on time, and, and a lot of time has passed since the bond was approved in 2016. It's appropriate to have a mixed-use project downtown. It will solve three problems. Uh, need for new enlarged uh, library that will serve the, uh, uh, the city residents, 
uh, needed parking as you lose other parking lots for uh, to development and desperately needed affordable housing. Uh, the time frame is uh, so tight that I encourage the city and the consultant to uh, select affordable housing developer as soon as possible to get them into the process and give them the time needed to re to uh, get approved for uh, state funding and other funding needed to, to build affordable housing. Eden Housing is very interested in this project and we did respond to the city's RFQ. Whether or not we're selected or someone else, I uh, urge you to move forward as quickly as possible and improve this uh, contract today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, you're on the line. Hello, uh, thank you, Mayor Cummings and council members. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. My name is John Hall. I'm asking you to postpone consideration of the agenda item until city staff provide the financial report that council directed them to provide so that a council meeting can give full and due fiscal consideration to appointing an owner's representative. The public is not confused and this is not a procedural vote. The city council voted to direct a financial report from staff concerning all components of the project within three months. For now, a firm providing those financial details about the components uh, in an August meeting and staff has not provided a detailed financial report. These are uncertain economic times, the city faces $30 million deficit, spending 240000 to hire an owner's representative without knowing where the rest of the money's coming from would be like trying to buy a house without having any way to pay for it. The bank wouldn't lend the money, the seller wouldn't take the deal. Staff ought to have a great deal of information and it's given little tidbits today. The council is obligated uh, to consider them in a sober and thoughtful way, not just in an off-the-cuff presentation. You need to know whether funding was awarded for affordable housing grant applications. You need to know where the city is going to get an estimated four to six million dollars of additional funding for the library, something that the presenters have ducked, a question they've ducked today. You need to know whether construction costs, bond funding, and parking revenue projections pencil out for a garage that's actually unneeded, and yes, it would be six stories. I'm well aware that a majority of you voted in June to move ahead with a mixed-use project, but you did not vote to put the cart before the horse. The, horse. Uh, the council should postpone expenditure of any money until you get these answers. Thanks for your work and your consideration. Next speaker, you're online. My name is Karen Simmons. Um, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. Um, uh, this cart and horse analogy, uh, I want to just mention that that requires a hitch, and that hitch is the public. And this public has tried in this very difficult format and in many ways to say that this cart and this horse are not compatible and that we are not going to use the hitch to, to get, get that cart and horse together to move this forward. Again, the three components, the affordable housing, the library, and the garage uh, do not have to be put into a multi-use project. And I am speaking on behalf of Downtown Commons, and that lot is one of the last big open spaces that could be used for outside uh, use. And in this time of the last six months, we all understand what that means. And our city doesn't really have that. And I just want to mention all the losses we will have because of this multi-project, even though those three components can be 
you know, we can still have those three things. You know, we will lose the 116-year-old site of the library, and we will shatter that civic center triangle that I went and saw the Black Lives Matter paintings when they were uh, making it, and that that feeling there of having that as a civic triangle was very powerful. Uh, so I just want to uh, mention uh, what, again, what we're losing with this multi-site project, how every day the dollars towards renovating the library where it is, uh, is, is diminishing and diminishing. And uh, so therefore, please do not uh, hire that consultant today. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, you're on the line. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Cummings and City Council members. Uh, this is Lisa Ekstrom, Santa Cruz resident, and I'm calling to say please postpone awarding the owner's representative contract. Uh, in June, as we've all been discussing, the, this council directed the city staff to provide the detailed financial information and other report, important reports within three months, and those necessary reports haven't been provided yet. It doesn't make sense, and it's not responsible to pay out almost a quarter of a million dollars to hire a company to provide these crucial reports. We've also already paid out 100000 for a related downtown Town parking strategic plan that's never been completed or submitted to City Council. So to award the owner's representative contract without the basic financial due diligence would be irresponsible in any time. But in the crises that we now find ourselves facing, this would not just be irresponsible, it would be unconscionable. Don't spend $240,000 on this contract until we can see the finances will actually be there. Thank you so much for your time and your consideration and your hard work. Thank you for your call. Okay, next speaker, you're on the line. Hello? Good afternoon. Hi. Um, good afternoon, Mayor Cummings and um, Council. Um, we, we've heard um, Bonnie Lipscomb say that she will be hearing fairly soon about this $5 million match and other grant monies. Uh, well, we can postpone this uh, award of this um, Griffin contract until we do hear, because we have no idea if the money will be there. Other people have spoken more articulately than I will be able to. But um, you, and for um, Council Member Golder to be prepared to make a motion prior to even hearing public comment really is um, disappointing. Uh, so three years ago, Nolan Tan provided a timeline. Jason Architects came up for, with the timeline for the library. Uh, Group 4 came up with the timeline. Now we're paying again for a timeline. This uh, complicated project was bad from the start. And as others have said, there are other places to provide affordable housing. Everybody wants that. Low-income housing specifically, I believe. So. Um, I think it's premature to award this uh, contract. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, you're on the line. Yes, um, can I be heard at this time? Yes, good afternoon, go ahead. Yeah, my name is Enda Brennan. I'm your representative to the Downtown Commission currently, and we have been going through a lot of sobering numbers with regard to parking income. So obviously these are extremely challenging times with record unemployment among our city population, income starting to run out from the federal pandemic program. Every dollar that we spend is coming out of our pockets and we trust all seven of you to be extremely careful about that money. Now, 
we can all agree to disagree uh, whether we're supporting this project, okay? But the real issue comes down to whether or not there are dollars there to actually build it. And the fact that there may be a $5 million grant that may come forward, why would we spend a quarter million dollars now without knowing that we have money to make this project happen? I ask all of you on the council, especially Justin Cummings, who said the key to this project for him was low income and affordable housing to make sure that that money is there before we waste $240,000 that could be spent on low-income housing instead of hiring a consultant that we may never need to use because we don't have the monies to make this project happen. So with all due respect, I would request that you postpone this and identify the funds for this project. I understand that well-meaning people can be on either side of the Taj Garage issue, but I think it's highly irresponsible, especially for those that are on the ballot in November, to be throwing a quarter million dollars at this without knowing where the rest of the money is coming from. So please, postpone this decision. Thank you for your comments. Uh, before the next speaker speaks, I'd just like to say that um, if there's any member of the public who's called in who has not had a chance to speak, now is the time to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand if you'd like to comment on this item. Um, if there are no new speakers by the end of the current speaker, we'll move on to, we'll close uh, public comment and move on to action and deliberation. So next speaker, you can go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Hi, thanks, Mayor Cummings. Uh, my name is Kelsey Hill. I'm a community member in Seabright and also a candidate for Santa Cruz City Council. I'm concerned with the way this body is moving forward with this contract, um, especially by way of signaling an intent to motion before the public has been heard. In my view, the project has exemplified the gap between this council and the willingness to hear, uh, truly hear the concerns of the public for a multi-million dollar project. I want to echo sentiments expressed by council members Brown and Byers that $240,000 should not be approved in the challenging budgetary times we're in without those ballpark figures. There's been discussion of proper investment of taxpayer dollars, the sense of urgency to get this project moving, um, how this opposition to the project is a small minority, but moving forward with business on the premise that we'll have a better idea of our finances after we reward a contract is not sustainable governing in a COVID-19 recession. It's also not acceptable to me that community members are being dismissed in their concerns over the lack of a financial report. I appreciate the time given to me and uh, for all the community members and staff giving attention to this important issue, and I urge the council to postpone a contract approving this project. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Henry Hooker. Um, I am a resident of Santa Cruz and represent Santa Cruz Seniors for Housing. The project really needs to move forward. Building affordable housing and a new library are both desperately needed by the city. I'm calling in a way on behalf of the many young and lower income users of the library, as well as the future occupants of the low income units that will be provided. Stalling this project only increases the cost of the project and does nothing to address the concerns regarding costs, which can only increase as time, go on, as time goes on. And it was my understanding uh, from the staff report that the consultant, we're not just writing a check for a quarter of a million dollars, the consultant only gets paid for the amount of work that he does, much of which will actually be to help us learn more about the future costs of the of the project and the existing library can't be renovated without a year at least of no library which is really difficult for the many users who are dependent upon it so i'm asking you to please move forward today with hiring the project manager so that we can get this done for the future of the city thank you okay thank you Next speaker.
You're on the line. Good afternoon, Mayor Cummings and council members. I'm Ron Pomerantz. Uh, staff certainly has the cart way before the horse in this complicated public works project. A primary task of the contract should be budget oversight. That's pretty rough when there's no budget to have any oversight over, especially when this vital information was promised before this development proceeds and your vote should be taken today. How can this controversial and critical agenda item be on consent? Is uh, staff trying to keep the public out of the public process? With a looming budget catastrophe due to the impacts of COVID-19 crisis, please hold this money for essential city services and workers till the budget sky clears. This significant expenditure of nearly a quarter million dollars is a non-essential use. Additional parking isn't needed anytime soon, if ever. The library's happy in its current location. The city has more affordable housing projects on paper than it can manage based on past history. The town square idea for the farmer's markets gaining support needs further community awareness, understanding and conversation. There's no hurry to move this project today. Where's the contract in the staff report for the public to review? There's so many unanswered questions, everything from the ownership of the land and the buildings to the designing of the space, from the amount and sources of funding for the promised affordable housing to financing the parking garage and library. The staff report only says that the first phase by Griffin will include, quote, include pre-design, designing, and permitting. There's nothing about a budget. There's, where's the contract? There's nothing, uh, uh, the complications of this Frankenstein project and is designed to get council member votes without the implications being adequately thought through. This agenda item appears as a sleight of hand by staff to bamboozle the council and the public. Please postpone any decision today. Thank you for your time and thoughtful consideration. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, we're gonna close out public comment on this item. I would like to ask that we take a quick, or it looks like we have one more person who wants to comment on this item. Please. You may uh, before, you, before you speak, you may want to turn down your uh, streaming device. We can hear it, and we might start getting an echo if you if you don't turn it down. Okay, hold on. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yep, you sound sound great. You have two minutes. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. Go ahead. Hello? We can hear you. Hello? We yes, can hear yes. you. <laughs> can you hear me? No. Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, you're now muted, so if you could please unmute your phone. Um, and once you've been unmuted, you can go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, hi, this is Mark Lee. Um, I want to make sure, uh, I appreciate what the city is doing and in terms of working on the various alternatives for the community. But the garage library is too premature. It is too early to make a decision on hiring a uh, owner's representative, Griffin Solutions, um, structures, I'm sorry. The uh, There are many people that are still uh, growing in numbers within the city of Santa Cruz who favor and still favor the development, uh, re renovation of the main library downtown on Church Street. Likewise, there's a growing number of citizens during these difficult times. They want to retain the farmer's market where it's at and make it into a community commons at a less, a higher, a less costly price to the taxpayers. Putting the, uh, committing to a, this project that's estimated to cost in excess of $87 million is not the right time. Uh, right now, the library on Church Street is now underused and not even open. This is the perfect time to begin 
uh, renovating with the $23.5 million that was available under Measure S that we all voted for. So this, we don't have to make a decision to make sure, and I appreciate it, that we postpone any awarding of a contract to Griffin Solutions at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much for comments. Okay, we're gonna close public comment. Before we get started, I'm gonna ask that we take maybe a five minute break. We've been sitting since I think 9.30 this morning. And so I just wanna give people an opportunity to stretch their legs and um, use any facilities if necessary. So we'll come back. Actually, Mayor Cummings, yeah. I'm sorry I got my hand up because I've been trying to communicate um, that I, I, once again, as I often do, I'm getting messages from people saying they're trying to raise their hands and are not being called upon. So if you see uh, a number on there that ends in 4965, if you could give that person an opportunity to speak. Okay. And for members of the public, if you'd like to speak, please press star nine on your phone. That will allow you to raise your hand and you'll be given two minutes. Um, Council Member Brown, um, can you repeat the, the last four digits of the number? 4965. I don't have anyone uh, with those last four digits. Okay. Thanks. So the person said they tried four times to, they've pressed star nine four times now. So I don't know what okay. the. I, I just don't see the last four digits of that number. So, I mean, there, there are people on here, some of whom have spoken, some of whom have not, but it's, it's difficult to discern between them if they don't have their hands raised. So, again, if anyone would like to uh, comment on this item, now's the time. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and uh, you'll be given two minutes to speak. Mayor, if I, if I may, before you have the next speaker. I think, I know we have a council member who already indicated they were interested in, in making a motion. I think if, before we take a break, we could, I would say it'd probably be ideal for the community as well, just to kind of close out this item. So I would advocate that we have a break after we're able to, to finish off this item. Um, I would very much appreciate that. I think that if we can take a short break, because as I mentioned, like we've been sitting since 9.30 and, and I think some of us, um, don't have an opportunity to kind of walk away and take breaks. And so um, if the maker of the motion wants to make the motion, I, for example, I need to go and use the facility. So um, I think that if we can all take a break before we begin action and deliberation, uh, I think that would be better so that we can start and continue through this item after that point, so. Okay, seeing no members of the public, we'll take a brief break. We'll reconvene at 2.30. And so if people need to use the facilities, now's a good time. And after that, we will t take action on this item and move on with our meeting. Sure. Members could, uh, once you're back, turn on your video so we know that you're here. We can go ahead and Continue moving forward. Mayor Cummings, um, just I I was mistaken. The text I got was the last four four nine six five, but the person has actually been pressing star nine pretty consistently over and over from uh, number ending in 8838. Can you, I, I didn't have my headphones on, can you repeat that? The number, the so the last person that um, was trying to get on who, of the many who have been texting me today to get into this meeting um, is uh, the number, the ending number is actually 8838, not 496. Okay. You can. Okay. I'll give them an opportunity. I see that I see that number on here, and so I'll give that member of the public an opportunity to speak. Thanks. Okay. All right, you are on the line. 
Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I think there's an issue with the numbers. Uh, the ones in the bottom don't work. You don't seem to be able to see it, so I dial in again, but thank you again. My name is Candace Brown. I'm a 45-year resident and a member of the Transportation and Public Works Commission. We just re received a very dire report yesterday about the financial situation for Public Works and Transportation. They've taken an 18.25% cut not including the 28 vacancies in the last three years. If you look at Marcus Pimento's slides uh, before he left, he talked about the financial cliff, and we're in the middle of, and that was before the pandemic and the fires and the dire issues that people are having financially right now. I think people need to step back, and really think about what's happened in the last three months. Everything has changed. The Public Works Department has zero money, zero money for capital improvements budget this year and it doesn't look any better in the years ahead. I'd like to see a financial modeling of the impact of this project moving forward, not only in the next few years, but in the next 30 years. And I'm specifically talking about the financial cliff between now and 2026. It's going to affect the general fund. I am an accountant. And even though we have accepted projects that are over $60 million for water, we set aside in slow road water security with the aquifer and reclamation. And that was coming from enterprise, not general funds. So I really think you need to look at this very closely. And everybody expected that that financial modeling would be brought forward before any further consideration of hiring of contractors for this project. So I appreciate the consideration and certainly the time to speak at the end of this process. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, with that, I'm gonna close public comment on this item. Um, the city manager wanted to make some comments and then I have some comments before we move into action and deliberation. So, um, city manager. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just, I just wanted to clarify the, the funding. There's been some comments and questions around the funding and the potential impact to the general fund. So I just wanted to clarify that, that the funding for this project is not from the general fund. Uh, as you all know, we're facing a deficit in our general fund uh, in large part due to the impact of the pandemic. However, in this particular case, the funding for this project would not come from the general fund. Um, and we do, the funding for the library portion in particular is from a bond measure, and we do have an obligation to uh, use those funds for the purposes that the public voted to, to, you know, to do that project. Uh, and so um, I just want to be clear about that, that this will be a mix of housing, uh, library, and, and parking funds, not general, not general funds. Um, and we do have an obligation to, uh, as we are doing, for example, with the remodeling of the Grant Forty branch uh, and the Garfield branch, to, and as well as the county and the other jurisdictions with respect to uh, moving forward with uh, the, the project, the library projects. And I'd be happy to answer any questions around that, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. So just... Um, I just want to express uh, some concern that I had. I'm still supportive of this project. Um, I think that, you know, as a subcommittee, we unanimously uh, agreed on the new library versus the remodel. Um, we agreed that affordable housing is really important. And although there's some, um, you know, uh, disagreement over whether or not we need parking, I think that with all the housing that's going into downtown, including in this project and the need for parking for residents or for patrons of the library, that parking is a component that's important in this project, um, whether that's for bikes or for uh, green vehicles. I think that, um, you know, we need to consider all the, the the factors going into this and, you know, our city staff is great, but, you know, when it comes to a project of this magnitude, we do need um, a group of consultants who are really going to be able to dive into all these pieces. The one say, thing that I will say is that given that this is the most, probably one of the most controversial items that um, the council is considering and that's been before our community for the past few years, the one thing that I was really concerned with was when uh, receiving the, um, the agenda report and then comparing it to the direction that we were given. You know, the, I was, I felt like there wasn't enough information provided. Uh, we 
were, we received the, the contract last night, and you know, if the public hadn't been aware of how to get a hold of that contract and proposal, you know, they, I can see why many members of the public feel like they weren't aware of what was in the contract and what the group would be doing. Um, and so, um, and in addition to that, you know, staff was able to provide us with some broad-based financial information, some sources of funding, and some of those sources depend on where we're at in the project. Um, and so I think that, you know, it would be in our best interest because I didn't have a chance to look at the proposal because I didn't receive it until last night. And I think many council members have shared that as well. And so I think that, you know, in, you know, in the interest of transparency, I think that we should um, not move forward with making a motion today on whether or not to accept the contract and provide, you know, in the report and to the public, you know, where this contract is, um, some information on the, for the the funding components and costs, which it sounds like we can get some, we can have some general information, you know, with the understanding that we're going to know that these will change once the uh, contractors or the the contractors come on board and are able to give us some uh, exact costs. So I um, crafted what I think might be of the appropriate, an appropriate motion that I'd feel comfortable with, and I'm just going to share it. Um, there is a motion that was made earlier, but I'm wondering if, uh, for the purposes of consideration, that this the council member might feel comfortable moving this forward, which is to continue the item and direct that it return to council no later than the second council meeting in October with the desire for it to return at the first regular meeting and direct staff to provide in the report general broad-based financial information on costs and available funding for both affordable housing and the parking components of this project, a copy of the proposed contract, information on potential developers of the affordable housing component of the project, and links to relevant information on the library project. And I think it's just worth acknowledging that, you know, um, there are certain sources that are available, but part of the reason why we're contracting out with this group is so that we can, um, you know, they can help us with better understanding and also help us with the design and trying to maximize, you know, um, or try to minimize the cost to the greatest extent possible. So I just want to put that there for my colleagues to consider. And um, I'll start with, and so, um, I know Councilmember Golder had made a motion that was seconded by Vice Mayor Myers, and so I'll respect that. Um, I will ask that moving forward, as we've been doing most of the year, that waiting until after pub that we wait till after public comment, because again, some members of the public did express that we did not listen to them before, you know, making uh, motions, and I think it's really critical that we wait until we hear from the public before we make motions moving forward. So. I'll honor those, the motion that was made in the second to that motion, and I'll um, now go down the list to acknowledge my other colleagues, starting with Council Member Brown. Uh, so, yeah, I, thank you. I, I don't uh, want to preempt uh, uh, Council Member Golder's um, desire to make a motion here, but I will just say that I am much more comfortable uh, moving in the direction, the Mayor Cummings, that you've uh, set out here, um, I'll um, and and so respect I'll, out of respect for the the attempt to make that motion. I'm not going to preempt just because I'm being called on first here, but I, I do want to say that this is something that I um, I could definitely support. Um, you know, I don't disagree with my colleagues' points about the urgency, um, the timelines, and you know the expertise. Uh, needed here or the value of bringing on an owner rep. Um, I mean, I think that that is standard procedure, and so I'm not objecting to that, um, particularly for a project of this magnitude and complexity. I appreciate the staff's Herculean efforts to um, get this, keep this project moving along uh, in a challenging times uh, all around, um, but we just don't have. Any Information uh, to give us a general sense of the financing. We um, we don't have a scope of work to approve, and even the comments from some of the um, uh, public uh, public commenters suggested that um, there's a, there's not an understanding of what this um, this contract is for. I heard somebody say we need to do this now because we need an advocate for this project, and then we hear no, this this is this um, is going to be uh, you know a 
this is going to be used to kind of get us the financial information we need. And so it's, it's and without having even looked at um, the, the application from this group, um, who I, I'm sure are quite qualified, you know, I just don't feel comfortable spending this kind of money right now. Um, and I am, am not saying this out of any um, lack of understanding of what the funding sources are. I want to be very clear about that. Um, but let's talk about, you know, if we really want to go there, let's talk about debt financing. Let's talk about, you know, kind of what's not, <laughs> you know, what's not uh, included here in, in the decision we're making and what we're getting ourselves into as we make this decision. So, um, you know, I, I just, I guess I'll just leave it there and, and say that I'm, I'm not going to support the motion um, that is uh, that is coming, but I, I would support uh, something like this. And thank you, Mayor Cummings, for presenting it to us. Council Member Watkins. I don't have my I don't have my hand raised at this time. Oh. Okay, uh, Council Member Byers. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I think early on. Uh, right out of the chute, when we opened this agenda item, I spoke with my frustration that I just wouldn't be able to vote on it because I had not seen the contract. And I think all the speakers, many of the speakers who spoke to us and letters we got, you know, business people, they, I'm sure they know better. Nobody would approve a $240,000 contract without seeing the contract. So this will give us the time to do the right thing. I'm reminded later on our agenda, we're going to talk about the grand jury report and uh, criticize the city for not being uh, trustworthy and transparent and be being more transparent. And this is such a good example that we take a couple weeks to be right out in the open and transparent. So uh, your motion certainly speaks to what I've been kind of yakking about and uh, we'll want to support that. Thank you. I just had a quick question too for staff because I just kind of flicked through the proposal. And it looks like it's some, it's, it, it looks like more of background on a lot of the team members and not the contract itself. Do we have a contract or when would we kind of anticipate being, you know, having a contract that we could review or the community could review? Hi, Mayor. Um, so that is the, as requested, the response to the RFP by the consultant, and it's largely part of the selection process. It's a tool for us to vet the qualifications for the consultant, and it's responsive to the request for proposals, which included the scope of work. So the scope of work has been, has been posted on the city's website under the project page for two months. Um, we can bring a contract, as we clarified at the beginning of this meeting, we're in the final stages of negotiating some of the details of that contract. Um, we, yes, we can bring that forward. We were asking, particularly because of the tight timeline that, that council gave us of three months, of bringing that forward today to be responsive to the original council direction on the owner's rep. Um, but we can bring that back with the contract attached um, for, for your consideration. Okay. Thank you. Cause I, was, I just wanted to clarify that with the community because I think that having input and review of what that, what in that contract, contract includes um, is really important. I know we had a proposal for $200,000 recently from Slow Streets, and one of the concerns I had with that is not knowing what that money will be spent on. And I think this is another example of really having the council be able to look at, you know, what, what are we spending our money on with this contract? And so I think that that, that sounds appropriate to me. So thank okay. you. That sounds good. And just to clarify again, if they want to see that right now, they can go to the project site and look at the RFP. It has the full scope of work of what this contract is all about. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Golder, then Council Member Byers. I would just like to start with apologizing to anybody from the public that felt um, that I was being disrespectful by saying I was prepared to make a motion before listening to public comment. I did read all the emails that came in on both sides of the issue. And um, if Bonnie could pop my motion up there, and I think, uh, Mayor, that, you know, I'm on the same page as you where, um, you know, I want that information. And so what I put in there was the staff's language and then just added a sentence that, um, that you can see, um, 
where is it? Where is it down here? So basically um, adding a sentence at the end with the first order of business to return to the council with updated estimates and more detailed process outline to engage with the affordable housing developers at the earliest convenience. And so, um, and you know, I thought I heard, maybe Bonnie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that it's not, you're just not writing a check for $240,000, it was, a two-year contract, so it'd be 120 each year, and you could stop at any point if it was not um, working out at, with, what, 10 days notice? Is that what you said? That's correct. So anyway, so that's why I felt comfortable doing this. It's not like you're writing a $240,000 check at this point. You're writing a check to have them bring back this information that the city staff, um, it might be hard for, for them to prepare for us, given their you know, they're already stretched thin department. So anyway. Okay, Council Member Byers. Oh, just a quick question uh, to Bonnie. We, I know our agenda item says motion to award the contract. So, you know, that's what I was speaking to all the time. I'm not prepared to award the contract. So um, I know the mayor's motion is to continue for a couple of weeks, but were you planning on coming back with the contract? Maybe I'm. Um, maybe you just spoke to that. Yeah, I I, I did just speak to that. Um, however, um, with the specific wording of the contract before, with of the language before you, I'm a little confused of which motion you're considering. So I'm not quite sure what I'm responding to. But um, I think the process is we were specifically at this date before you because we were directed by council to move forward selecting an owner's rep. Right. And um, that is what we are doing today. Um, we are bringing you that information um, and all the information we have today. We didn't have a final contract. We're still working through some of those um, final uh, points with the consultant. Um, but the scope is included an overview, both in the presentation today and on our city website and in the RFP, which has been posted for the last two months. So. You know, all the information of what that scope is has been widely available. And I would add that we have been responsive to emails that we've received over, you know, throughout the summer leading up to this process. Any individual who emailed us on the status, we have provided to them. If they requested what was in the scope, we provided the scope to them. So, I, you know, I, I just want to be sensitive to that we agree in transparency as well. Um, if we had a contract available today by the deadline that you gave us the three months, we would have that today. But short of that, we also recognize the urgency and the financing constraints and timing constraints of our Measure S funding and this project moving forward and felt strongly that we had that council direction to select a, for your approval a consultant, um, which is Griffin Structures. Their costing for this project is very competitive and well in line with um, you know, firms that do owner representation, you know, across the board. Um, you know, that once the contract is, is finalized, executed, you know, that is always available to the public um, and anyone who wants to look at it. So we will have that information available um, and you will see that. And I would just add that this language that was included in the recommended motion is sort of standard language that we use. Um, you know, if you're looking at other contracts, we we ask for, you know, direction to give the city manager, um, you know, permission to execute an agreement sort of on behalf of the city. Um, and I, I'm sure Martine can speak to that, but this is sort of our, our standard language. Uh, yes, yes, that's, uh, that is that is standard. And largely a contract uh, incorporates within the scope, the, the scope of services. So many times a contract is just the scope attached to the agreement and the agreement includes the various provisions uh, related to sort of legal requirements and, and other um, sort of contract management uh, provisions. Um, uh, and then also there are some, in this particular case, as Bonnie noted, there's some additional um, uh, negotiated items that are come into play as a result of uh, reviewing the agreement and having the conversation with the uh, uh, selected vendor to clarify, you know, questions and items that, that come up. But, you know, normally if we, if we can in a timely fashion have the agreement, we would have it for you. Uh, but uh, in many cases, that's not possible because of the time frame. And so this is a standard practice that, that, we, that we do. Thank you. Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Myers, and Councilmember Golder. 
I just want to respond to the follow-up, and I appreciate that, um, Bonnie and Amanda. And I, you know, I sense the frustration, and I, I understand the frustration about, you know, kind of how to move through this cart and horse, uh, cart before the horse challenge, um, and that the there is ostensibly a scope of work available in that RFQ, and um, you know, so I guess. Uh, maybe I wasn't clear in the comments that I made, but um, I guess what I really mean is that we we have a we have a scope of work or a scope of duties in that RFQ, um, but it doesn't really speak to some of the questions that um, have been raised around financial kind of feasibility stuff. So um, you know I have the bullets, I've read those, and you know I see, what I see is a lot. Uh, you know I don't want to read them all, but um, but. You know, what I see is like overseeing, you know, selecting and overseeing a design build team, overseeing the budget, um, kind of making sure that prevailing wage rules are met and, you know, organizing the outreach and community input. But I don't really see financial analysis in there. And so I guess that's part of why I, I feel like it's not clear. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that and um, and also acknowledge that, you know, I understand that um, time is of the essence here, but I do think that for, um, you know, transparency, given given what um, uh, Mayor Cummings said about the, the controversy around this, it just feels like um, having a little bit more um, space to, to consider that and a little more information would be really helpful. So, thanks. Um, Vice Mayor Myers and Councilmember Golder. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I was uh, kind of referring back to the RFP, and um, again, I guess maybe just from the the perspective of, um, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I think we're sort of talking around, but I think um, you know one of the things that comes out of this is really um, having the owners rep. You know, manage the group of consultants. Um, uh, I, I mean, manage and help select, the, for example, the affordable housing developer, and that that group will then help us with getting some of these financials. So I think we're we seem to be a little bit in a circular conversation. Um, I uh, again, I'm just going to express. Um, that um, we were provided really compelling numbers during the subcommittee about how delays are affecting the inflation uh, components to this project, and um, maybe maybe there's a compromise that could be um, could be sought such that we could bring the maybe bring this back in two weeks rather than a month. Um, I'm curious, Bonnie, if we would have the contract ready to be. Um, Looked at if, if if we brought it back in two weeks, if that if that would be available. I actually am going to defer to Amanda on that. <laughs> I've been emailing back and forth with the city attorney today. We're so you know we're we're very close to having that. You know, like I said, we were like within hours of the council meeting having that ready. So we're in process. So it would be if with with our next agenda uh, coming up on the. Um, uh, let's see, it would be October, I think it's October 8th. We should have that complete, we should have the complete set of information to be able to move forward on the um, approving the contract, it sounds like. We would have the, right, the contract, which is just our, the city standard language, and then, you know, the scope that we've discussed would be included in there. So the negotiations that are happening right now are around sort of that standard language, and we go back and forth with consultants and vendors to sort of, you know, find that middle ground. So, um, yes, it would be sort of packaged, but all the information that you've received today packaged in there. So it looks like that would be the 13th of October rather than uh, waiting all the way to the 27th since October has five weeks in it. So, um, so another month, you know, way, way over a month. So we're, we're losing another month and a half. So um, possibly if, if one of my colleagues would consider that, I think, I think it would be appropriate. Thank you. Can I speak to that um, just because I, I made a, a, I provided a recommendation and I'll just say that one of the first things was to continue it and direct it return no later than the second meeting in March with the desire for it to return at the first regular meeting. You know, and maybe this, the city manager could speak to this, but even if I know that we have a couple special meetings coming up and if uh, with the budget, if we're able to take action on items at that meeting, 
I wouldn't be opposed to coming forward at that meeting as well if it needed to come sooner. I just think that you know it needs to be I need to have an opportunity for the public to um, have an opportunity to review it. And then I also didn't want to put constraints on staff to bring something forward or force them to bring something on a specific date. And then if they weren't ready to not have the flexibility to move it um, further. And so that's why I was trying to include that language around having it um, come back, the desire to have it come back at the first meet, regular meeting or any you know special meeting, but no later than that second meeting in October. So I just wanted to say that and because I, I do understand that time is of the essence and I would my preference would be to have it come back sooner but I just want to make sure that staff has the flexibility so thank you for that clarification I'm sorry I didn't I missed that in your motion if I could just clear, ask a clarifying question as well I think if it's just the contract we're bringing back and with Amanda's comments then absolutely we can make you know, certainly before the second, probably definitely even the first. But if we're adding this additional information and context that you're asking for on the broad, that, that's going to require a staff report and some additional analysis. I mean, we can put industry standard information here, but I, I have the feeling that that's not what you were wanting from staff. You were wanting um, information that's general and broad in nature, but that is specific to this project. And that is, an, is, in fact, the information that we are hoping to develop once we have the owner's rep on board. So I just want to be clear, particularly because I, there's so much uh, conversation around this out there, and I think expectations on this really critically important project that we're really clear on what is that level of information that you want back in addition to the contract. The contract we can absolutely bring back. You know, this additional information is going to take some time. and you know, depending on the level of information that you would like contained in that. And if so, that could have pretty serious implications on time and budget for the project. I think that part of it, from my perspective, was really trying to understand, one, you know, I think that members of the public are interested in understanding, you know, where what are the sources of the funding for affordable housing. In addition to that, you know, I think, it, you know, if it's broad information, you know, what are some of the bills that are out there that we qualify for because that's been, you know, we've we've received that orally like numerous times on, you know, what potential funding sources are out there. And I think that, you know, we just we received a lot of information in this presentation that I think would have been really great for the public and for council members to have received in a report prior to this because what came before us was, you know, we want to move forward with this to so approve this contract for two hundred and forty thousand dollars. And I think what many members of the public and some of us were wanting to see is also, you know, there's been all this these different sources of funding that have been spoken about and I think that you know having that in a report in, in some way, um, what we have applied for, um, what we will qualify for if we you know um, move this project forward. I think some of those components are just helpful for the for, for the public to understand because what I've been getting in terms of feedback is that many people they don't there's been so much. Um, controversy over this that they don't think that the affordable housing is going to move forward. Um, they think that, you know, we're going to continue moving forward with the library garage or that we're going to put market rate housing in there and they're not going to see. And so I think that trying to provide the public with some information on even, even if it's, you know, that part of the reason why we're moving forward with this group is that they will have the expertise to help us, you know, um, find affordable housing opportunities and get us to work towards that. I think that that it's just really helpful um, to provide some confidence, you know, in the community that where we're going is actually going to get us the affordable housing. And I do know that there's controversy over the parking. I think that's another issue for us to, to discuss. Um, but um, I know that people also think that the parking funds what's going to pay for the library and the housing. And so I think that it's just, we just need to be really clear with the community on, um, you know, and. In particular, what we, I think, had asked for at the last meeting was uh, information on the affordable housing. I don't think parking and funding around parking was a part of that conversation. So, um, but that, that's kind of where I'm coming from with this. And also, you know, not having the, even the RFP included with the staff report and, you know, expecting the public to try to navigate the sites for all the information that we're discussing. So that's kind of where I'm coming from with all this. And, you know, I'm trying to be flexible as well with, you know, how we can bring this back. So I think it'd be great to hear, you know, what kind of information we could receive on funding for affordable housing and what level of detail we could, you know, expect at the next meeting. And, you know, mind you, this was, we, we made these um, 
we took this motion in action back in June. So I think that, you know, the community was really hoping to receive, after three months, some information on, you know, what are sources of funding and all these other components. If I may, it, it sounds like what the, uh, you're, you're asking is with, to outline uh, the process uh, or the steps that are involved in, for example, the housing component of the project, uh, and then in the possible uh, ways to uh, uh, implement it, and then give you an update on where we're at with, with that. For example, with respect to housing, here's the way it would work in the project. Here's the, and, and uh, Bonnie uh, outlined some of that today, and then here's where we're at. Uh, and then with respect to the library portion, you know, here are the various steps that would be uh, taken uh, and where we're at with respect to that. Uh, now there'll be, I think there's this uh, confusion around then some of the detail and some of the specifics, which of course won't be available um, uh, right away because we have to hire a consultant to help us develop those specifics. But I think we can give you sort of a broad outline in, in, insofar as to, to implement a project like this uh, with respect to housing, here are the different pieces that have to happen, the potential sources of funding and how it might come together and that's how and sort of where we're at as a city working on this project, similarly with the other components of the project. Does that sound? Uh, it's um, about right, and I think that, um, yeah, so, you know, what are the steps to of getting housing? What are the sources of funding, you know, from this, at the city, state? Um, and then, you know, I think just really walking people through, like, what are we what are we asking for here, and how, how is this group going to really help us? Well, I think we can do that. I think, I think the only thing that, of course, we have to just uh, be clear about is that, uh, obviously, uh, there, we can lay out things, but they, they may and will likely change as the project moves forward and as new things develop or as, uh, you know, so I think that's the only sort of, I think, thing that we should just be cognizant of is that, uh, uh, that it won't necessarily, uh, it's, it's, what we can put, give you is, is, is process and, and what it may, what, the way it may develop, but it may change. And so just acknowledging that, that it, that it likely will uh, for a variety of different reasons as, they, as the project you know, moves forward and, and develops. And I don't know if Bonnie, you want to add more to that. But. I think we've provided in the past, this project has gone on so long um, and just sort of this, this very early stage, there has been time, there have been times over the last two years where we have provided to council um, and I think we had obviously, the, the council mix has changed a little bit, but we have provided some information on affordable housing and how you would finance um, that component of the project in, in this project and what those sources would be. We obviously can't commit to the sources until we get the grant funding or have the project at a certain point where we're eligible to apply for grant funding. With that said, um, we do have guaranteed funding coming in to, um, from the PLHA that I mentioned earlier, $1.5 million. That's guaranteed. That's coming in. Um, we typically, I mean, old industry standard, which is completely blown out of the water right now, is that at a minimum you put in 100000 of public funding um, for an affordable housing, really a 100% affordable housing finance project. So can we leverage that? Yes, we absolutely can, and that's typically what we do to close that gap. So, you know, we feel, I understand that we need to get more information out there so the public understands this, but uh, closing the gap on affordable housing projects is something that we do on a regular basis. We have funding for that. Um, the fact that we are contributing the land and then we're contributing dollars on top of that. We have a $3 million balance right now in our affordable housing trust fund. We have two projects, this one and the Metro we're committing it to. If that 10 million grant comes forward that we're in that final uh, round for on the Metro, that frees up all the funding for this project. So, uh, you know, we can show that in a table format so people can see that so, and, and, you know, answer questions around that. That's no problem. I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I just am concerned about our overall capacity and just bringing things forward to you in a timely manner. And, you know, I, I take responsibility for not providing that information now. I, I was interpreting the council direction that um, you wanted finite, you know, specific, and, you know, we go deep on this. So information on affordable housing, funding and sources that we are actually pulling together for this specific project. 
you know, we can highlight the available funding now and what we have in the works and a little more detail than I presented the overview on the screen share earlier. That's not a problem. I, I you know, and then we'll continue as we do have additional resources internally and actually get the project specifics on this project to come back to you because that is something that we are fully committed to is affordable housing in this project. Thanks, and I think, and, and I just mentioned that because I, 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 I thank you for that too, for that information because I think even at that level, you know, given that the direction that was previously given, if, if that information had been, been included, I think that more members of the public would have asked, would, would have felt like, okay, we're seeing that even if we can't demonstrate all of it, and I think there are going to be times when we're going to have to say, you know, we were hoping to have this information at this time, but we were unable to bring it forward, and we can bring it forward at a, at a you know, a next step. But for many people who are seeing the city moving forward with spending a quarter of a million dollars without having some of this information around, especially this affordable housing component, I think that a lot of people have been, you know, expressing to me that um, they didn't, they were concerned with the affordable housing piece moving forward. And I totally, again, understand the need for these contractors. So if we can bring, you know, a contract um, for review, um, the, um, the RFP that they had submitted with the city along with the report, you know, kind of addressing these concerns around, uh, you know, how can we find affordable housing? Where's the staff gonna help us out? I think that it'd be helpful, so. I'll, I'll leave my comments. I know some of my other colleagues have had their hands up, so I'll uh, move to Council Member Golder, Watkins, and then Catherine Byers. I was just wanting to say that I think we all, you know, want the public to feel included and feel like um, the city is being transparent and us included. And so I think, you know, I want to find a way that we can compromise here and work together to create a motion that we can all feel comfortable with. So that's, you know, what I wanted to say. So. We can take mine away, or we could somehow merge them. I, what you know, I'm fine with whatever. Right now, and coming back in two weeks is something that will make you feel more comfortable, um, uh, Mayor and um, Council Member uh, Watkins, or uh, who was it, Brown, that said, you know, you want more time and uh, Meyer or buyers to look at the contract. Then I'm perfectly fine. Like if you want to wait two weeks, if that will make you feel more comfortable. Uh, Council Member Watkins and then Council Member Byers. Yeah, no, thank you, Mayor, and um, thank you to the staff and, and to the Council for the thoughtful conversation around this, as well as the community uh, members' interests. And I just, I just really want to acknowledge um, that one, uh, this is a big uh, discussion item for our community, and there are many elements to it, and we. Um, have explored many of those and have discussed many of them today. And that this item also was um, sort of part of the course of how we move uh, based on prior direction as a consent item in terms of um, approval of a contract. And how do we sort of reconcile that with the, the bigger kind of topic and interest around sort of the vision and future for downtown, the interconnection for the uh, vision for more affordable housing. And so I'm just wondering how we can um, move forward at this point, given the input we've received, and I think to uh, Councilmember Golder's comments, uh, if there's the potential to say, you know, perhaps we can um, uh, separate the, the, the direction to have the actual contracts come before us at the earliest, uh, at earliest possible time, and then other additional kind of information, either to that or to be brought forward uh, after that, but not trying to um, wait for that information to approve the contract to continue to move forward. So I, I think that it can be a, a bit of a both and. I know that this is a unique project given the real time constraints, and I um, am concerned that if we continue to delay, that it's um, even going to be more difficult. And so I'm interested in trying to balance how we can have, um, you know, the most transparent and uh, opportunity for an engaged and informed uh, process with also taking action. And it's, a, and it's a unique balance that we all take often as council members. So perhaps the uh, potential direction could include, you know, to return with the contract and any additional information as it relates to the areas of interest, but to, um, to move forward with having the contract for approval at the earliest meeting possible, and that could include a special meeting if that works. 
and then uh, when the other information is further fleshed out, that at which time we can um, explore that. And I think that would be potentially maybe a bit of a merge between the two. But I think the other motion at this time. So those are just sort of my comments and thoughts. Councilmember Byers. Well, I guess I started out earlier today not wanting, well, I didn't have the contract, so I wanted to see it before. It's seeing a contract in this huge project is not about my being more comfortable. As a council member, I have extreme serious duty to understand where we're spending our money. And that was what was minus. And top of that, what was minus is we didn't get financials that we asked for last June. So it is about the money. It is about my feeling, if you want to say so, good about the money, comfortable about the money. But we have to understand, I think some of our speakers talked to us about the fiscal duty. Um, so I still like the mayor's motion in asking staff, and Bonnie, I totally understand you're not wanting to put out some numbers that become public, and then everyone will hold you to those numbers, which may, may be off hundreds of thousands of dollars. But I think we're looking for, uh, I think as the mayor said, I uh, just reread his motion, broad-based financials. A good one would be for Jim Burns to provide a 30-year bond, how much is that going to cost our taxpayers? I think it's in the millions. I'm not sure because I can't figure that out. But it's not – I know we just did a whole thing on, on the affordable housing, which was – we even got a little bit more information. And Martina opens up our city manager that's about process. We have a lot of processes going on. We, see, we deal with them all the time. We weren't ta I wasn't talking about process when I voted for that motion. I was talking, just give us, just give us some numbers. I think um, Councilmember Brown is on the back of a paper napkin. Just some ballpark, what the parking is going to be, what the library, how are we going to do the gap in the library? Interesting, the library, the architects were given a budget and had to work within that budget. The rest of this stuff doesn't have a budget to work within. So I, you know, there, all three projects are different, completely different from each other. But I still want support the motion that staff come back um, uh, with the whatever broad base financials on these three projects. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Councilmember Golder. Okay, so to make everybody uh, work together here, I'm going to suggest that I withdraw my motion, and I'm going to use the language from the mayor's motion, and I think that everybody can hopefully get behind that and support it. So can we do that? Sure. Sure. I guess I'll just share my screen then, Bonnie. I have it up already. Oh. Yeah. I just kind of changed the wording on the first one to make it okay. a little more clear. <coughs> Will you second me, Mayor? Uh, I'm reading it right now. <laughs> I, I, I'm having a chance to read it. Yes, I'll second you on that. So, a motion made by Councilmember Golder, seconded by Mayor Cummings. Oh, and I still put his hand up. Uh, is there any other comments, or is council, are council members comfortable with this? Mm -hmm. And I think that through our conversation, I think there's a general sense for staff of where we're kind of yeah. going with you know, the information that we want back in terms of financial. So if that's appropriate. Um, I, Mayor, would it be appropriate to just ask, ask a quick question in terms of staff direction? I, just for... Okay. Sure. Um, so I, 
I just want to honor that we heard a lot of questions from the public about the direction provided on June 23rd, which included detailed financial information about each component, a work program and timeline, and then general schematics. So I just want to make sure that the expectation has been set and there's clarity around all of that being delayed as a result of this direction being sort of coming into place. So we will be delaying all of that and moving forward with the direction that we're receiving from you today. Correct. And I think that it should be expressed that in, in order to get that detailed information, which I think is the purpose of getting these contractors, is that that's what these, um, you know, these contractors are being hired to accomplish. Great. So that's, that's my understanding is that that's the whole reason why we're going down this yeah, road. I agree. Agree. Mayor, I'd like to ask a clarification on the other part of the motion in the second bullet where you say information on potential developers. Um, I, I think it would be premature for us to share information on affordable housing developers at this point. We can share um, affordable housing developers that um, would be interested in this project generally, but the um, request for qualifications was under a set circumstances. And I think for this particular project with the complexity, we will probably go out again. So mm -hmm. I don't want to mislead the public that those that responded to our RFQ is the, is the only short list of affordable housing developers that we may move forward on this project. And I, I, so I, I just want to be clear on what that direction is. Um, mm -hmm. You know, given, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that we have both land and public funding to put in this project, we are going to have a very robust response of how we go forward. You know, going with the list of those that uh, that is a qualified candidate pool for affordable housing projects, not necessarily mixed-use affordable housing projects, but affordable housing projects is something that we consider which direction we want to go in. Yeah, and for clarification, I think that, you know, the intention there was that we had had, um, during our subcommittee meetings, it had been expressed that there was interest by affordable housing developers. And so I think that including information on, you know, we have heard from, you know, whoever the seven were or, you know, certain develop, affordable housing developers who expressed interest just so the community understands that, you know, we're not just saying that there's the potential for affordable housing, but there's actually affordable housing developers who are interested in this project. And it's not, we're not limiting ourselves to selecting from that group, but I think that the public wants to understand, well, who's actually, of these affordable housing developers, who's actually expressed interest in this? And so does that make sense? It does. So just to, to be really clear, these are affordable housing developers that have responded to a general RFQ for affordable housing development, not specific to this project. So, but okay. we can provide that. As long as it's that, I think the way that you stated that is, is fine and, you know, listening to those folks are. And then that we're going to be reaching out to other developers to see who might be interested in this specific project. So, um, Council Member Brown, I see your hand up. Thank you. Yeah, I don't want to belabor this, but I say, and I and I appreciate uh, Council Member Golder your willingness to move in this direction. Uh, in, but I do want to be really clear um, about kind of my own concerns, but kind of reflecting the concerns that I'm hearing from the community. That another piece here is the is a question about where the additional money is going to come from for the library piece. We have, um, so so yeah, there are three different projects as, count, as Council Member Byers um, has suggested, and we need the information about each of those, but there still seems to be this um, this gap in between four and six million dollars if, if you look at what Group 4 gave us, and that was what we were basing our decision to move forward on. Um, for the to get the library that we are telling the public they're going to get out of this, so I, I I just feel like that should be addressed a little bit more in this um, next step as well. Um, I think that would certainly um, speak to that would that would get uh, some response to a big concern that I'm hearing, and I I think others are as well. Can I ask a question to staff? I'm just wondering if that is something that, um, you know, the group that's going to be working on this, is that something that they would have the bandwidth to continue looking into? Because I think that 
what we're responding to is, I think today what we're responding to is the, the, the question around the contract and how that's being developed and, um, you know, the questions that have come up around affordable housing. And I think that that's still something, you know, that needs to be addressed, but it's something that can be, you know, ongoing in this process. But I guess just for you know, the sake of moving things forward, is that something that this group is going to address or how is that going to be addressed in the future? So I know that we, with the group for specifically related to the library and the downtown library subcommittee, we did talk about, you know, options that could come before the council for council decisions, decisions like air rights, that was the potential gap funding. Um, I know Susan has spoken about, you know, some of the funds that have been able to be raised by the friends of the library, those kind of funding sources. I think beyond that, you know, um, I, I'd have to defer to Bonnie about whether there are other information we have now that we could bring before you and to Susan. Yeah, I mean, I think Amanda's exactly right. I mean, we have, we can bring a little more information on air rights. Um, we can bring to you the related uh, and potential grants that we could apply for. We could provide a little more information and a status update of where we are with the grants we have applied for. Um, I've already shared the balance of the affordable housing trust funds, depending on when we hear back. We don't control, unfortunately, I wish we did, uh, the timeline for when the state lets us know um, when we, whether or not we're awarded grants. You know, they, you know, it doesn't necessarily, even though they may say, give us a window, it doesn't necessarily follow in that window. So we track on it, but we can't with certainty guarantee when we'll have that additional information. Um, but we can certainly provide more information on the types of funding um, that we could go for. You know, another uh, type of funding that we could um, pursue for this project would be new market tax credits and or um, opportunity zone financing. Both of those um, have some owner implications as far as um, tax credits and tying up the project for a certain number of years related to equity returns. Um, but those are all viable options. And, and again, uh, back to your original question is, yes, we would be fleshing these out and sort of going through pros and cons with the owner's rep, with that specific expertise that they have on affordable housing, as well as our internal expertise here in our housing division and our consultants that we use regularly, and having sort of this brain trust of going through what is the best mechanism to move forward and then coming back and presenting that to you. So um, that's always been our intent. Um, and, you know, I, I, we will still do that. Um, but as far as coming back to you with sort of a general broad, over, broad, broad brush overview, we can do that as well. I think our, our, our you know, major concern is just capacity and, you know, how much we put into this is another staff report where we want to provide the best information we have available. And that does take time. You know, but we're sensitive to time. So that, that's my only hesitation is, oh, okay, now the deadline for that, is, you know, is a couple weeks before the count, the, it actually goes to print. So our actual window for preparing information is actually really small. Mm -hmm. So that, that's just largely, it's just a capacity issue for us. Right. Okay, thanks. And I think that, it's, I think that it, maybe it's worth just kind of keeping that in mind that we're really that's still a concern in the community, and, and I think that working with this group would probably, you know, help to get us to that, answering those questions. But you know, for the sake of trying to get the contract and the other information that we have for us that's been requested, I think that it makes the most sense to kind of move in the direction that's before us in the motion, and then um, maybe even it can be a conversation after the first meeting with the group um, who, after we award the contract, when we meet with them, kind of bring these questions up as well. Uh, Council Member Brown, were you done with your questions and comments? Yep, thanks. Thank you. Council Member Byers. Real quick, uh, by I think you mentioned uh, the parking fund subsidizing the library, but now when you ran through all the possible, you know, way to get a couple million dollars, you didn't mention it. Is that a viable one? I, I, I don't believe so. I, I don't think that's something that I, um, you that I communicated. I think I was talking about air rights um, from potential market market rate that could be. Well, I always thought the parking fund was going to be used to subsidize some of this. I don't know where I heard that, but not true. Okay. Turn it over to the city manager. Uh, yes, I just want to comment really quickly. Uh, 
that uh, just a, a reminder to, to the city council that all of these questions that the, that the community is asking, they will be answered. Um, they have to be answered, obviously, because you will have to approve every single uh, step of the way, every single agreement in terms of the financing approach, financing plan. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, not all the answers are going to be uh, obtained within a few weeks or a few months. Uh, some will come at, at a later time. Um, so we will do our best, obviously, to give you all the information that we have and the potential for how it might uh, uh, work out. But we won't have all of the answers and the specificity uh, to the level that I think the community, uh, some of the community uh, is, is seeking in very quickly or right away. It, it's going to take, uh, in some cases, a little bit of time. But you will have it, uh, and you will get it, and you'll be able to make decisions uh, as you go along, uh, because uh, at any at any point in time, uh, there may be uh, something that changes or uh, something that comes out that uh, requires the project to be looked at differently uh, or that uh, changes the circumstances. But that'll all be before you. Um, but again, in, in general, you know, from the analysis that's been done uh, and the work of the subcommittee, uh, the, the the feeling is that the project is viable and it can move forward. Um, but again, we'll, we're going to go through the process, get all the information, and make decisions along the way. Great. Thank you. Uh, I think those are all the questions. Uh, Councilmember Byers, were you, were you done with your comments and questions? Yes. Okay. Um, if there's no further questions or comments, um, the motion that's before us is to continue the item to the first meeting of October, beginning of October. Um, direct the staff to provide broad-based financial information on costs and available funding for both affordable housing and parking components of the project, a copy of the proposed contract, information on potential developers of, I'd say, affordable housing in general, uh, rather than the affordable housing component, I think we um, had discussed that. And links to relevant information on the library project. And so if there's no further comments, um, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll call vote on this item. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, Mayor Cummings. I just I, I don't mean to drag this out, but um, or did we now we're decided that we're not gonna ask for any additional information aside from just what we heard just now that it could be our rights or it could be um, raising money through the Friends of the Library for the to fill that gap. Is that? I mean, I thought that my understanding was that that's what we're gonna work out in the future conversations with the group that we hire. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews is disqualified. Um, Brown? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Um, I know we're pretty far behind on uh, our agenda, but let's hopefully see if we can make it through um, in pretty reasonable time. So the next item on our agenda is the uh, response to the Santa Cruz County Civil Grand Jury Reports, item number 18. Uh, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, is if this is a meeting, if this is an item you would like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instruction on your screen. And I will mention again that the um, toll-free numbers that are on the screen are not functioning at this time, so you'll need to call the non-toll-free numbers on your phone. Once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone uh, when it's time for public comment. Uh, your hand will be raised, and when you're called on, you'll be given two minutes to speak. Uh, and I'll turn it over to our principal man management analyst, Ralph Demacourt, for the presentation. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor, and um, good afternoon, uh, City Council. Uh, Ralph America, and I have a quick um, you know, review as to how we got here, and then we'll leave it up to Council to um, discuss the uh, draft uh, responses. Um, so as you know, um, this year the grand jury issued 10 reports, and um, Council was, was requested to respond to seven of the reports. At the uh, September 8, 2020 uh, Council meeting, um, Council provided direction for staff to work with the mayor to submit responses for five of the seven reports and to return to council with draft responses to the remaining two, um, a failure to communicate, restoring trust and accountability in Santa Cruz city government. And the second, um, homelessness, big problem, little progress. It's time to think outside the box um, for further discussion. So um, in, in addition to that direction, um, over the past several weeks, um, as with the other uh, draft responses, um, staff has been gathering feedback from um, department heads, um, other agencies, and council members um, on the recommendations and findings that are before you today. And um, based on the feedback and information um, collected, um, responses for uh, the reports, including the remaining two reports, um, have been drafted for your review and consideration. So um, at this point, I do want to thank all the department heads and um, staff, and especially you, the council members, for taking the time to provide that feedback, especially with um, all these things going on that are, are requiring your attention as well. So um, with um, all that information and feedback we received, um, we have the draft responses um, before you today, and um, staff is um, requesting, you know, um, additional feedback, if any, and for direction to continue to work with the mayor um, to submit uh, the responses for the following two reports, which are a failure to communicate, restoring trust and accountability in Santa Cruz City, and um, homelessness, big problem, little progress, it's time to think outside the box. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks for that presentation. I'm not sure if... Uh... I didn't catch whether it was, it was mentioned, but um, if there's a specific, I think that in terms of uh, questions or comments, if there's a specific item that, or a specific response that council members have um, an issue with, rather than going through all of them, um, if we could discuss those, if council members have them, then that'll give us an opportunity to weigh in on the, the relevant items rather than go through every single uh, response. So with that, are there any council members who have questions or comments on the uh, responses to the report? Okay, council member Byers. Sorry, uh, the one on uh, a failure to communicate, page 217, okay. that was the only one um, where we put in will not be implemented, and it gives a reason why it won't be implemented, uh, and it ends with currently not feasible. But I think a note should, we don't need this specific request, but someone should take a note. They, they suggest we have a task force on transparency. I'm not sure we did, uh, the city needs a task force, but I don't think that whole idea should be dropped. I just think it should be looked at and at some point talked about. Uh, and today was a good example. So I would just hope, um, Ralph, maybe you could make a note and maybe work with the mayor or something to see it. I understand why it's not feasible and I'm not supporting a task force, but somehow another discussion on transparency. Okay, okay. Council Member um, Byer, could you repeat which uh, finding and recommendation that was again? Well, it's finding an R3, a failure to communicate, R3. I see, okay. Where we end up, why we, why it will not be implemented and why, and because of all that's going on in the life of the city now, absolutely, it is not feasible at this point. I'm just suggesting the topic of transparency. I'm not suggesting we use the task force, but there should be a discussion on the city transparency and people weigh in and where they've had experience, where it wasn't, and how to correct it. I just think that's the only one of all of them I felt just needs a little bit more. Not feasible wasn't a good enough excuse. Okay. Okay, that's all. That's my, Mayor, that's all I have. And, and just to be clear on, on this one too, this, this also related to um, the agenda setting process in particular. 
So it's just transparency around that, just to be clear. Okay, sure. And um, I have included those notes, Councilmember Byers, um, and just to um, highlight too, or just to clarify that um, the fact that they're recommending this be done by December 31st, 2020 okay. was the part that was not feasible, but um, yeah, I did include that note of um, this discussion should be explored. Yeah, thank you, I noticed that too, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Byers and then Councilmember Matthews, or sorry, Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, thank you. I don't have any uh, specific changes, although I thank you, Councilmember Byers, for, for raising that issue. And I think the, the um, Ralph, with the, what you shared about this being specific to um, agenda, the transparency around agenda setting speaks to the, the bigger challenge that I've had uh, in how we respond to these reports. Um, and I, we talked about this, and so I, I'm just saying it to kind of put it on the record here that it's a, it's a frustration that I have that um, what we have in terms of the, what we were given to kind of agree with findings and then uh, respond to recommendations, um, does, it, it narrows uh, the, um, the scope of how to address some of the problems that are identified and I think very clearly laid out in these reports about the question, questions around transparency and sort of the, the dysfunction that uh, and miscommunications that have uh, produced some of these big challenges that we've been dealing with. So while we can't really do anything about that in this format that we've been given, I, I do just want to say that, um, you know, for the general public, for folks reading these, these reports, it's, you know, I mean, these are issues that we should be taking very, very seriously. And um, and I don't know how to get at that in the in the kind of constrained realm of possibility that we have here. Um, but I do appreciate all the work that you put into trying to final product. Thank you, Councilmember Matthews, and then Councilmember Watkins. Uh, overall, I thought the responses were entirely fine on. Item R12, which appears on page 225 in the hard copy, um, has to do with um, creating strategies for curbing public disruption. And um, in the response, it talks about uh, there are protocols. Um, mayor, city clerk, and city managers will continue to explore creative strategies for curbing public disruption. And I really think it should be not just creative, but clear and consistent procedures for curbing. I mean, creativity is part of it, but clear and consistent procedures for curbing public disruption. That, in my mind, is one of the main factors in discouraging broad public engagement. It sounds appropriate. Um, Council Member Watkins. I, I with my colleagues in, in the most recent editions, and back to the uh, transparency for the agenda setting, I know that the time frame wasn't necessarily feasible. And um, at the time I, when I was mayor and, and, uh, and Mayor Cummings was the vice mayor, we actually spent a lot of time to have a protocol in place to identify you know, really uh, transparently when items will be coming, if the urgency, and so I think we have a foundation already in place, although that was uh, reversed at a certain point, that foundation is in place for us to look forward, uh, move, it, move forward potentially when we have more capacity and time to have a more um, just clear understanding on how how we do the agenda setting process uh, and, and how we as council members know and also how the community knows um, as well. So. I don't know if that needs to be added, but I just for, for context for those who might not be aware, that that is uh, something that we had spent some time on that I think could help uh, assist moving in, uh, moving us in this direction towards more transparency and clarity. 
Okay, and I understand sort of um, how the recommendations and findings are touching on issues that you guys want to discuss further at future meetings. So I am taking notes on the side that aren't being highlighted um, specifically on the response notes here um, on some of these issues that you guys are bringing up. Okay. Seeing no further questions or comments from council, I'm going to um, open up to public comment. So if you are a member of the public and you're watching uh, our city council meeting, now's the time to call in if you'd like to comment on item number 13, which is the city council responses to Santa Cruz County civil grand jury reports. Uh, once you've called in, you'll wanna press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when you've been called on, you will be asked to unmute your phone and you'll be given two minutes to speak. Carol Paul Hamas, and I wanted to comment about the grand jury report on homelessness, uh, especially for people who are listening to the meeting. The grand jury produced a really thoughtful, comprehensive look at the challenges and issues our city faces in trying to remediate homelessness. I really think it should be required reading for every city resident who is concerned about homelessness, which is most of us. I posted the link many times on social media sites. I thought it was so good. Some highlights for me included the breakdown of data about the reasons for homelessness in Santa Cruz, as well as the explanation that the funding and responsibility for solutions around homelessness, including mental health, drug and alcohol treatment, et cetera, are all the purview of the county. Proponents for defunding the police in the quest for more social services really need to read this report to understand that the funding for the services they want comes from the county and not from the city. I especially like the idea of repurposing the juvenile hall facility and even the round tree facility for housing, substance abuse, and mental health treatment since these are underutilized facilities currently and we've already paid for them. I also think we need to understand where the $10 million a year goes in terms of what it does fund and how fragmented the services can be and the need for accountability for both money and services. I want to encourage everybody listening to please read the grand jury report and not just let it gather dust. 19 of our fellow citizens spent a year on this report and the findings and observations are spot on. These reports can really be valuable in providing future direction and solutions with fresh perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any other members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item? If so, please press star nine on your phone after you've dialed in, and you'll be given two minutes to speak on this item. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, there are two grand jury reports you're considering here. One is the issue uh, which concerns, you know, city council process and disruptions. Um, I think one thing that the report ignores that the council should pay some attention to, though I don't expect this council to pay a lot of attention to it, is if you have a stacked agenda, which excludes a lot of public input or even council member input, as happened last year, around issues around homelessness, police misconduct, uh, developer activity and so forth, then you're going to get, uh, shall we say, an, uh, an anxious and even disruptive at times audience. This is a part of democracy if it's being thwarted. That's a real problem that the council has so far refused to address and smooths over with uh, talks about decorum. The issue around homelessness, uh, which seems like a lot of, oh, we're all taking care of this, we're taking care of that, uh, leave it to the county, as the last speaker just said. Yeah, the county gets the money, but a lot of the money here is being spent on harassing homeless people by police and park rangers who have much better things to do with their time. And the city has much better things to do than to fund these 
his activities. This is something, again, missing from the grand jury report, but relevant in its absence. So I would encourage the public to consider, because I don't think the council is going to pay much attention to this, these two issues. And what you need is a real change where the public has real input, for example, into the city council agenda, and at least the council does. So it's not simply a secret meeting between the mayor and the city manager. So uh, I want to thank the community for listening and encourage them to vote for candidates or act demonstrations that lead somewhere to these kinds of changes. Thanks. Thank you. If any other member of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will be given two minutes to speak. No other members of the public who would like to talk to us or speak on this item. I'm going to bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Um, and I just want to thank the staff and the members of the grand jury who took the time to actually write the report, conduct interviews, provide these recommendations. I think these reports are really important for us, um, you know, in terms of being informed about, you know, from an independent group on. Um, actions that are occurring within our community and providing recommendations on how we can move forward in a more productive way. So uh, with that, uh, if there's no further comments, I think um, our staff has received feedback and on changes that need to be made. And so um, if there's no further discussion, I'd like to see if we can have a motion on these items and move forward. Vice Mayor Myers. I'll move the recommendation um, to, um, sorry, finalize the finalize the grand jury reports with the suggested um, uh, information provided by staff and for the the uh, final two reports onto the grand jury. Yep. Motion made by Vice Mayor Myers. Councilmember Watkins. I'll second the motion. Okay. So a motion made by Vice Mayor Myers, seconded by Council Member Watkins. If there's no further discussion. We'll go ahead and ask the clerk to call the roll call vote. Council Member Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay, thank you, Mayor and uh, Council Members, and um, I'll be sure to share the uh, new draft with you uh, for approval, Mayor, before um, submitting them to uh, the grand jury. And again, I want to thank the department heads and city staff who helped put these drafts together to make sure you guys had a good foundation of draft responses to consider and review. So thank you all. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you. Okay. Um, before we move on, I was thinking that maybe uh, we could take just a quick 10 minute break um, and reconvene at four o'clock, I think, so that we're not just sitting for hours on end. But um, so we'll reconvene at four so people have a chance to kind of move around a bit. And um, yeah. yeah, next item is item number 19. Thank you. On, so that we know you're here with um, our next item. Mayor, I've queued up. If you want me to take it down, I can. Oh, um, yeah, why don't you take it down for now? Take it down, okay. Thanks.
it says the host has disabled my video. I'll turn it back on for you. I'll ask to start. There you go. Okay. Should have you now. Got it. Thanks. Okay. Maybe right we should have left it. I think now we're just waiting on council members Matthews and Watkins. No, I'm here, but you got to turn my video on. Oh, okay. Um, all right, you should be good to go. Good. All right, so welcome back, everyone. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the 914 and 916 Seabright Avenue project. Um, assessors, parcel number 011-123-66, tentative map, design permit, and residential demolition authorization permit to demolish three residential units and construct a nine-unit townhouse, townhouse development on a 21,237-square-foot parcel located in the RL Zone District. And I'll turn it over to our principal planner, Sam Hashert and also Director of Planning, uh, Lee Butler, will be here today as well. Thank you, Mayor Cummings. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, all right, here we are. Um, can everyone see that okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited that this project is before you today. This has been in process for a very long time, and so I'm happy that it's finally being heard. Um, this is a project for a nine-unit townhouse development located on the property at 914 and 916 Seabright Avenue. This application was heard by the Planning Commission on May 16th, 2019, and it was continued for a redesign to reduce the building massing, to stay within the density range, and um, if possible, to provide a um, better variety of housing unit types within the development. Um, the Planning Commission also noted at that time that the consideration of a density bonus should not be precluded in their redesign. So the project was redesigned and it was heard again by the Planning Commission on June 4th, 2020, um, at which point the Planning Commission voted 7-0 to recommend that the City Council acknowledge the environmental determination and approve the project. The Planning Commission then voted separately on two amendments to the motion. The first is to eliminate the requirement for public access through the project site, and that passed by two. The second was to require the applicant to provide two separate affordable units during the time that the units are offered for rent, and that amendment passed 4-3. So I'll go through those in detail in this presentation. Uh, the project previously proposed and continues to propose the demolition of three existing residences and the construction of a nine-unit townhouse development. Um, the project requires approval of a residential demolition authorization permit, a tentative map, and, and a design permit. And this also includes a request for a density bonus waiver to the open space requirements. The project site is located on Seabright Avenue. Um, it has access from both Seabright Avenue and from the cul-de-sac at the terminus of Sumner. The parcel is not included within the boundaries of the Seabright area plan, and the parcel is within the exclusion area A of the coastal zone and is eligible for a coastal permit exclusion. And Sam? Yes. You have the um, presenter view showing. Uh, so your notes are showing, um, if you can, there we go. That's better, thank you. Uh, Did it stop sharing now? It stopped sharing, yeah. <laughs> okay, let me try this one more time. Um, let's see. Okay. 
I was liking the notes. I was reading along. <laughs> okay. Can you guys all see that screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And then when I change it to presenter view, can you see the notes too? No. no. Okay. So maybe that fixed it. Um, okay, I think it was here. The um, parcel is zoned as RL, which is a multifamily residential low density district. It's surrounded by other RL zone properties. Um, and then this is a close-up of the project site. Um, you can see the two access points, Seabright Avenue and Sumner. You can also see some various fruit trees on the property, but there are no trees that would qualify as heritage trees. Um, and then you can also see some other multi-residential developments in the Sumner area. Um, the existing structures on the site include a duplex with two one-bedroom units that face Seabright. And then in between, uh, further interior to those are a detached garage. And then at the interior of the lot is a two-bedroom cottage that's proposed to be demolished. Um, this is a front view of the house. It's um, um, the house that's on the property now. And then you can see the two-story structure to the north. Um, and then that's a better view of the two-story structure to the north of the property. And then this is the project site from Sumner. Um, it's actually beyond that fence there with the notice of public hearings posted. And then an interior view of the site, so you can see this primarily flat and then some of the fruit trees that are on the property. Um, so this is the um, original site layout that was taken to the Planning Commission in 2019 at the top, and then the revised site design that was taken to the Planning Commission in June of this year, and that's before you today. So the applicant originally proposed nine attached three-story, three-bedroom townhouse units, um, but the applicant went to great lengths to address the concerns of the building massing that were brought up by the Planning Commission and the community. So they are now proposing nine two-story units, so a full six feet shorter than the original project. And they are proposing a full break between the buildings. And they're doing that by reducing two of the units from three bedrooms to two bedrooms. And they've revised the parking to a tandem arrangement. Um, and within that break, they're proposing a parking space and the planting of a 24-inch box size crepe myrtle. Uh, the project site sits between those two public right-of-ways, and um, a typical project with two such frontages would provide an, an open driveway access through between Seabright and Sumner. Um, but in this case, in response to some neighborhood concerns about traffic on Sumner, the department requested that the applicant restrict access to and from Sumner with a locked vehicular gate. Um, so unfortunately, this gate also restricts bike and pedestrian access through the property that would typically occur on any other such development. So the planning department is proposing to require a public access gate on Sumner that would provide pedestrian and bike access through the project site during the daylight hours. The Planning Commission's decision to eliminate this gate was based largely on community opposition in the Sumner neighborhood. They felt that the access would bring persons with criminal intent into the neighborhood, that it would direct bikers to Seabright, which they felt was unsafe for biking, and that the connection was just not necessary because they used other routes to get through to Seabright and the coast. Um, so I want to clarify um, what exactly this pathway is. It's, um, it's the 20-foot wide driveway through the development, um, so it isn't a narrow um, sort of overgrown alleyway that could conceal persons with criminal intent. It um, would not place pedestrians any closer to the residences than you would be on a public sidewalk. Um, the intent of the connection is not to concentrate or funnel bikers or pedestrians to Seabright Avenue. It's simply to provide an alternative route to those who may be walking or biking. 
the um, pathway also meets several goals and policies in the general plan, and those are all listed in your staff report. And so for all those reasons, the planning department is still recommending that the city council approve the pedestrian gate with public access through the site as a part of the project. Additional changes were made to the exterior design to allow for greater compatibility with existing surrounding with the existing surrounding neighborhood, um, and to also allow for a reduction in massing. The wide, long dormers that were originally proposed are um, now replaced with front-facing gables, and it's a little hard to see, but the exterior materials are differentiated between the units to provide for individuality rather than the appearance of one long building. The south elevation has also been updated in a similar way. It provides uh, individual balconies to break up the um, building massing. Um, and this is the building section that shows the building in relation to the north and south adjacent structures along Seabright. That black dashed line identifies the originally proposed three-story structure and um, the red outline identifies the proposed building. Um, it's a more compatible size with the two adjacent units and with other two and three-story residences in the surrounding area. Um, and then again, this image shows the difference in height proposed with the dash red line at uh, 30 feet in height that was originally proposed to the midline of the roof, the midpoint of the roof line, and now is measured to the peak. Um, the applicant prepared a shadow study based on the revised height of the development, and this shadow study looks at shading impacts during the morning and afternoon of the summer and winter solstices. Um, it shows that there's gonna be limited shading impacts on the properties to the north during the winter in the afternoons. Um, and so there's, there's always some shading expected on urban infill properties, but this one limits shading to the greatest extent possible in that it's located uh, at the south property line and provides a full 20-foot setback from the north property line. Um, and then also the reduction in height um, provides some, um, uh, reduces the shading impact. This is a view of the project from Seabright Avenue. So the front unit there was intentionally oriented to the street to preserve the streetscape along Seabright. And then this is a view of the development from the end of Sumner, um, and you can see the vehicular gate there as well. Um, so I'm gonna go through the affordable housing requirements, and there are a few layers here, so um, feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Um, let's see, this project was deemed complete prior to the adoption of the most current inclusionary ordinance. So, the inclusionary requirement is 15% of the total in the housing development, um, and they're required to be restricted at 80% of the area median income. So for this project, it's equal to 1.35 units. So they're required to um, provide one unit, and they can pay an in lieu fee for the fractional amount. Um, the project is also requesting a density bonus, and so in order to be eligible for a density bonus, the project has to provide a deeper level of affordability. They have to provide at least 10% of the total units as affordable to lower income households at 60% AMI. The um, inclusionary unit is proposed to be provided at 60% AMI, and so this meets that requirement. One unit can be provided at the deeper level of affordability and count as the inclusionary and the density bonus unit. So in addition to inclusionary and density bonus, um, there's replacement housing. And um, replacement housing requires, um, the project includes the demolition of three residential units. And the demolition of three or more units occupied by low to moderate income households triggers the requirement for replacement housing. Um, and so when this project went to the Planning Commission, the applicant assumed that all three units were occupied by low to moderate income households, 
which triggers the replacement housing requirement. So replacement housing requires that 50% of the bedrooms demolished are replaced in the development as restricted affordable units. The code also allows for bedrooms in an inclusionary unit to count as the replacement housing. So staff agreed that the replacement affordable three bedroom unit, that the restricted affordable three bedroom unit at 60% AMI would also count as the affordable housing, the replacement housing. At the June 4th uh, meeting, planning commission meeting this year, the planning commission instead felt that there was enough discretion in the code to require two affordable units. Um, that'd be one unit for the inclusionary housing with the density bonus and a second unit for the replacement housing. So uh, since that meeting, the property owner worked with the housing authority to verify the income level of the tenants in one of the three residential units. So um, remember one, the, for replacement housing, the project needs to include demolition of three or more units occupied by low to moderate income households. So the housing authority certified that the tenant does not qualify as low to moderate income. And so the project includes only two such units that are proposed for development. So uh, replacement housing is no longer required. Um, and the project includes one three bedroom unit that's restricted at 60% AMI to meet the inclusionary housing and density bonus requirements. As I mentioned, the project is eligible for a density bonus given, given the deeper level of affordability that's being provided. They're actually eligible for a 20% increase in market rate units, but the applicant is not requesting any additional units over the nine requested. Um, they are requesting a density bonus waiver to the open space requirements. And the requested waiver would allow for three things. Um, it would allow for the rear yard areas to be counted as open space, even though they have dimensions of less than 10 feet. It would allow for the um, for approximately 20% reduction in the total open space required. And it would allow for units four and nine to provide 70 square feet of private open space where 100 square feet per unit is required. So in order to be eligible for a density bonus waiver, the applicant needs to show that the full application um, of the open space requirements would physically preclude the construction of the project with the density bonus unit. The project is proposed complies with all other requirements imposed by the city and other city departments, including building and fire. Um, and the applicant has reduced the sizes of the units to meet the design preferences of the planning commission in the community. Um, and the development provides unit amenities such as appropriately sized living rooms. A full implementation of the open space requirements would um, further reduce the living area within the unit um, or would require the development to encroach north into the minimum driveway width as required by the fire department. Um, and this is all without the development even providing the two additional units that they're entitled to with the density bonus. So we obtained the advice of the city attorney because there is very little direction regarding the definition of physically precludes. Um, the city attorney determined that features such as ceiling height are considered to be amenities that are not intended to be stripped of a development that would provide affordable housing um, under the density bonus ordinance. Um, so the minimal living area proposed within the units is consistent with this interpretation of amenity space. Therefore, the applicant has shown that the full application of the open space requirements physically precludes the construction of the project and a waiver of the open space requirements is recommended. Um, and so we found that uh, the project meets all of the city's objectives with the exception of the waiver to open space. And under the housing uh, the Housing Accountability Act, that waiver is not considered to constitute any kind of an inconsistency or nonconformity. The project maximizes infill density on a parcel that's zoned for multifamily residential uses and provides a public pedestrian connection between neighborhoods, which is consistent with several general plan policies and objectives. 
The project has been redesigned to meet the preferences of the Planning Commission and the neighbors. Therefore, it is recommended that the City Council acknowledge the environmental determination and approve the project as proposed based on the findings in the attached resolution and the conditions of approval in Exhibit A. Um, and so that concludes my presentation. I'm gonna try to stop my share here. Um, and um, we have the applicant here that's available for questions as well as uh, Jessica Miller from the Housing Department. So we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, are there any council members who have questions about um, this project at this point in time? Council Member Matthews. Yeah, um, I wasn't able to access the plans in a large enough scale to see what was going on. So um, could you show the um, gate, uh, both the vehicular gate and the pedestrian gate as they're currently planned? And the neighbors have asked for the pedestrian access to not be installed. And if that were the case, what would be the modification on that gate area? Um, do you want to see the um, rendering with the gate or a, um, you know, yeah. And um, just while we're on that topic, um, we talked yesterday, um, the uh, plan is that the utility, the, the basically the garbage truck access goes through on this. It goes in one street and out the other. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? It either comes in Sumner, out on Seabright, or vice versa. That's correct. Determined. Yeah. So that's as much of a look as we get. I see, and, and the pedestrian part would be over there by the fire hydrant. Is that the, yeah. the plan? Yeah, yes. So can you see my cursor on here? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So this is the vehicular gate here in the middle of the driveway, obviously, and then this would be the location of the pedestrian gate on the side. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that question. And then reading through the comments, I saw that uh, the neighbor to the north, which is uh, 527, was asking if there could be an eight foot fence. And um, for just greater privacy, that's the fence that goes along the driveway between the driveway and their house. And, and it's the house on Sumner, but that's not an unusual request sometimes for, it's not a front-facing fence. So I just wonder if you had thoughts on that, if that had come up, if they could do six feet plus lattice or, you know, variations on that theme. Um, the, the code currently allows for a six-foot fence in the interior side yard and then would require a conditional fence permit for a taller uh -huh. fence. Um, but I believe that the the project includes um, a significant amount of landscaping in that area as well to buffer the view of the fence. Um, but we could um, uh, potentially allow for an eight foot fence just as a part of this approval. Yeah, yeah. I, again, I wasn't able to see what the landscaping looked like, but it seemed to me a, an unreasonable, um, a not unreasonable request. Yeah. Are there any um, other council members who have questions at this moment, moment in time? I had some questions just around the policies. Um, and so maybe this could be either for the city attorney or the planning director. In the proposal, my understanding was that, you know, there are a number of different requirements, um, the inclusionary requirements, um, if you have tenants of a certain income having to provide units for that requirement. And then I can't remember the third, it was on the screen. It seemed like all three of those, rather than trying to accommodate more affordable units, they all could just be lumped into one unit. And I feel like that kind of undermines the intention of a lot of these different policies to increase affordable housing within our community. And so I'm just wondering, one, if you could speak to that, and then I'll have a, a follow-up question as well. But I'm wondering if you could speak to you know, how it is that um, when we're trying to increase affordable housing that we're just 
you know, when we find that there's different categories and different reasons why we need to provide more affordable housing, we just kind of lump them all together uh, rather than providing um, affordable housing for each of those different scenario and criteria. Sure, I guess I'll, I'll take a stab at it first, and uh, Tony or Sam or Eric Marlat, our assistant director, is on the line as well if anyone else wants to chime in. So, um, with respect to density bonus and inclusionary, the case law is very clear. Latinos Unidos versus the County of Napa has concluded that we have to overlap the um, density bonus and inclusionary units. And so, um, we have um, provided some summary information um, in the past related to that, and projects that have come before the council have, um, have had to deal with that uh, specific issue. And so um, the case law actually requires that we do that. With respect to the replacement housing, the code says um, the applicant may, um, for rental units, the applicant may overlap the inclusionary and the um, uh, replacement housing. It does not offer that opportunity for the uh, for for sale housing, but it was, uh, I believe, intentionally put in um, to encourage rental housing, um, and that's why it's specified for rentals but not for ownership. Um, when we went to the Planning Commission, so, so we looked at that and we said, oh, the code says you may do that. And so when we looked at that, that was our original recommendation is to allow for that overlap as the code specifies. When we got to the Planning Commission, the Planning Commission said, well, it may allow that. And, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to. And so we said that's a, a fair uh, comment. And when we brought it back to the council, the original time, we said, council, the code says you may overlap these two, and um, as such, um, it will be your determination as to whether or not you want to allow that during the rental period. If they ever sold the units, they would have to provide that replacement housing as well as the inclusionary housing. And um, then what the applicant did in this case, as Sam explained, was they established that they uh, do not have to provide the replacement housing based on the um, income levels of those tenants. And so that code no longer applies um, uh, to this particular project. Um, and then uh, that inclusionary versus uh, density bonus, what that does because with that overlap, it basically makes the, the more stringent rule apply. So in this case, it's one unit either way, and our inclusionary says 60% area median, excuse me, our inclusionary says it would be 80% area median income. Their density bonus says it would be 60% of the area median income. And so that unit has to be provided at the more restrictive level, which is the 60% um, of area median income. So I know that's a lot, and, and it's understandably uh, confusing, um, but hopefully that helps a little bit. And I don't know if, if Tony or Sam or others want to chime in, or if you have additional questions, Mayor Cummings. I, I think uh, Lee's explanation covered it. The, um, in the Latinos Unidos case, uh, which is uh, involving the county of Napa, um, the Court of Appeal, basically said, regardless of whether the affordable units were provided voluntarily or were required by an inclusionary uh, ordinance, if the affordable units qualified the project for the density bonus, then the developer was entitled to the bonus and could not be required to provide both um, units pursuant to the inclusionary units, uh, to the inclusionary units on top of the density bonus. So it's a straightforward interpretation of the case law interpreting the density bonus law. Okay. Um, I have a, a follow-up question with regards to the replacement housing. Um, is like, do you know off the top of your head what policy or law that is that because I'm just thinking about, you know, within our community, you know, there are units, for example, where uh, the individuals with the, the, those units are affordable and the individuals within those units are paying um, affordable rents. And there are some units where, you know, the landlords have made those units, you know, have kept those units 
at affordable rates, and the people who live in them might make more than you know what is considered uh, low income or moderate income. And so I guess my question is, you know, kind of what dictates that determination of replacement? Because it sounds like in this circumstance, um, it's the income of the tenants, but if the units themselves are affordable, regardless of the income of the tenants, that means that we're losing affordable units in our community. And so I'm just kind of curious and would like to know more about, you know, what creates that standard of, um, you know, replacement housing in terms of affordability. So that's in 24.08.1360 of the code, and um, I will share my screen here so that you can see that. Um, it says replacement housing must be provided by the applicant when demolition or conversion of use of three or more dwelling units or single room occupancy units occupied by households of low or moderate income occurs. So that's where um, it's talking about the households of lower moderate income. So we're, we're just taking that straight from our current municipal code requirements. I think that it might be worth looking at that because, um, or revisiting that code, because I, I do think that we have buildings in our community where that are where there's low income housing and the people who live in those buildings may not necessarily be low income, but the housing's affordable. And if that's the basis for replacement of affordable housing, I think that it can, given that, you know, we have some old houses in this community that are gonna be coming down and being replaced, that actually um, might, you know, lead to a loss of affordable housing in the community. So, I'll just- sure. Yeah, that's, that's a valid point to consider moving forward with um, future changes. Um, Council Member Watkins and Council Member Matthews. Yeah, thank you. I just had, I wanted to get a little bit more clarification about the, um, the, the bike pedestrian pathway. And then, um, so in terms of the proposal, it, the, there was sort of a suggestion that um, it would encourage more people to go uh, to Seabright to access kind of that bike pathway, but my understanding is Sumner is actually a, a cul-de-sac at the end on that on that, um, on that that portion of the street. I had a friend that lived there. So then, so then I don't know if they would automatically go to Seabright, like, you know what I mean, like for common sense purposes to kind of go up to the next street and then, then they would just go down. So um, I don't know what the thought was around, around that in terms of the kind of, is there a safer way or um, is it how, you know, what is the, you know, what is the planning department's sort of thoughts on that? Um, our thoughts on it are that, um, you know, we have general plan policies that require connections between neighborhoods. And so um, while some people might prefer to, you know, go up Sumner and um, go over to Seabright in that way or to head the other direction and, and visit the coast that way, that, that there are others in the community who might find that connection helpful. And um, while, you know, the current the current residents might not be um, might not find that useful. That is, pro it's it's helpful in the long term to provide that connection now while we have a development project where we can require it to be provided, um, and it would also just provide an alternative route for someone to get through at the end of Sumner rather than going all the way around. And that, and then in terms of the safety um, components. Was the modification presented as a 10 p.m. to 6 p.m. always, or was that an additional kind of suggestion after there was concern around sort of the safety issues of locking um, a lock? That's a good question. I, I believe that we recommended that, um, and, um, and that was intended to address safety concerns along that pathway. Okay, okay. Thank you. Councilmember Matthews. I wanted to follow up on your question because that was a question I had yesterday when I talked to staff. And um, part of the confusion, I think, is that the um, project began under one set of rules and ended up 
with both other rules and change circumstances. And the replacement housing is required if, Lee, correct me if I remember this rightly, all three of the, or if there are, well, I think if all three were occupied by low to moderate income residents, but the property owner had worked in Section 8 to get an income verification, and one of the tenants did not meet that standard. So therefore, the units were occupied, only two of the three were occupied by low moderate income residents, and therefore, the replacement housing did not kick in. That's exactly correct, yes. Yeah. So the code allows... Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to clarify that the code allows for a property owner to um, basically assume that all of the units are low to moderate income households if they don't want to go through the process of verification through the housing authority um, or if there's some reason why they can't. And so that's what the applicant did at the beginning of this project and then, um, and then they ended up going through that process uh, before the city council meeting. So. Um, that's one of the reasons why this item was continued so many times. Okay. Are there any further questions from council members at this time? Okay. Hearing none, um, I'm going to open it up to public comment. So if there are any members of the public who would like to comment on item number 19, which is 914-916 Seabright Project. Now is the time to call in. Once you've called in, you will need to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you will be given up to two minutes to speak to us on this item. Hello, uh, this is John Swift. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, so I'm the applicant's representative, and I assume that I have a few moments to uh, make a short presentation. Uh, yes, that's correct. And uh, I'll just check with the uh, city attorney. The applicant's representative gets, is it five minutes? Uh, the applicant's representative normally gets additional time. I, I'm, I'm not, uh, <clears throat> I'm not recalling specifically how much, but it's generally five or 10 minute presentation, right? Okay, um, why don't we go ahead and, and have five minutes uh, for the presentation? Yeah, my presentation should be very short. I wanna thank you all for uh, hearing this item today. It's been a long road, but uh, we're glad to be here. And I really wanna thank uh, Samantha for her very thorough presentation. I think she covered many of the facts that I was gonna have to spend some time doing, so I'm not gonna do it in the interest of time. Uh, as she mentioned, the design has substantially changed from when it first went to the Planning Commission. And I think it's a vast improvement myself. I, I'm very pleased with the changes that were made. I think it's dropped from a 30, 30 foot tall building to a 24 foot tall building and basically is a two story structure with a, quite a bit of uh, architectural design changes that are very attractive and distinguish it quite substantially from what it was before. Uh, it is an ideal uh, and very appropriate infill development. There are many examples. I'm sure all of you are familiar with Seabright and the large, pretty large number of units and and uh, developments, both three and two story that have been developed in the recent past along Seabright, it being an arterial street. Uh, it's consistent with the city policies of infill development with a bus line on the street and that kind of thing. Close proximity to school, uh, commercial centers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so to cut it short, um, we do fully accept the staff uh, recommendation, of course, and hope that you do as well. Uh, it's not only the staff, of course, the Planning Commission made a 7-0 vote of approval uh, with the, uh, and they actually did not uh, uh, vote to approve the pedestrian easement. Uh, so we accept uh, the uh, recommendation except for that condition. And that condition specifically uh, carries out in three specific conditions in your staff report. They are condition 13, 22 in the second bullet point of uh, condition number 22, and then condition number 30. So, uh, you know, the, the, through the discussion of both the council and the staff, some of the issues that were raised, I, I hope that you have all seen the letter that 
um, Walter Woodlow submitted. Uh, it was signed by, I think, 10 other, roughly 10 other neighbors that live along Sumner Avenue. And some other letters came in, some for the project, some against the project. But I think, if I'm not mistaken, all of those letters were opposed to the establishment of this pedestrian easement. Go to that. Uh, we're going to try to put up on the screen one of the exhibits that uh, Mr. Ludlow um, submitted. And so he pointed out that the city has a plan to improve the intersection at Wyndham and Seabright Avenue. And this is a significant factor. Um, the blue arrow there represents where this connection would be made between the cul-de-sac at the end of Sumner and Seabright. Uh, and so really, if you look at the very end of Sumner, someone walking to that same point where this new pedestrian access with daylight would save about a thousand feet. Right, But when they daylight there, they're entering onto a street without any clear crosswalk or traffic control to get across Seabright. Now that, you know, one can say, well, that's not such a bad deal. But if you have, I lived right off of Seabright for about 20 years, and I can tell you Seabright is a high speed, fast traveled street. And so I think there has, I think the, the staff did look at some uh, injury and accident counts but there have, my experience was that it was not a, exactly a particularly safe street. This, this was acknowledged when the city took on this project on Wyndham and Seabright to design some, some circulation improvements there. So again, we would save about 1,000 feet of walking uh, for only a pretty limited number of people at the end of Sumner. And those people have said they don't need it. They're happy walking to Wyndham. Everyone north of Wyndham or to the east is going to use Wyndham to get to Seabright anyway. So um, the other thing is, is if, if this was a wide enough property to delineate a pedestrian easement with a low fence or bollards or in some way, in my opinion, make it a protected space, that's one thing. I use these all over Live Oak and town as I ride my own bike. but. In this kind of situation, this is a private driveway. It's the, you know, people are going to be backing up and turning in. Kids are playing in that driveway, yet you've got essentially strangers riding bikes, skateboarding, walking. I think uh, Samantha, respectful, you know, in all due respect, made this uh, um, uh, analogy to a public sidewalk. I think that's a very different situation than a private drive in a private community. The feel is different, the sense of privacy, the sense of ownership is different. And I think this is kind of uh, not a good thing for these tenants. It does raise insurance questions and expense. The insurance company we talked to said yes, uh, the HOA insurance is going to go up. So um, I guess that's why uh, I'm hearing a buzzer. So real quickly, I just want to emphasize condition 13, 22, and the second bullet point of 22. Condition 30 would need to be, I think, stricken from the list of conditions. I also want to point out Condition 7, because that is, I think, a holdover from previous uh, projects where gas lines were, you know, the, the use of gas in projects is allowed. Well, since the city, I believe, has adopted an ordinance to only allow electric, I just want to be clear that either that is being provided as an option in the event gas becomes possible or I don't want it to be interpreted down the, down the road that somehow we're in a conflict here with the ordinance. So I, I would suggest that that might need some rewording as well. So I thank you very much for your time. I'll keep it short. And we're certainly here for any questions or elaboration that you may, may want. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna open it up to the public for public comment. Members of the public who would like to comment on this item, Again, now is the time to call in on your phones. Please avoid calling the toll-free numbers and call only the non-toll-free numbers. Once you've called in, you'll need to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you'll be given two minutes to comment on this item. First speaker, you are allowed to speak. Good afternoon. My name is Henry Hooker, and I'm calling in favor of this project, Seabright Avenue, on behalf of Santa Cruz Seniors for Housing. The project is appropriately sized and scaled to the neighborhood, 
and it makes a small but significant contribution to the amount of housing in town. Importantly, it provides one three-bedroom unit at the low-income level. It's not a large project, but it's exactly the kind of project that the city should encourage in existing residential neighborhoods. Kind of modest increase to the density in existing neighborhoods is appropriate to create more workforce housing. Most importantly, it increases cultural and economic integration of the neighborhoods and thus also equity throughout the city. Thank you for considering to move this project forward. Thank you for those comments. The next speaker, you have two minutes. Uh, thank you, Mayor Cummings, Vice Mayor Myers, and members of the Santa Cruz City Council. My name is Walt Watlow, and I reside at 548 Sumner Street on the cul-de-sac section of uh, Sumner Street adjacent to the proposed project. I must admit this is the first time I've had uh, an applicant or another commenter actually use one of my figures from my comments to illustrate their points. Um, I provided written comments with attachments yesterday for the council, and I'll just briefly summarize those here. Uh, I am commenting um, solely on the new proposed uh, public access. I appreciate the applicants and city staff's efforts to reduce the massing of this project from its original design. My comments do not in any way affect the amount of uh, potential new housing provided by this project. Um, I ask the City Council to eliminate the requirement for new pedestrian access for the following three reasons. The first is planning staff indicated that the proposed access would reduce walking, cycling, skateboarding distance to Seabright Beach in the neighborhood commercial uses by about 1,000 feet for the, quote, immediate neighborhood. The immediate neighborhood here consists of about 30 total residents living on the lower half of the Summer Street cul-de-sac. You will find attached to my comments a signed petition from a significant number of these residents indicating that they are opposed to the proposed walkway. Thus, the very residents who supposedly could take advantage of this are actually opposed to it. Thus, the benefits cited in the staff report are largely theoretical and not real. My second point was already illustrated by the diagram, which was just shared with you. Uh, I will note that if you look at that diagram, it begs the question, why would the city require a new access from the south end of Sumner Street, which will force bicycles to cross busy Seabright Avenue mid-block without the benefit of an intersection in order to ride south to the beach or commercial area when the city has already committed to the construction of a vastly improved crossing at Wyndham Street? Thank you. Next caller, you are on the line. Hi, is this me? Yes, good afternoon. Oh, hi, okay, so I, um, I'm Walter's neighbor. I'm at 527 Sumner Street. I, live, I own the property that will border on the development, I think, on the north side. I have several concerns. I'll try to make it quick. Um, I do find this project when you when she showed the the look the bird's eye view. I find this project to to be quite out of character with our neighborhood. It is enormous. I am concerned that it, it the new design is a lot better. I felt like Motel Six was moving in next door. Um, I am concerned about the description of these affordable units and then the third person not being. Uh, someone who qualifies as uh, lower income. I have been in these units, so she may not uh, qualify due to her income, and I realize this is in the code, but I want to say to the mayor that I appreciate your concern about revisiting this, maybe not for this development, but it's, it's humorous living here and having been inside these buildings. They're very old. They're very run down. They're adorable from the outside, but... Um, the, you know, it just happens to be that she makes more money than that. So I appreciated your comment. Um, and the, the shade study, uh, it showed an ADU that we have built on our property, and it had a white square on the roof of our, of our ADU, which 
in, in winter. I don't know why it was white. We have that roof covered with solar panels. That looks like through the winter days it will now be covered. This is quite disturbing given how much money we just put into that. This is my own personal problem. I guess the city has no... Um, uh, no reason to be involved in that, but I'm just registering it because we are now quite in debt for this solar. And um, Ms. Hazard basically just said, well, it'd be cloudy in the winter anyway, which was not actually, actually appe uh, appeasing my concerns. Uh, I do also, as other people said, I want to say that this walkway is unnecessary for us. We walk all the time downtown, and it will not help us. We have bad crime on our street as it is. Our cars are broken into on a regular basis. We cannot leave anything unlocked. So adding a walkway here is a terrible idea for those of us who live here. And I understand I'm done. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there's any other members of the public who would like to comment on this item, please press star nine on your phone. Otherwise, we will be closing public comment and moving back to council for action and deliberation. Okay, seeing no further hands raised from the public, I'm gonna close public comment, bring it back to council for any questions or, um, or motions to take action. Council Member Matthews. You're muted also. Yeah, if there are no other questions, I'm prepared to make a motion, just double checking with others. I have, I have a couple questions very yeah. briefly. Um, so I had a question for staff. Um, just with regards to the comment regarding the blocking of solar on um, a neighbor's house, I guess what, if that were to happen where the shadow would be casted on the, prop the adjacent property and impact their ability to um, have solar power, I guess what, what re re remedies are there for that or, you know, just out of curiosity, or actually not out of curiosity because it just came up in the conversation. <laughs> Um, we do look at impact on um, adjacent properties in terms of shading, and we do look at impacts to existing solar panels as well. Um, but there's nowhere in the code that requires somebody to um, not provide any shading on adjacent solar panels. And if that was the case, then um, solar panels on an adjacent property could limit development on the on the other property. So we do look at the impact and we try to reduce them to the greatest extent possible. In this case, um, as I mentioned in the presentation, the property, the development is actually pushed as far back to the mm -hmm. south property line as it can be. Um, and so while we acknowledge that there will be some limited shading in the winter months and the afternoons, um, that's, that appears to be the extent of it based on the shading studies that were submitted. Thank you. I guess my next question then was um, with the um, representative of the developers on number seven, the gas main question that was raised and given our, the changes to our um, building electrification policy, I was just wondering if this is um, in conflict with that and if it should be removed. Um, in reading through that ordinance, it looks like that policy kicks in based on the application date of the application. And so this one would not be subject to that, but we can add the term if applicable at the end of that condition, and then it wouldn't preclude them from going all electric if they chose to do so. Okay. Um, I think that's all the questions I have. Um, Again, I think that to the comment that I made earlier, and I just feel compelled to make it that you know, part of what helps people um, get to a point where they can afford to purchase housing is that they're able to save money um, and live somewhere that's affordable. And so I think that moving forward, you know, revisiting the code to you know allow for the replacement of housing based on the affordability of the units and potentially the, the, the 
income of the people who are living in those units, I think it's critical for us to ensure that we're maintaining affordable housing stock in the city. Um, so with that, uh, we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, and I see Council Councilmember. Oh. Well, I, I I said I was prepared to make it. I didn't make it yet. Oh. I asked for oh. first. <laughs> and um, uh, Sam, if you want to just put up the solar thing, I want to respond to that. I took a look at the solar diagram, and it is shaded uh, somewhat in the winter, but gets total sun in the summer. And I think um, we'll see it in a minute. So oh, there there you get in the in the summer there's there's uh I, I was yeah the diagram there. You know, it's got it's got really total sun in the summer. And uh, uh it has the the whole development is pushed to the south end and then there's the driveway as the buffer. So um I'll just say we have solar on our house, and you know we we draw on our credit a little bit in the winter, but with great summer exposure, you you build up a terrific credit as well. So um, and also some of the people that wrote in didn't want any big project, and I think most of the people understand we have relatively little uh, judgment on this um, project because of the recent state law. I think all the council read the report and understands that. So um, I'll just make a few comments. I think the um, changes in the height, the scale, the breaking up of the building, the architectural style was given, given that there will be a large replacement project here. Those were a big improvement and many of the neighbors expressed appreciation for those changes. Um, I particularly like that the front unit faces onto Seabright as a house and I think that preserves kind of the rhythm of the, of the houses along Seabright. It reads as a street of, in that little area of, of single family houses, even though many of them are duplexes or have ADUs in back or whatever. Um, uh, so I think that um, redesign was uh, successful. Um, so just given those two comments, I will uh, go ahead and move that we, um, uh, the recommendation that we acknowledge the resolution, we adopt a resolution acknowledging the environmental determination, approving the tentative map, design permit, and residential demolition authorization permit to demolish three residential units and construct a nine unit townhouse development based on the findings contained in the attached resolution and conditions of approval with the following exceptions on deletion of the requirement for a pedestrian. Uh, designated pedestrian pathway the length of the property. And that's reflected in three separate conditions. Um, the clarification of item seven regarding the gas main. Does that give you enough direction there, Sam? And um, adding um, an optional eight foot fence along the driveway um, by mutual consent. So that'd be my motion. We have a motion by Council Member Matthews. I see there are a number of hands up. Uh, Council Member Brown, were you gonna second the motion or was your hand raised for a question? No, I, I was gonna second it. Okay. I was gonna. And it announced for that those conditions to be removed should the first uh, the, the motion maker not do that. So I'm happy to second the motion. And if I could just make a couple of comments, I'd like to do that right now. Sure. Uh, so you know, I I just first I want to really appreciate the um, the developer addressing those some of those concerns around building massing and kind of architectural design. You know that it it still means that there will be um, some some significant impacts to the neighborhood, and um, you know, unfortunately, um, SB 330, the Housing Accountability Act, doesn't really give us uh, the latitude to um, reject projects uh, um, 
And in this case, I think that the, the developer has done a good job of, of trying to address those, some of those concerns. And I think the pedestrian access piece is, is particularly important given that um, there is going to be a real impact here. And, um, you know, Councilmember Golden and I, when this first came onto the agenda and, and was uh, polled, we went over and looked at and we walked around to try to figure out um, you know, how, why the pedestrian access was so important. And, you know, we just kind of, I mean, we looked at it, we, you know, sort of, and then it wasn't on the agenda. So, um, but I, I do feel like that the potential community benefit there um, for having that kind of access is really not significant enough to balance with the impact on the on the neighbors. Um, so I I'm, I'm appreciate uh, that, uh, Council Member Matthews, you've, uh, decided to, to um, move in that direction. Um, I, I just want to say on the, the replacement housing, I agree with Mayor uh, Cummings that um, this case has caused me certainly to want to rethink our replacement housing uh, policy, given that um, projects like, like these are going to continue to come to us. And um, given that we talk about the need to approve projects to get us affordable housing. I mean, let's let's not kid ourselves. We're losing affordable housing here, um, or at least um, you know housing that is maybe not deed restricted, but that has been affordable to uh, residents in our community. Uh, you know, I I'm just going to put it out there because I, I don't want to um, you know I, I don't want to be misunderstood in approving this. That you know I continue to disagree with the staff interpretation uh, about the density bonus rules and the intersection with our inclusionary ordinance. And there is really not a body of case law. There is one case. And I, you know, there are multiple reasons that Napa um, is, is different, that that case was different, that or the communities are different. And I think, um, you know, the case law is going to build. And I'm not sure that, um, that the Napa case will be uh, the, the, the final word. Um, and so I guess I think those are my comments. I, I do, um, you know, I do appreciate, uh, you know, the involvement, the kind of the, the motivation um, to kind of um, by the developers to make sure that the, um, the project was um, kind of addressing those community concerns, those neighbor concerns. And so I'll, I'll leave it there with my comments um, to be continued on inclusionary and uh, replacement housing for a future date. Councilmember Byers and then Councilmember Colbert. You're muted. But I am disappointed about the path. Um, I wish we could go neighborhood by neighborhood and find ways to put paths in. I think there's such an increase of people out walking and want to walk, and there's such a better experience walking on a path versus walking on, even though that area doesn't have a lot of traffic on Wyndham and Windsor and those streets. However, walking on a path versus walking on a street with cars zooming by is black and white. And I, I just think we should be looking for more opportunities to have paths. And the thought that you could walk down a path and you wouldn't know to stop when you came to the street, uh, I think our people are a little bit smarter. So um, I will support the motion. I am just disappointed that the path isn't part of it. I think it, it, it was a, a thank to our planning department. I think they looked at the right thing, and I just hope they don't give up on finding other places to install paths. Um, I was going to speak to two things. I want to respond to Councilman Byers, and I'm curious now be to me, it didn't look like a path. Like I was, when you say that, like I'm picturing the one along Bay Street or Miri Lagoon. But what what I saw was just a driveway, and it was just like you could like kind of just walk on the driveway. There wasn't a sidewalk, was there? Even no, 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 no. It was just but no cars. <laughs> no, there is cars. It was a driveway. Yeah, right. So it, it was like on. walking. In the, yeah, so it wasn't really a path, though, right? Right. Am I wrong? No, no. I understood what okay. it was, but it was. Okay. not designated now. Um, and then t I was just going to speak also, I was thinking about what uh, Mayor Cummings and um, Councilman Brown said, and 
in my head, it was. I did. Did I see it anywhere in the report? What the current rent on those one bedroom and I forget if the other one was two bedroom units were currently. No, that was not provided in the report. We just are required to look at the income level of the tenants. So that's I just. Because that, just out of curiosity, when one of the neighbors said um, that she's been inside of them and they're cute from the outside, but dated and worn down, and so then I think like sometimes landlords base the rent on you know if they know that their old appliances or this that and the other, and so they they make the rent lower, so it would make it affordable for people. But then you know every 30 years or whatever you have to do a major I don't even know how many years you do a major overhaul and a renovation, that money has to come back somehow and so I would imagine that that would cause the landlords or the owners or whatever that they would need to raise the rent to recoup some of their costs for the improvements to the property and so when studying this further I just want to you know realize like that you know sometimes things are priced lower just because they're not in the best shape and not brand new and that it would cost money to make things nicer if that makes sense. Councilmember Matthews. I'll make just a couple more comments about the path. I'm an enormous fan of paths. Big pedestrian, as most of you know, but um, this to me was not, didn't feel like a designated path. It's walking down someone's private driveway, which is almost right. a bit creepy. And um, the other thing, too, in Seabright, there's so many nice little PD plan developments of about this number of units that that were done maybe 20 years ago or so, plus or minus, on some of those big lots. And the fact that, that they are self-enclosed really creates a sense of neighborhood within those units. So I think in the plan, this isn't a plan development, but it has that same similar feeling. So I'm just adding those observations. All right, if there's no further, um Questions or comments? Why don't we go ahead and uh, take the roll call vote on side? Oh yeah, um, I see it. I do oh, have yeah. I do have some questions. Um, who was the second? Councilmember Brown. And then just for clarification for the minutes, since it was kind of broadly stated, is it item? And this might be for Sam. Is it items 13, the second bullet of 22, 30, and 31? Uh, if that's where the reference to the path occurs, I'm, I'm not turning to it right now, but I think that's correct. That's correct, yeah. Those are the conditions yeah. that reference the yeah. path. And then, and then the other one where there was um, flexibility was, I think it was item number seven, uh, regarding the gas main, and I leave it for the applicant and planning to figure out what to do on that. That's correct. So we just, Flexibility um, on that. If I could um, have you clarify the fence condition also, um, I, that I, um, we would allow for a, an eight foot fence, um, but outside of the front yard setback and um, yeah. outside of the clear vision area yeah. on the seat right side. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And that was by mutual, by mutual agreement of the adjacent neighbors. Um, just because it sounded for the minutes part, what, I have my, in my notes clarification of item seven. Um, that would be to include the term if applicable um, at the end of that condition to allow for them to, it. yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. So council member Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Okay, muted. Not really, but she said aye. No, she doesn't look good. Yeah, aye. <laughs> and Mayor Cummings? Aye, so that passes unanimously. Um, Tim, that we're kind of cruising along, and thank so thank you, staff, and thank you everyone for bringing that item before us. And we'll look forward to seeing how um, 
next development turns out. But given that we're um, kind of moving along, um, why don't we move on to the last item on our agenda, item number 20, which is appeal of the Transportation and Public Works Commission decision on proposed parking changes to the block of Olive Street. And I'd also like to uh, let people know um, that um, when the numbers are on your screen, the non-toll-free numbers are the numbers that you need to use to call in to comment on this item. So if there are members of the public who would like to call in on this item, the, items that, the numbers that you will use are the non-toll-free numbers that will be on your screen. Uh, once you enter the, the meeting, you'll need to press star nine on your phone during public comment to comment on this item, and you'll have up to two minutes. And so with that, um, I will turn it over to staff for a uh, presentation on item number 20. Thank you, Mayor Cummings. This is Brian Braguno, Parking Program Manager. Can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. I'm going to share my screen. Can you guys see the screen okay? No. How about now? Yes. Okay, I'm going to do a brief presentation, kind of uh, recapping what was already provided uh, in the agenda report and staff packet, um, a majority of which was um, related to the Transportation Public Works Commission has already uh, had a public hearing and rendered a decision on the parking proposed changes that I'm going to go through with you guys right now. Um, so this is affecting the 100 block of Olive Street um, at the cross street of uh, Mission Street and on the other side of Toledo Street. So a general overview, just to provide some additional context, uh, the Traffic Engineering Department receives you know, a number of different requests annually. Um, on average, we receive three to four requests per month. Uh, we work through those in chronological order. Um, and typically, the turnaround time from the time someone initiates a request until we can kind of get to a point of completion it, it averages about six months. Uh, a majority of these requests remove, you know, we move forward with a work order unopposed, especially when there's neighborhood consensus. Um, and I think that this kind Context is important because sometimes uh, we get to these points where council's reviewing something that you know has taken quite a bit of time to get in front of you for the first time. Um, but we've been spending a little bit of time uh, on a number of these types of requests, and we currently have about 17 uh, in our backlog. Uh, so this isn't isn't unique for us, but it might be you know one of the first ones that you guys have had to look at in, in some time. Uh, so the timeline for this particular uh, parking change request began uh, last August in 2019. Uh, we, re we got a request from a member of the public that asked us to take a look at parking regulations on the 100 block of Olive Street. Uh, it took us until uh, March to finish review of that request and determine what we were going to move forward. And then, of course, you know, at that time, it was, very, it was like the worst timing from the standpoint of trying to deliver a quicker turnaround on this particular request because the COVID pandemic hit and we were in a declared emergency. We post uh, to. So the existing, uh, there are two ingress, egress, driveway access points to the businesses. Uh, it's commercially zoned on two of the parcels that are against this uh, block face and one vacant parcel that's zoned for residential that, it, that is currently um, not in use. Uh, there's a, already an existing parking permit program uh, with the two hour parking limitation Monday through Friday. Uh, and the only exception to that is to have a, a parking permit to park outside of that two hour restriction. Uh, we also have uh, our Zipcar program has two designated spaces on this block, um, and they, they are still in place. And we have two fire hydrants, uh, one nearest uh, Toledo and another one on the corner of Mission Street. So we give you an example of some of the review criteria that traffic and engineering uses when we get these types of neighborhood requests. Uh, we, you know, we ask these types of questions. We consider safety. We consider, you know, can we meet the request as it's requested by the neighborhood or is it something that we can't do for various reasons? Is it compatible use of the public right away? You know, making sure that the, the use of the street is being used um, for multiple uses, for example, bike friendly, pedestrian friendly. Uh, you know, we had the, the, the jump bike program too that added another layer of complexity where we had jump bike stations. So you know, these are the types of things we, we look at um, when we're making these determinations. 
these were the four uh, bullet points that are provided in, in the packet of what our changes encompassed, and I'm going to jump to the map as I kind of explain those. Um, so what we were looking at doing is, uh, first and foremost, uh, providing a shuttle location for the UCSC bike shuttle program. Uh, they currently use this area as a drop-off point uh, when school is in normal full session, um, and they have been having difficulty finding uh, parking and often having to double park or utilize the parking lot for their pickup uh, and loading and unloading processes. Uh, so during our review process, they, they asked us to provide an accommodation, so that's one of the, the changes that we're making. Secondarily, we're enhancing some of the, the red curb areas at the corners of Mission, uh, one, because there's a fire hydrant located there, and two, to increase uh, the sight line visibility uh, when you're making turns left or right uh, onto Mission Street off of Olive. And then secondarily, there's another, the second fire hydrant at the dead end um, was being obstructed often. There was, I think, intent to provide parking because it kind of dead end in that uh, unused space. But what we have been seeing is queuing of cars uh, that have been impacting the fire hydrant. And then also through the process of our review, we uncovered that there may be a potential development on the vacant lot that would be asking for a driveway uh, right adjacent to uh, where some of that red curb is going to exist. Um, and then the last feature and the last piece that we added was the single space markings uh, designating uh, the number of stalls and organizing the parking uh, in a particular layout that allows for a standard size vehicle to park. So overall, uh, staff's recommendation was to satisfy the neighborhood request, uh, which focused on designating those single space markings, um, while also enhancing safety, looking for ways to expand the use and um, accommodate multiple modes of transportation, including the bike shuttle, uh, to continue the existing um, limitations of encouraging turnover and existing restrictions, and also ensuring compatibility of use with the adjacent neighborhood and businesses. At the TPWC meeting in August, uh, they voted 5-2 against staff's recommendation. I think one of the themes that was apparent as they kind of deliberated on the appeal that was presented to them uh, was they were grappling with how to handle uh, the displacement of some of the RV parking that's been occurring regularly there um, and asking for staff to provide additional information and feedback on safe sleep parking programs for, for RV use. Um, they expressed during their discussion that they felt that they were limited in their role um, as a commission advisory only um, and would require city council to weigh in on the context of the, the conversation between the appellants at the time and the neighborhood. So overall, in conclusion, you know, we, we use these regulations for parking throughout the city. Uh, we have a number of different examples where we've implemented enhancements for safety purposes, uh, compatibility of use or shared use of the street uh, to accommodate transportation needs or neighborhood requests. Um, traffic engineering has limited tools to assist neighborhoods with parking, and we feel that we have an obligation to use these tools um, to assist with the vitality and compatibility of the neighborhood. Uh, we often feel that, you know, there's there's even more restrictions uh, as we enter uh, the Coastal Commission's jurisdiction, and, and we struggle with you know trying to utilize these to the best of our ability. Um, many of these parking regulations that we we receive again, um, when the neighborhood has consensus, often we post these and submit a work order, and it's not something that has to move through an appeals process. But we get about one or two a year that we take to Transportation Public Works. And I guess with that, that was, again, meant to be brief and just kind of summarize some things, but I, I would like to open it up for any questions that you have. Great. Thank you for that presentation. Are there any um, questions from council members at this time? Okay. Uh, seeing none, I'm going to open it up to the appellant. Uh, the way this process works is that the appellant having the burden of proof will be permitted to present evidence in support of the appeal for 15 minutes. And so um, I was contacted, um, sorry, give me one second and bring up, um, by Dana, who is the appellant of this. She is called in, and so I'm going to uh, open up the line to the appellant for 15 minutes to respond and to present on this. Okay, 
right. So you're on the line. Thank you. Hello, Hello. Mayor Justin Cummings and Vice Mayor Donna Myers, uh, City Council members. My name is Dana. I live on the 200 block of Olive Street, and I'm calling today to represent 76 of my immediate neighbors, uh, 26 of who signed the appeal. I wanted to read that appeal to you now. Uh, dear Santa Cruz City Council and City Clerk, this letter is to appeal the decision of the Transportation and Public Works Commission from 8-17-2020 regarding the parking changes in the 100 block of Olive Street. The commission voted to uphold Alicia Cool's appeal against the public work staff decision to install designated single space parking tees, a designated UC shuttle drop-off zone, two zip car parking spaces, and additional red curb markings on the 100 block of Olive Street between Mission Street and Toledo Street for exit safety onto Mission Street and fire hydrant access at the end of the street. Property owners and residents of the neighborhood are appealing the Transportation and Public Works Commission decision to City Council. We ask that the concerns of the residents and homeowners to be taken into account. In support of the parking regulations brought forward by the parking department staff, our neighborhood has been adversely affected by the current unmanaged, unserviced RVs and van parking on Olive Street. This short half block street is not an appropriate area for this homeless encampment. The campers generate excesses, ex excuse me, excessive amounts of trash, drug use, noise and bad behavior and unsanitary conditions. We believe that a decision to uphold the parking changes recommended will help solve some of these problems. The vast majority of our neighborhood is in agreement on this issue. We have been working on this change for over a year now, and we ask that you consider our request and uphold the neighbor's appeal. We will add that not only residents of our neighborhood are impacted by the current situation on Olive, but all customers and employees of CVS are also affected. Customers and employees of Mathnasian Tutoring on the corner of Mission and Olive are also negatively affected and genuinely concerned about the impact of their businesses. The current conditions are unacceptable. They create unsafe and hazardous conditions and a negative threat to our families. We urge you to, take, to make the right decision and implement the parking changes proposed by Public Works. That's the end of the appeal. I just wanna keep this simple, clear, and to the facts for you. I'd like you to refer to the emails that came in to you, the calls, and the upcoming public comments. And we do have a slideshow for you. Um, please note that because of the hour of this, I'm hoping that some people will get home from work and be able to join, but that was um, feedback that I got because they, people didn't know if they'd be home on time. Um, thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Um, I don't currently see. Um, I'm working on it. I'm going to share it. For, um, sorry. Um, Dana has a, a PowerPoint. Um, Dana, did you want that played now or later during your five minutes? Actually, no, it has to be played now. Hold on. Yeah. And now, please. Is it working or is it not moving? Uh, it's not moving. It's, I don't know if it's oh, working. Uh,
And that's the last slide. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dana, are there any further comments uh, that you'd like to make? Um, please note there's um, one more screen that just popped up. Uh, that's important because it shows um, how it is now versus how it was before. And it looks like we're also having more calls for service screens um, showing for, for everyone to review. Uh, Bonnie, we see the, the presenter's notes. I'm wondering if you could switch it to presenter view or the, the uh, full screen view. Um, I can't. It's on the wrong screen, and I can't figure out how to move it to the other one. The um, the presenter view. It looks like I think we saw all of the uh, the slides that were in the show. So I think we were able to see the calls for service. So are there any further comments, Dana? No, I think it speaks for itself. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think next would be uh, a rebuttal from the opponent. However, I don't um, see their number, the last four digits of their numbers. So what I'll do is um, I wonder if there's any questions from council before we open it up to uh, public comment. If there's any questions for staff. Okay, seeing none. Oh, Councilmember Brown. All right, it takes me a minute on this device. Uh, so, yeah, I guess I, my, a question I have is um, about the help me understand the appeals process here um, because. I, as I understand it, uh, the appeal w went about the decision by the department, the Transportation Public Works Department went uh, through a, pro a designated process. Um, and then, and now we're seeing that this is an appeal and just heard from Dana, thank you for, um, you know, speaking up about this, but I'm just, I'm not clear, was there an actual appeal? Is there, what's it, what, just help me understand the appeals process, I guess, overall. I, I don't see it having gone through uh, the same kind of process that the original appeal went through, and so I just wanna make sure that I'm clear on process. Thanks. And who would answer that? I think maybe if the city attorney could address that question or if there's someone from the city manager's office. Um. Well, I mean, there, there was an administrative process whereby the this, this staff initially uh, approved the application um, by the neighborhood. Uh, that decision was appealed to the Transportation and Public Works Commission and the Transportation and Public Works Commission um, basically reversed this, uh, or upheld the appeal and and rejected the staff's uh, recommendation. And then um, mul multiple neighbors filed an appeal of the Transportation and Public Works Commission's decision. Um, the appeal letters of which there were numerous um, were inadvertently omitted from the uh, agenda packet or, or rather um, as a procedural matter, um, it, uh, it's questionable whether or not it's required to include the, the letter of appeal in the packet. Um, I think a careful reading of the, of the code uh, um, states uh, does not require that. Um, but on, on occasions, there have been appeals filed where the actual letter of appeal is included in the packet and, and others um, it's not, and in this event, it was not. Um, it was, however, later distributed and is, is a public record and on file at the city clerk's office. So I think the standard process for appeals under the municipal code was followed in this, in this instance. And as far as the factual background, I'm not as familiar um, with that, and so I would defer to staff on it. But from a legal perspective, it seems like the appropriate process was followed. Oh, 
Councilman Brown, do you have any further questions or comments? I was just, I see that we have um, one of our officers of our police department here, and I, I was just wondering if you could comment on, I know that the appellant had mentioned, um, you know, increased calls for service in that area, and, and so I was just wondering if maybe you could speak to that. Yes, Mayor, we have had, uh, I just kind of pulled the records for, it looks like you went back to 19, I just pulled the records from January and of uh, this year, and we've had uh, about 43 calls there. Anything, anything from illegal parking to uh, intoxicated people to people leaving trash to um, some of the motorhomes leaking, d dumping uh, fluids uh, into the storm drains. Uh, we get those kind of types of calls. And I can tell you, since I've been on the part of the West Side uh, neighborhood since January, these calls are legit. I would go out there and I would see trash everywhere and I would see these motorhomes leaking and I would see people causing disturbances. So they are legit calls. And that's kind of what put this small little block on our radar, um, just that small little area. We got so many calls. And it's so close to Mission Street, uh, very busy with the congestion and it's right next to CVS. And so the police department has definitely been pushing for this change uh, with parking and with Brian. We've been working closely with them just to, to figure out what we can do, what kind of changes we can make uh, to make this more of a safer area for everyone. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Brown, I see your hands raised again. All right, I do have a follow-up question. Uh, thank you. So in turn, thank you um, uh, for the report uh, about Kind of calls for service. I guess another question I have, and this is just for anybody who has some uh, something, some kind of response. I'm wondering how restriping the um, kind of what's really like a half a block uh, street there is going to um, effectively address the concerns that I'm hearing from the neighbors and. Um, you know, from the from our SCPD, um, it's just, I'm just I, I just I don't know that you know there are we have rules we have laws on the books about some of the behaviors you know dumping and things like that um, you know public intoxication um, and I, I guess I'm just not clear how changing the parking the size of the parking spaces there is going to make an impact that those challenges. I'd love to hear more about your thinking there. This is uh, Brian Bruguno, Parking Program Manager. I guess to, to best answer your question, uh, Council Member Brown, is, is there is no guarantee. Um, the environmental design changes intend to uh, create uh, a disruption to the current use of the parking spaces that we believe will have the intended outcome that we hope. Um, but like any parking regulation, you know, it, it isn't necessarily a crime-solving problem. Um, but we will we will want to try this um, as a you know environmental design change that would have that outcome that we desire. Right. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm just, I guess I, I just am really, I'm stuck on that because I, I've i heard the neighbor, you know, we've had a lot of communication about this and I completely understand the concerns and I'd like to find a way to address those and I'm just not, um, I'm just, I guess I'm just still not clear how, how the, it's, we're going to get there. I feel like there may be other things we need to think about as, you know, whatever we do today that, that if those concerns are, are real, and I believe they are, um, we ought to be trying to figure out how to address those. Can, can I take a stab at answering that question as well, please? Sure. Go right ahead. Um, it, we have used the single space marking as, again, as Brian said, one of the few tools we have to deal with oversized vehicles in town. And we've used this. Um, the first location was Pelton Avenue and um, the bump outs on West Cliff Drive. And um, we got immediate positive results from the neighbors. In fact, I hear very little from the neighbors out there anymore. And so it actually has proven to be an effective tool. It, it, it would not prohibit people from, um, say, camping in their cars or short RVs. But for the oversized vehicles, it definitely um, changes the nature of, of what's allowed out there. You have to park entirely within the space um, as marked or you can be uh, cited. So it, again, it's just one of the few tools we have and it has proven 
at least from our point of view, to be effective. Thanks. Hey, Councilmember Golder. This is a question for PD. So, um, writing a citation for a vehicle for, you know, say, let's say that, that we do the striping and, and our RV comes and parks, parks there, they could get a citation. Is there any, is that it? Right, so these parking spaces, if, if an RV parks outside of the markings, uh, we can write a, a citation for that, um, and which we do uh, in every, everywhere around the city. Now, if they get five or more of these citations, um, we can actually uh, impound the, the vehicle. So that would be, so, so we start out from the, from just a, a, cita a simple parking citation for $48, and it could escalate all the way to impounding a vehicle they continue to uh, park there. So we do have some, some room in there. And so I'm just curious, because I've also been out there too, and is there anything else that these vehicles have been cited for yet? I yes. mean, the ones that I've seen, I've seen all of those things that showed up on the slideshow, plus I've seen like uh, RVs without a cap on their black water tank, and I've seen, um, someone stepped in human waste it, and it's like pretty it's pretty unsanitary and and um inhumane the living condition conditions quite frankly and so uh, i don't think it you know so i'm just wondering if there's uh, if some of these vehicles have already been cited absolutely there's several sections when we go out there they're technically supposed to move every two hours and 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 they know and they, they sit in their vehicles and they wait for us and when we come they, they move around the block and come right back so we have the two hour time limit uh, a lot of the vehicles aren't, aren't registered. Some of those have been expired eight years. They haven't registered their vehicles. Uh, we have cited vehicles for the uh, dumping of waste. We've towed vehicles out of there because of the dumping of waste. Uh, we have cited people for uh, littering in the area. So there are actually quite a few sections that we have cited uh, d during this past year. Uh, uh, definitely some quality of life citations and some um, and some DMV violations. So there, there have been quite a few, and we will continue to do that. Thank you. Are there any further questions from council members at this time? Council member Byers. Oh, and you're muted, Catherine. When we make a decision, say we make a decision to deny the appeal, do we uh, or uphold it? When does it go in effect? Maybe someone from our. Yeah, um, I, have, I just have no idea. But it is so critical, and I, I just hope it. You know, some things are 30 days, some are da da da. Tony. This, yeah, this is Brian Bruguno again. Yeah. If I could oh. help answer that, and maybe Tony can confirm some of that. Anybody. Yeah. There, there is, there, there's no time certain implementation. After, oh. after you guys make a decision, we then can submit a work order. The work order um, can be delayed or paused or postponed due to the streets team's capacity, or when we finalize submitting the work order based on the decision that you make. So there is no, no time certain. Um, but once, once the approval is done, it gives us the authority to move forward with it um, after that point. Great. Thank you. Just what I need to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any further questions or comments, council members? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to turn it over to the public. Um, before we begin, I'm going to just double check to see if the um, let's see if um, the opponent has called in, so I'm just double checking the numbers. It does not appear that um, the opponent to this has called in. So we're gonna go ahead with um, opening up for public comment. So if there are members of the public who would like to comment on this item, now's the time to call in using the numbers on your screen. After calling in, you'll need to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you will be given two minutes to speak unless you've contacted us prior to the meeting to request additional time. Um, if the opponent calls in, um, I would like for the opponent to please announce themselves, and they will have 15 minutes. Okay, for 
Mr. Speaker, you are permitted to speak. Hello, um, this is Carol Polhamus again, hi. I'm speaking as a representative of the West Side Neighbors on behalf of the neighbors on Olive Street in support of the proposed parking regulations. RV overnight parking is an ongoing issue in West Side neighborhoods, including Olive Street, Delaware, Fair, Miramar, Western, Swanton, Garfield Park, and others. This issue predates the COVID pandemic. A number of these RV residents have lived on our neighborhood streets for well over a year. Allowing RV parking overnight on neighborhood streets without sanitation or oversight is not fair to the neighborhoods, parks, or businesses that have to deal with related impacts and consequences. Those who live in RVs do need a safe place to park. We already have the AFC Safe Spaces program to park free in the county, and we need to get information out about these places, and we need to develop more, as the grand jury report also suggested. But allowing overnight RV parking in residential neighborhoods is not acceptable and it creates many problems. The solution is to provide a legal place and then enforce existing regulations. Please support the requests of the neighbors by approving the proposed parking changes on Olive Street. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, you're welcome. <laughs> Yeah, hi, this is Garrett Phillip. The original appeal to parking changes on Olive Street was more grandstanding of homeless squatters' rights where none exist. The city can make parking changes as it sees fit, respecting the local residents' safety, aesthetic, and health concerns, and the original appeal petitioner, I hope, can try her luck squatting elsewhere. I suggest she make inquiries into RV campgrounds, safe spaces, or look further away for RV accommodations. CVS is open until midnight, and an RV encampment across the street is surely not doing them any good. I really don't know what goes on there at night, but nothing any residents there say would surprise me. We need a lot more of this approach on the west side, and you can continue with Garfield Park, Delaware, Natural Bridges, please. Don't overthink this one. Implement the original approved parking changes on Olive Street. Thank you. Bye. Okay, next speaker. Hello, um, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Hi, my name is Carol Ann Bauman, and I'm the owner of Mathnasium of Santa Cruz, located in the beautiful brick building on the corner of Olive and Mission Street. And I'm calling you today to respectfully ask that you support the proposed parking changes on the 100 block of Olive Street. And my two concerns mainly are trash um, and safety. I spend a disproportional amount of my time running my business, um, cleaning up um, after a whole lot of people who um, are not my customers. <laughs> and my bigger concern is really for the safety of our children that come here to do their math tutoring. And um, I arrived today um, just a few hours ago to find a used needle in my parking lot. And I just um, really think that these changes would be in the best interest of our community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, next caller. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Yes, uh, and by the way, thank you and the council for grinding through this material week after week. I am incredibly impressed. Anyway, I think we've approached this. My name is Russ Harris, by the way, and I live up Olive Street. I've been there for 48 years. And uh, we're approaching this somewhat uh, uh, predominantly or skewed toward the uh, public nuisance uh, issue with regards to the uh, uh, toilet paper, needles, all that stuff. I have seen all of that. And 
and I've seen uh, intoxicated people engaging in extremely loud, uh, uh, profane, and rather scary uh, encounters uh, in that area. But I would approach this more from a standpoint of safety even. I've seen children in some of these RVs. I happen to be an RV park owner uh, of a major RV in, uh, park in the Bay Area. And I've been in the business for over 50 years. And I can tell you, uh, this ain't the place where you want to be putting, putting RVs. There's a, I, I look at it from my professional standpoint from a safety uh, issue. I also ride my bicycle frequently in the area, and I've seen people come swinging around the Mathnasium building. Uh, it, Mission Street will be very, very busy. You'll see people hurriedly exiting, and uh, maybe they're in a hurry to get the errand done or whatever, but they go zipping up that street, that short street. I've seen children uh, in those areas. I have children living in RVs in my park, so I, I know that they're a, a, uh, a, a good way for, to do substitute housing, and I'm certainly all in favor of it. But I think we got to uh, uh, accept the staff's position of getting these uh, uh, wide-body units off that particularly, uh, particular street. I think it is extremely hazardous. We don't want to be down here six months from now uh, finding ourselves all on the 10 o'clock news because we missed a call here. Uh, there are hazards, and I would urge that the uh, traffic engineer, maybe the city attorney, get on down there and just kind of look that over and, and think in those terms uh, with that mindset. Anyway, I appreciate the opportunity, and, uh, and thank you very much for your time on this. Thank you for calling in. Hi, this is Robert from Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom, Robert Norris. I believe the appellant is trying to call in. That's what she's told me, or I should say the responder. She was occupied in another call, so be alert for that. Uh, the real issue here has to do with the lack of real statistics on this issue. Can I pause you for one second? I just want to uh, respect the fact that um, Robert Norris has called in on behalf of Huff and has requested uh, additional time. So, Robert, you'll have up to four minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Um, so what you need to make a really informed decision on this is to have input not simply from neighbors who have you know, what may well be legitimate concerns, but also have a very specific perspective and a specific aesthetic they're searching for. They don't have the problem of having to sleep in a vehicle at night and having to find a place to park where they're not driven away by what is often NIMBY hostility. And that's really a really profound part of Santa Cruz as well. Well, I'm afraid, or so we found at Huff. You need to really talk to service providers and find out just how many RV spaces are actually available. Is have service, you should need to go out to service providers and homeless persons to get more indication of homeless uh, the people in these vehicles. You also haven't got any real stats from the police regarding actual crimes. Calls for service are not crimes. And it's, um, instead there's the usual needles, trash, bad behavior, uh, threats to, ch you know, to children, which really is kind of a disgraceful way of uh, criminalizing homeless people. In the city, that's how blacks are described. In the, here, that's homeless people. And so it's a form of bigotry, which I think we have to be careful about. It's not always true, of course, and there are bad people in every group. But there's a real issue here, particularly since the staff report does not have really the information that really made the commission make a decision uh, uh, in favor of uh, Alicia Cool, the appellant. First of all, she has been pursued. She has been focused on as an activist who police and neighbors want to get rid of. That seems to me to be the case and has been the case because she's been an outspoken supporter of homeless folks. There is no evidence of criminal behavior. In, I mean, I'd like to see the evidence, and I think the city council should see it, any criminal behavior in that neighborhood. I don't mean anecdotal accounts. I mean actual criminal behavior. I mean, where are the minutes to the meeting? Of the commission, so they can actually hear the debate, and then and and it's the business of the appellant, the appealer here, not not being available. Maybe it's technically okay, but as with the problems that were developing with the. Um, uh, 
the library situation, the public needs to see that in advance, and so do the people concerned about this. That was not a part of the agenda packet. So to make a decision about that without that kind of information is to disdain the entire commission system and also to be unfair to the public regarding uh, the whole situation. The staff also seems to be somewhat partisan, as is the police department, uh, rather than being suitably neutral and objective here. And so uh, while the city and the churches are to be complimented for providing some safe parking spaces, there aren't that many, and they certainly do not meet the needs of folks who are in their vehicles. And until that need is available, you have to not run away people where they are because of the COVID situation. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Hi, my name's Jim Olson. Uh, I am calling in to support the proposed parking changes. I live at 202 Anita Street, which is one block from the 100 block of Olive Street. Um, I bought my house 16 years ago, and I've lived in Santa Cruz for 33 years. Over the past several years, there has been a large increase in the number of people camping at the end of Olive Street. <clears throat> but there are no facilities to accommodate the campers. There is no trash collection. There are no bathrooms. There's no, there are no picnic tables. Therefore, the trash gets dumped outside. People pee and poop in the bushes, and personal items are placed on the sidewalks and in the streets. It's not a healthy situation for anyone. Uh, this includes the campers as well as the people that live nearby and the patrons of the businesses nearby. Um, I have also, on occasion, seen numerous drug deals and drug use, people shooting up right next to the CVS at the end of Olive Street. Um, I have reported what I have seen to the police. As a result of these activities, I have reduced my use of the area, um, reduced visits to CVS, um, and I do not walk through the area to the other stores and restaurants anymore. Uh, these problems are not constrained just to the end of Olive Street. They spread out. Um, at my house, which is one block away, I've had camping gear stolen. I've had my tenant had their bike stolen. Um, my car has been broken into numerous times and I've been stolen. The end of Olive Street is not a suitable location for camping. If people want to camp in their vehicles, they should do so where there are appropriate facilities, such as the Safe Spaces Parking Program. I urge you to adopt the proposed parking changes in an effort to reduce some of these problems. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next speaker. Hello, this is Abby Samuels. Um, I'm calling on behalf uh, to support Alicia Cool's um, appeal that the commission had voted 5-2 on. The commission commissioners had done extensive review of all of the letters. There were 50, of about 50 letters that were for the parking slots and about 70 letters that were against the parking slots. So they did an extensive review and now you're trying to reverse their decision. Um, the thing is, is that, well, I hope you don't. Um, there, that's one part. And one of the commissioners lived, uh, spent part of his summer less than a block away from Olive Street. Also, some of those letters are from people supporting Alicia Cool's appeal that from people that live on Olive Street. Those pictures, if you look at those pictures that were sent in, the pictures that were the pictures did not show that they were near any RVs. All the pictures that had, that had RVs in it did not show any trash. 
they, the commission asked for reports from the police and they didn't have it. Just listing calls is not, does not say uh, that those crimes actually happen because there's a campaign on next door asking people to call in and saying you see supposed drug deals. I go down there a lot. Every, every single commissioner that voted five to two, they went down there and they checked it out. Um, I also um, have experienced that they put, that they set things up. Um, but there's only two or three RVs that park there, mainly, mainly Alicia Cool and her family. So you're talking about a half a block. Um, so that's what I wanted. Please support what the commission had voted for. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, you're on the line. Hello. Good, after, good evening. Uh, hi, my name's Adam Novak, uh, and I'm calling in to uh, request that the appeal be denied. Um, it seems to me that the neighborhood coalition appealing doesn't include any of the residents of the neighborhood who live in the RVs. Uh, I'm told that some of them have been living there for over a year. The fact that they've chosen to live there indicates that it's a good place to live among the options available to them. They could move if they wanted to. And forcing them to move could not possibly improve their quality of life or prevent their RVs from leaking fluids or being not registered with the DMV. Uh, I think that changing the parking to exclude RVs is the wrong city action to address the problems at Olive Street. Services from the city, such as waste uh, removal for RVs, trash disposal, storage, uh, social workers, needle deposit, uh, need to be brought out to the site by the city to meet the needs of the residents there. If you want to improve the community, you have to actually improve the community, not break it up and try and hide all of its members elsewhere in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Hello. Good evening. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Council, for the opportunity to speak. Our family own a house on Toledo Street, just 100 feet from the Olive RV encampment. Our house has been rented out since 2012. In 2018, we started facing problems with the RV and camping encampment next to our property. Our tenants, a family of three, reported excessive noise, fights in the middle of the night, clear evidence of drug use and drug dealing. In short, everything you would expect from an open camping which is unmanaged and unregulated. After suffering harassment by some of the RV dwellers, our tenants left only a year after moving in, instead of the six years they intended to live there. I understand that Santa Cruz has a huge problem of lack of affordable housing and homelessness. I am not anti-homeless, and I would urge you to find such solutions for the RV dwellers. However, open camping in the midst of a neighborhood is not a good solution. It has a negative impact on our neighborhood. It is not safe for anyone, not the neighbors, not the businesses there, and not the unhoused population living on that block. It took our neighborhood over a year to try and address this issue. We are not an anti-homeless coalition or any other organization, and we are not trying to target home houseless people. We are only dealing with our own neighborhood, and I hope you will Thank you very much. Okay, next speaker, you're on the line. Hi, yeah, my name is Curtis Galloway, and uh, I've lived in Santa Cruz for over 30 years. Uh, my house is on King Street, uh, a couple blocks away from Olive Street. And um, I got involved about a year ago when I was noticing um, as, as I would walk down Olive Street uh, to get to Mission Street, uh, you know, a lot of uh, vehicles camping there and increase in trash and 
uh, that's that's how I came to talk to some of the other neighbors and, and hear about the problems that they had been experiencing too. Um, yeah, I think uh, from my perspective, it, it feels like this is a reasonable change. Um, and I, I think that a lot of thought went in from the public works people and I appreciate uh, the work of the commission and the city council in reviewing all of this. And um, if, if we need more resources for RV parking in Santa Cruz, I think that's great, but I think we should uh, be thoughtful about where we cite that and should go through a process of consulting the neighborhood rather than just sort of grandfathering in uh, places that have sprung up like this spontaneously. Uh, so I, I would uh, urge the council to uh, support the parking changes that were proposed originally. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've noticed that the uh, opponent to the application has called in. And so before moving forward with the, um, the rest of public comment, I'm gonna allow the opponent to speak. Um, they are allowed up to 15 minutes to provide their evidence um, against the appeal. And so I'm gonna allow the, um, the opponent to speak at this time. Can you hear me? Yes, is this Alicia Cool? Yes, this is. All right, you have uh, 15 minutes to uh, provide your rebuttal and statement to the council. Thank you. Okay, so I want to point out several things. Um, number one, I've been parking on Olive Street for approximately two years. Um, it is a safe location. I kind of consider myself a resident. Several of the nearby people living there consider um, me and a couple of the other individuals that park there like family. Um, they welcome us there. They say that we actually improve the neighborhood. They say that they prefer to know the people that are parking there rather than to not know them. Uh, we have provided many photographs to show that there is no collection of, of um, feces, needles, trash, anything like that. Um, there are a lot of police phone calls because in general there are a lot of police phone calls targeting people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, removing the parking there isn't going to make a big difference as far as what's happening there because what's going to happen is people are going to have to move to nearby streets. This is not a like a productive way of addressing this issue. Right now we have a growing number of people who are experiencing homelessness. We have a lot of fire evacuees. Uh, this specifically targets large RVs, which kind of makes no sense if you're talking about health and safety concerns because larger RVs are the only ones with restrooms. Um, they're not the ones dumping uh, sewage or going to the restroom outside. Um, I might myself show a ticket every single month to show that I'm dumping my RV properly because people are constantly getting accused of that. And so although many calls come in, most are not substantiated. Um, changing the parking would not help the, the area at all. There's plenty of parking in the CVS area for cars. It's not going to open up any parking like for the U UCSC shuttle or anything like that. They frequently stop in the CVS area. Um, large delivery trucks have no problem getting in and out of there. Um, I would like to also point out that citing people who are experiencing homelessness in an effort to give them five or more tickets so that you can tow their home away is just a hateful, horrible tactic. It doesn't lean towards helpfulness or um, improving people's lives whatsoever. It, it dehumanizes people um, um, in their worst time, in their worst crisis, and makes their situation worse. If you take their RV or their home or their car away, what does that put them? That puts them on the street. That would essentially, if you did that to me, take my bathroom away from my family. That would put us in a tent. That would force my daughter to have to use one of these disgusting porta potties on the street that are hardly ever serviced and rarely ever open. Um, you 
you know, the AFC Safe Parking Program is few and far between. They're pretty much at capacity. They do background checks. You have to have fully registered vehicle. You have to go through a lot of criteria to meet their um, program requirements. It's not low barrier. It leaves many, many people out. Uh, right now, we need solutions, not criminalization. Uh, I find this to be like a horrible tactic to use like parking regulations to target people experiencing homelessness in general. I think it's kind of an abuse of the process. I, I don't think it's appropriate. Um, like many people were saying, we won the appeal fair and square. If you were to go against what was already voted on 5-2, you would be going against logic and just approving an anti-homeless hateful policy. And that's basically all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Okay, we'll go back to public comment. Um, next speaker, you allow to unmute your phone. My name is Gail Michelis Ow. I don't live in the neighborhood. I live on Highland Avenue, but I, along with my family, own the property at 1700 Mission Street, where the CVS is located. And I'm calling to support the changes to the parking to support the appeal. I have had several meetings with the neighborhood, and I've also had several meetings with people from CVS, Amy Pagel, who's the area district supervisor and the manager. And because of the RV problem in the neighborhood, employees and customers alike are being harassed by people who live there. A lot of them wanted to speak up today, but they are afraid. It's the same thing that everyone else has talked about. There's trash, there's needles, there's urinating and defecating on property. There's a lot of harassment going on. This is not COVID related as was talked about at the uh, traffic commission. These folks have been here, as you heard, this process started over a year ago. It is really important that in Santa Cruz, we find an appropriate spot for RV parking, but that little block of Olive Street is not a safe or appropriate spot for this to happen. So please um, help protect this neighborhood and the businesses in the neighborhood and the residences. And thank you for considering this matter tonight. Thank you. Next speaker. Can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Vicki, and I'm calling in to uh, urge you to accept the Planning Commission's um, approval, uh, or sorry, um, to let the parking stand the way it is um, and abide by the Planning Commission's decision. Um, a number of people have, had, have expressed concern about the safety of the people living in RVs. I think if that is truly the concern, then we need to bring on more services online before you talk about harassing people and allowing them to um, increasing the probability that their vehicles will be impounded and that they will be on the street. That is just straight up cruelty to, to go to enforcement first with social cleansing. Um, obviously, this is not an ideal situation in the neighborhood I live. I also am dealing with trash and all the things that people mentioned. Any association between those things and the people who are living in RVs is just not there's no evidence for it. Nobody has offered any evidence, just saying this stuff happens and there are people in RVs. There's no way, there's 
not a logical connection between those things necessarily. So that's, um, there's no evidence been offered for that. So I would urge you to first look into uh, appropriate services and not use enforcement as your first go-to here. Um, that's not appropriate. And please, uh, the Planning Commission members went out and checked out the situation. Um, you have to realize that, again, a lot of these calling campaigns have been ginned up on um, next door. It's a coordinated campaign to drive out the most vulnerable people in our community, and it's not Thank you. Okay, next caller. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Pagel. I'm the district leader of the CVS Pharmacy located at 1700 Mission Street. Um, that's previously been mentioned a number of times. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to listen to us tonight, and um, I, I won't go into all the same details that many of the others have um, in support of these changes. Um, I just wanted to um, say that I am, too, in support of these changes. Um, these, this particular group and these people that have been um, living on the 100 block of Olive Street, um, they, many of them were previously residing in our parking lot um, it took us a lot of um, a lot of time and effort um, but we were eventually able to get the right signs that prohibited that um, they moved to olive during the time that they were in our parking lot um, it, they were routinely harassing customers there was trash there was um, needles there was drinking um, and they were harassing my colleagues as well since they've moved um, that hasn't really stopped. Um, I personally have received over 50 customer complaints this year alone, um, and many of these um, customers are neighbors saying they don't feel safe coming to my store. Um, they won't be coming back until they can. So um, this has impacted my business. This has impacted my colleagues' um, safety and, and perception of safety and the customers as well. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next speaker. Hi, um, my name is Candace Brown. I am a Transportation and Public Works Commissioner, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so, earlier was not able to read the report, by the way, but that's a separate issue because there's an issue of downloading very large files that is probably problematic to other people which I have had a problem with. So I apologize, I've not been able to read all the attachments, but I can speak to that particular meeting. Um, and the issue that the commissioners had was that we are in the middle of the COVID pandemic and the appellant was asking to be able to shelter in place. And we didn't feel there was no legal authority there to see whether we could um, uh, not honor that appeal otherwise. And so I think that was a major influence. The other thing was that the solution that the traffic engineering came up with, the parking there, actually the sign says 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., uh, two hours. So it's not 24 hour restricted, number one. And the solution for that was not to change that. And it wasn't to change the parking around the surrounding area. So it was felt like it would just move to another block or something. That was one issue or the second issue. Um, and also it was just targeted to the RVs and people were saying there was maybe one or two or three RVs there at any point in time, but there's a lot of cars there, there's a lot of vans there, there's a lot of trucks there, and none of that would be restricted. Also the RVs in particular have bathrooms, but all these other vehicles do not. And so it just seemed like the solution that they came up with was not going to solve any of the problems that were of concerns. And there were, you know, letters and there was some documentation by the tenant that then moved out. Um, it also seemed from some of the documentation that became very personal between a couple people. So it was hard to know if it was just a personal issue. I just wanted to represent that because I think it's important 
and we felt that it needed to go to the city council because this is the much broader issue of homelessness and how to proceed forward. So thank you. Okay, next member of the public. Good evening, this is Scott Graham. Um, I find it very interesting that when we have a fire and housed people lose their housing, that the government, the churches, and businesses open up places for them to park and camp and whatnot. But unhoused people that lose their houses for other reasons other than a fire are scorned upon, and we must drive them away. Um, this, this is something that plays out nationwide, not just here in Santa Cruz. Before you do anything on Olive Street, come up with a solution. Because if you have no solution for these people, whether they're in an RV or a van or in a car, if you have no solution for them, then what are you doing except playing whack-a-mole where you let, say, okay, you move out of this area or we're going to ticket you and then we're going to steal your car and hold it for ransom. Um, th this is not a way to address this issue. The way to address it is to come up with a solution. Uh, I hear a lot of vague references to problems, but no real reference to any problem that is caused by what we're calling oversized vehicles. Um, if the city staff wants to make it so that it's more, there's more visibility at the end of the street when you're pulling out. I'm fine with that. Or if they want to make a little buffer at the turnout out of the parking lot so that there's enough room for big big delivery to get in and out, that's good. But don't do anything to harm people that are just trying to survive. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Yeah, uh, my name is Reggie, um, and I just want to say uh, that we should accept the appeal as was voted on by the Planning Commission with a 5-2 vote. I live near this location and regularly go to the CVS for prescription drugs. I never feel unsafe. I never feel like the area is dirty or dangerous. And I'm honestly astonished that during this moment of discussion regarding Black Lives Matter and transformative justice, that staff seems entirely unconcerned about the obvious bigotry and dehumanization of these kinds kinds of regulatory changes. This is the worst kind of nimbyism that is being supported by an anti-homeless reactionary coalition from next door. This is honestly Trump-like. Has an addition of services even been considered? Are we as a city simply going to normalize this fascistic thought process of social cleansing? If a homeowner had some trash on their lawn, would you suggest the city forcibly remove them from their home? Is this kind of thinking uh, this kind of thinking is only ever acceptable when discussing people living in poverty because they have no rights. City staff seems entirely unconcerned with human rights of people living in vehicles. Adding bathrooms, a trash bin, and a needle kiosk seemingly solves every problem put forward in a fair and simple way. As others have stated, this particular regulation is clearly more cruel than it is even thoughtful. RVs have bathrooms, RVs have space to store trash and needles, and yet RVs are being explicitly targeted with these regulatory changes. These proposed changes are not only cruel and inhumane, they are downright stupid. Accept the appeal. Okay, thank you. Okay, next speaker. Okay. Uh, looks like that speaker lowered their hand, so I'll call on the next speaker.
Last four digits ending in 0889. Hello? Good evening. Hi. Um, I'm going to be real quick on this. I just want to say my name is Lori. I live on Toledo Street. I've lived here for 38 years. And I'm really um, appalled by everybody uh, acting like the neighborhood is making these stories up. Um, I have two young grandchildren that visit me weekly, um, 8 and 10. There are a lot of kids on the street, um, some just approaching high school, some just approaching junior high, um, some that have never been exposed to some of the things that they are seeing that's happening on the block down there by CVS. I'm a couple houses away. But the, the, it's not like people planted these things there. They came. Elisa Cool, she came two years ago and considers herself a resident. What is she doing to give back to society? What is she doing to get a job? Her place is a hub. And her hub has brought more and more vehicles here, small and large. And, the, and the, this is when it all started. I've been here for 38 years. I watch this. I see this. I don't go to CVS anymore either. I don't walk down that way unless I have my grandkids on the weekend. We try to do it in the day, never at night. Now, just because of Halloween, just to look at things in the store. But I, I can't believe that, that they are saying that people would in the neighborhood would plant these things and put these things. These things never came. The whippets, the needles, the feces, none of this came before the motorhomes came. And none of the smaller cars came before the motorhome came. So all of this has been because of the hub. She started as a hub and it brought more people to the area. That's what I'd like to say. And I'm appalled that she would say that the neighborhoods and, and other people like Robert Norris that are planting things, you know, maybe these are planted. They don't look like they're coming out of a motorhome. Well, where the hell do they think they came from? I, I, I'm upset. I'm upset listening to this because, like I said, I am a homeowner, and I've lived here for 38 years, and it's never been like this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next caller, and this will be the last caller um, for public comment. After this, we'll uh, turn it back over to the appellant to make any um, rebutting arguments. Short, I have up to five minutes, um, and then we'll bring it back to Council for Action and Deliberation. So, last four digits, 2789. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm really glad to be going last and that we don't have to end on that absolutely insane speaker that is just spouting disgusting nonsense. Um, I am definitely here to vote that you to speak my opinion on that you should reject those changes. You should definitely follow the 5-2 Planning Commission ruling in favor of appealing the parking changes on Olive Street. I myself am not a member of that neighborhood, but I am a home a homeowner in Santa Cruz. I am disgusted at Andy Mills and Officer West Maui. I cannot tell you how many times in the last four years I myself had to call the Santa Cruz Police Department to complain of fraternities next door, urinating in droves, defecating, barfing. I was told that they could not do anything, probably because they were white UCSC students. But now here is police, here is city commission trying to do things to these RV dwellers. If it's a quality of life, who's life? I, you know, calling in numerous times to have the fraternities keep in check. Nothing is done until someone dies in one of them. Do something about the people that are entitled. Do something about the people that are actually causing a problem and not trying to do the best with what they have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna um, ask if uh, the appellant, Dana, would like to speak. Um, if so, please press star nine on your phone. You'll have five minutes to um, uh, to say any closing comments um, in response to the opposition and the comments you heard. And, and Dana, before you begin, I'd just like to say that um, just based on council policy, you're able to rebut any of the things that you heard earlier, but you can't bring up any new um, arguments to be made. So 
and you'll have about okay. five minutes. Thank you. I just want to thank you for listening to the concerns of the neighbors and myself. We are not next door. We are not a coalition. We are not anti-homeless. Um, you have received in your emails over 83 emails um, in support of this change. And as neighbors, we represent families that were born and raised here, immediate neighbors to the 100 block of Olive, all socioeconomical backgrounds, teachers, students, homeowners, renters, immediate business owners, managers, landlords to that 100 block, residents dating back to the 70s, new homeowners and renters, caretakers, the elderly, UCSC students, taxpayers, realtors, customers to CVS and the close by businesses, therapists, volunteers and supporters of the homeless community, including myself. We, the neighbors, and the two immediate businesses of CVS and Mathnasium support the proposed parking changes to the 100 block of Olive Street to address the issues of sanitation, safety, and parking. We hope that the city council will help this homeless community to find a designated safe parking space with running water, trash, and bathroom facilities and the resources and support that they need. Again, thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Okay, at this time, we're gonna bring it back to council um, for comments, actions, and deliberation. So if there's any council members who'd like to speak on this item, council member Watkins and council member Golder. Thank you, Mayor, um, and I appreciate all of the uh, input from the community as well as the um, staff and our commission's time uh, thinking this through. I know it's really challenging and, and, and balancing uh, neighborhood compatibility and these broader issues around those experiencing homelessness in our community as well as um, illicit behaviors that are happening in neighborhoods. And, um, you know, given what I've heard in terms of the uh, impact it's, it's had to have some of these um, efforts underway in certain areas where there's been a disproportionate amount of uh, illicit activity occurring, uh, I, I am supportive of, uh, of moving forward with, uh, and I want to make sure I'm saying this quickly, but moving forward essentially with the implementation of some of these changes to our parking, um, I, I believe that means then that would be to um, uphold the appeal. So I'll go ahead and, and make that motion. Um, and just one last thing I, I do want to say is that, you know, there has been efforts to improve ways to meet our community members' needs where they are. And I know there was reference to children living in uh, certain RVs in that area. And, and I know that there's work happening with the County Office of Education and our safe uh, sleeping program and looking at other locations that are more compatible for children. And so I just invite, uh, you know, our community and those who are in, you know, um, sharing resources with our unhoused families that that be also a reference reference for those to uh, consider a more compatible location for their children. So with that, I'll just go ahead and leave uh, the motion on the floor. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor, um, just in terms of lines of hands that are up. Um, Council Member Gold, are you prepared to second the motion? Okay, so a motion made by Council Member Watkins, seconded by Council Member Golder. Council Member Golder, if you, you have the floor. And you're muted. I, I was just gonna second the motion. I don't have any further comments or questions at this point. Okay, um, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I just wanted to thank um, all the folks who spoke tonight. Um, I have talked with a, a number of folks over in the neighborhood there and obviously reviewed all of the correspondence we got. Um, and, you know, it, we do have we do have extensive RV camping pretty much throughout the throughout the west side. Um, I think that this street is problematic because of the commercial nature that's that's there, the the shortness of the street, um, the, the, the the you know the the commercial district is quite dense there. There's a lot of use. There's a lot of cars coming in and off of Mission Street at high high levels. It's just this isn't, I just don't agree that this is a place where we should have people living in their vehicles. And um, it's not, 
you know, um, we, we, we do provide um, uh, safe parking programs. Uh, we have three sites in our, in our police department lot available every night. Not, not very often are those used, um, but it's, in my opinion, this just, unfortunately, it just is not a really good, it's not a good location for, for what's happening. Um, I don't, I don't know why the, the residents who are, are there um, would, you know, make accusations or try to, I, I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I've seen similar types of results in other places. So I, I, I think we are, um, you know, we're tr dealing with a very difficult program pro problem. We don't have um, facilitated uh, places except through the AFC. Um, and I just think this is just very incompatible with the neighborhood. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, supportive of the motion. It's just, this is really not, it's not really gonna work in a residential area to do this. And um, so I'm gonna be supporting the motion tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Brown. I do have another question, uh, which is explicitly about the appeal, but I uh, it's come up, so I just want to ask, where are we at with the AFC uh, parking? We uh, the, the catch recommended to us that we expand um, safe parking. Uh, I believe the council has voted to um, allow uh, churches to increase the number of um, campers. And I, I guess I'm I'm just gonna leave the police de department parking lot out of it because I think that's a bit of an anomaly and I understand it's maybe not as welcoming of a place uh, for people who are living on the margins. So um, that aside, where are we at with the AFC? Um, is there, um, are, you know, are we expanding? Are there places that we could send people um, and kind of what's the outlook there? And I see Susie O'Hara is here. Thank you. Yeah, I had to, I had to turn on my light. Good evening, uh, council members. Happy to answer that question for you, council member Brown. So with regard to the AFC safe parking program, we do have the lot at PD um, and also we opened um, a 10 space lot um, behind Wheel Works in lot 17 um, for the use of the AFC program. One of the catch recommendations, as you mentioned, Council Member Brown, was to continue to look into um, expanding that program. And as of now, um, AFC has 40 spots within their, I'm sorry, not the rotating shelter, within their safe parking program. Um, during COVID, that moved to a 24-7 shelter-in-place program. And I think the big distinction being is that um, that program is a fully managed program. Um, yes, there are requirements in order to access that program um, that uh, Ms. Cool did mention, and I think the AFC needs to continue to provide um, flexibility around some of those um, perceived and actual barriers into the program. We do have the ability to expand um, from three to five spots at our faith-based organizations. And the county's focus strategies work, which is the system-wide improvement for homelessness response, is contemplating additional safe parking um, across the county. So I know that there will be potential for expansion um, as the city continues to think about homelessness response programs. The need for safe parking um, is obviously paramount to continuing to uh, meet the needs of our unsheltered community. Um, I would agree that this area is particularly challenged just for equity of use um, for folks um, that are accessing that area, whether it be for business or residential or personal reasons. And um, really hosting a safe parking program needs to come with all of those service provisions to help people exit their homelessness and not just by virtue of providing parking. So much more for the council to consider, um, but I appreciate the question. And I do think there's opportunity um, continue, to continuing to move forward with AFC as well. Thank you. Uh, council Member Byers, and then I have a few comments I'd like to make too on this. Um, good, I'm glad you were here, Susie, to update us. Because uh, one of my, uh, I tried to get a hold of the social, um, faith communities this morning so I could get an update because I thought 
I understood that they had proposed another location in which they would manage, but I don't whether you've heard that or not. Or, and I wasn't able to talk to anyone before we start at 9.30 this morning, by the way. <laughs> but uh, we all got to encourage the churches because we've had a program, when I say we, the city, for on the books forever that churches can allow up to three um, whether they're cars or RVs, and often they have bathrooms and often they have water, and maybe they don't have, but, you know, it, it is a place. And I think there's such a, um, there's so many out there that really could contribute to this problem. No, it, on the city streets is not a good place. You know, my street, I get RVs all the time, but they're usually just here for an overnight. They're more tourists than they are people who really have jobs and happen to be living in their RV. So we must not... Uh, just we can't give up in finding a lot more, and I think it would just help the whole community if we each one of us take it on to get your church to expand the program. Thank you, Susie, too, for all your work. And, and yeah, I certainly uh, am voting to uphold the appeal. So. for those comments. Um, I just, you know, with respect to the issue around homelessness, you know, I think it's really important that the city remembers that not only, um, you know, when we think about where the service is and who, who is in charge of operating services, you know, this really is a function that um, falls under the purview of the county. However, the city has worked, you know, with the county this year more than ever to stand up, you know, more services than we've ever had. Um, I think Susie just mentioned we had 40 um, new AFC parking spaces. I don't think, you know, I don't think we had anywhere close to that last year at this time. We have, you know, we have Coral Street, we have the VFW halls, we have at least seven hotels where we're, um, we're, we're sheltering people at the moment. In addition to the homeless services that we previously had, um, the Benchlands, the Armory, I mean, we have set up unprecedented amounts of shelter for homeless people this year, and we've expanded our parking programs. And, you know, I think that we, you know, we really need to continue working with the county, but I think we're trying to do as much as we can. And we need to just respect the fact that we have to work within the amount of resources that we have. I live over by lot 17, and I often don't see that lot at capacity. So, you know, working with the AFC to do outreach to the people who are on this street, I think, would be great to see if some of those folks could, you know, become a part of this program. Um, and, you know, I'll say that that safe parking program has not had any impacts on the community. I, we haven't received complaints. Um, when I walk past there on the way downtown, there's not garbage everywhere. There's no, you know, needles. And so there are programs that we've been standing up that have been working in our community, and I think it's really important that we continue to use those models uh, for providing, um, you know, safe parking and sleeping programs for our unsheltered population. And, you know, unfortunately, um, just based on the comments and the feedback we've received today, it seems like what's happening on um, on Olive Street is not very compatible with the residents in the neighborhood. And so I'm going to also be voting to uphold this appeal. And I just hope that moving forward and between you know now and when these um, parking um, these, these implementations for parking are are put in, that you know, we can. Um, provide some information to those folks about how they can get access to the services that we're currently offering throughout the county. I also, you know, for the makers of the motion, I think it would be great if we could, um, maybe if the maker and the, the second of the motion would consider um, approving that the mayor sends a letter to the county expressing support of increasing capacity for safe parking programs in other parts of the county. Um, I, that would I'm wonder if that could be considered. Absolutely. Thank you. And, um, yeah, I think that we really need to, you know, these times are very difficult, and we have to balance the impacts on everyone in our community. And I just think that, you know, with this um, situation, we really need to take the neighborhood concerns and the business concerns into account and try to find um, other places where uh, these folks can, can sleep safely. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I um, <laughs> excuse me. I I agree um, with uh, much of what's been said. I I am 
you know, I hear the concerns that are coming from neighbors, um, from the businesses there. I will say it's not really, I mean, it is adjacent to residential street. <laughs> it is right there on Mission Street. Um, but even that aside, I, um, you know, I hear the concerns and yet I have no, you know, for, we, we, we say a lot about making data-driven evidence-based decisions and I, um, I do not see any evidence, um, and if somebody has it, please share it, that, um, you know, restricting large vehicles but continuing to allow smaller vehicles to, is going to somehow change the dynamic there. I, I guess I just, you know, I, I, that is one thing. I just don't see this as uh, a solution to the perceived problem. Um, I, I realize that making a decision like this is a politically expedient thing to do, but it certainly does not do anything to address um, the challenges that we have. It does not do anything to address um, the behavioral issues. You know, so, so if that's our goal is to, you know, to deal with trash and, and um, you know, waste and, and needles, it's hard for me to imagine that simply restriping uh, that one block is going gonna, is gonna to do anything about that and just you know, kind of, and on principle, I don't think that um, continuing to implement these kinds of, um, of changes in order to address a problem that just seems to, it's continuing to grow is, is going to get us anywhere. So I can't support uh, the motion. That does not mean that I do not hear the neighbor's concerns. I would be happy to um, be involved in, um, you know, efforts to try to address some of those issues, um, you know, aside from just changing the, the, you know, the parking, the size of the parking spaces there. It just, it just does, I just don't see how that's going to get us the relief um, that people are asking for. So I'll be voting no and um, hope that there, we can continue the conversation because I imagine that even with this change, um, those issues aren't going to go away. Okay. With that, um, if there's no further questions or comments, I'll turn it to the um, city clerk to uh, call the roll call vote. The motion before us is that the um, council motion to uphold the appeal um, to, um, to uphold the appeal and move forward with the um, installation of parking uh, and designated shuttle drop-off in addition to red car markings on the 100 block of Olive Street between Mission and Toledo. And yes, and that's it. And in addition to that, uh, direct the, the mayor to write a letter on behalf of the council expressing their support for increasing capacity of safe parking programs um, throughout the county. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Just unmuted. Aye. Brown? No. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that motion passes with Council Members Matthews, Byers, Watkins, Golder, Vice Mayor Myers, and myself voting in favor, and Council Member Brown voting opposed. Okay. Uh, with that, we will move on to the last item on our agenda, which is oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public to address the city council on items that were not on the agenda today. Um, if you would like to comment during oral communications, please call in now. Bert. Numbers on your Bert. screen. You will have uh, two minutes to comment on items that were not on our agenda today. And so after you call in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand uh, and you will have two minutes to speak. First call. 
Yeah, hi, this is Garrett Phillip. Hey, some might think the BLM Street Billboard is a statement condemning systemic police racism, but instead it's the name of the progressive anarcho-terrorist group BLM made up of anti-Trumpers, anti-Fi terrorists, Marxist useful idiot revolutionaries, anarchist destructors, looters, arsonists, vandals, murderers, the violently mentally disturbed criminals, and yes, the oh-so-virtuous leftists who condemn all white people and think black people are incapable of much of anything with Without their help using inflammatory, hyperbolic, dishonest rhetoric. Those who painted the mural in ignorance of this need to watch the hundreds of nonstop nightly videos of violent BLM provocateurs like the assassination attempt video of two police officers in Compton and BLM filthy mouth celebrators shouting, I hope you die in front of their hospital rooms. Even though filmed mostly by Prestifa Antifa BLM sympathizers, that movement's foul-mouthed anarchy despising America is still unmistakably on YouTube every night. Any night will do to view war in America waged by useful idiots ranting lies of police racism between obscenities. Police are not perfect, but do protect us from, among other criminals, the deceitful, violent Marxist anarchist groups hiding behind the First Amendment like the BLM. The BLM have done exactly nothing for black people. It's not their real agenda. The health crisis of BLM arson, looting, murder, assault, and rioting gets unfathomable official silence by the council. Instead, an overblown resolution of racism as a health crisis and BLM endorsement by Billboard plays local politics. The BLM destroys everything it touches. Those who fund and endorse the BLM are not helping black people at all because the violent BLM poisons reality with lies masquerading as justice. Police racism doesn't make the list of real black crises such as the pervasive no responsibility black oppressed victim mentality or the alarming disproportionate ultra violence of some black Black males who commit 50% of all violent crime overwhelmingly against other black people, or the shocking 73% declining percent of black children born outside marriage to single mothers and into a more likely poverty, or the shocking abortion and teen pregnancy rates, or the boys without fathers lacking role models. A vicious cycle repeats itself. Okay. Okay. Um, I only received. Um, uh, sent in the same letter, I requested both for item 20 and this item four minutes. It was sent to you on Friday, I think. And you responded too, although you only mentioned item 20. Uh, we'll go ahead and um, give you four minutes for this item. Okay. All right. Well, there is, of course, a massive increase in unsupported homeless encampments, which are survival spots. You can see them all the way up and down Highway 1. Uh, these are not places where people choose to live because it's a, a wonderful opportunity to be outdoors for a camping experience. But this is a, ma a massive and in reality a real expansion of essentially the expression of need here in Santa Cruz along the levee, along Highway 1, and the Poganip, and elsewhere. It reflects uh, impoverishment through, well, the kinds of things you just passed, like this uh, proposal to drive away uh, vehicles <laughs> from an area uh, and make it more likely that people are going to lose the place that they actually have with a bathroom. It's a, a great move on your part. Um, the show projects that, uh, that Mayor Cummings mentions that do provide real help, but only for a relative few. Well, it's a greater number. Justin is correct when he talks about the increase in the different programs, but it's still a minority of those outside. And the point is not that it's up to the city to provide all the resources, but it's up to the city not to criminalize people whose only resources are what they have themselves, whether it's a vehicle or a tent to stay in place. So where is the documentation that further available housing or shelter or camping spots are, are being made available for those who are forced to leave within 48 hours, as is posted up all along the Poganip and along the levee and is happening probably as this council meets? Uh, missing entirely from the agenda is any discussion of that for these people. Uh, rather, instead, you are concerned with the privileged people uh, who are afraid that their 
children are going to be attacked. Gee, you know, it's interesting. We didn't hear that one child was attacked walking past Alicia Cole's van. Sorry, that just didn't show up. And it's really kind of a form of really nasty bigotry to hear these things repeated again and again, even though they are fears that people have, and one has to respect the fact that some people are afraid. Yeah, they're afraid of black people, too. Does that mean we remove the rights of those people? Well, apparently that's what the council thinks. Particularly troubling also uh, is missing from the agenda you have is any redirection of the police budget to encourage an end to police violence and militarism, which particularly impacts homeless people, as well as black people, which I'm sure Mayor Cummings knows about. Particularly troubling is the sudden appearance of unnecessarily large numbers of police to deal with small problems. Marty Mirabel, also known as Pirate, was pulled down, slammed to the ground for speaking out against police seizure of a friend's home and vehicle. One charge after another, dismissed in court, but dragging him into court in a familiar overcharging scenario that we've seen so blatantly and frequently happening in other cities, often involving serious, if not lethal, violence by police. We're lucky here that the victim didn't get, uh, get didn't, uh, didn't make it to the hospital. Well, he wasn't even offered medical treatment, though he was bleeding, as far as he tells it. We need to fundamentally redirect the SCPD away from the go-to military mass policing response, which I've seen numerous times on Pacific Avenue in response to a minor concern. As far as racial discrimination in Santa Cruz, it's very nice to paint Black Lives Matter on the street in front of City Hall, have the mayor and police chief kneel together. But that means nothing if the same policies, use of force, taser use, lack of transparency continue. If the police continue to roam the Pogan up the levee along Highway 1, destroying camps and property, they violate common decency as well as risk community health for all of us. With nothing on the agenda and nothing likely in the future on these issues, it's the community that brings these issues to the unwilling ears of staff, council, and those with power in the city, even if it disturbs the comfort of those happy with the status quo as others suffer or can't abide the reality of other people suffering. I thank you for listening, if you were. Thank you. Okay, next caller. Uh, hello again. My name is Adam Novak, uh, and as this is sort of the any other business section of the meeting, I have two points I'd like to address. Uh, the first is about police and policing and the police budget. Uh, I still want to see the council investigate alternative approaches to public safety at reduced cost, uh, and I haven't really seen any motion on that, and I'd like the council to make progress in that area. Uh, my second point involves City Manager Martin Bernal uh, and his emergency policies on vending. Uh, I don't think that those policies are justified, uh, and given the prolonged nature of the pandemic health emergency, I think the council should end the city manager's emergency powers and review those policies themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Candace Brown again from um, longtime resident of Eastside. Uh, I just want to bring up a few points. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I mentioned in passing, but I am having a serious technical problem in the fact that the city has changed the access to the agenda attachments, and you have to download the entire thing. It keeps timing out in my tablet and my other computer. And so I have not been able to resolve that problem technically. I've tried different viewers and different PDFs and all kinds of things. So I just wanted to bring it to your attention because it really um, requires people to upgrade their equipment, which is kind of unusual in order to access the attachments. And I think that, again, it's an issue of equity and it's certainly an issue for me as a commissioner. Um, I also wanted to mention that as an accountant, sometimes the city council talks about issues that are very complex when it comes to accounting and fund accounting. And um, it, you know, for instance, the enterprise fund includes debt service and cost allocation. But if you, for instance, with De La Viega, you change that so that it doesn't, it's not no longer an enterprise fund, the debt service and the cost allocation have to go elsewhere. So it does other 
um, budgets, and it could impact the general fund. I just wanted to mention that in general, but it's something that you need to be aware of. So you need to have those levels of details in order to understand the full impact of major projects, not being specific to any in particular other than De La Viega. And, um, and I also wanted to say Black Lives Matter. I'm a white woman. I've been in this community for a long time. And I personally find it very offensive sometimes what Garrett says to the point where it makes me physically upset. And I think that we are a compassionate community. We're going through a lot right now. I want to thank all those that protest in my name while I have to be sequestered in place with my, with my partner that has medical issues. And I want to thank you for that. So thank you very much, Black Lives Matter. Uh, if there are any other people who would like, members of the community who would like to speak to us on items uh, during oral communication that were not on our agenda, now's the time to call in. And after you've called in, please press star nine on your phone. Uh, I don't see any other hands up except for one more speaker. So um, if by the time that person's done, we don't have any more callers, we will move to adjourn our meeting. So next caller. I would like to uh, point out, um, I think you mentioned, maybe I heard you, I heard it only once mentioned that the 800 numbers are not working. Um, a lot of people had probably tried to call in, as myself, I tried calling in on the 800 numbers for the first half an hour when I realized uh, maybe I'll try the other numbers. And I did not hear you mention except for one time, and that was way previous to uh, when I was trying to call in on the previous agenda item. So I, I think we're losing some of our democracy. Um, that's one example. The other example of losing our democracy is th these um, fascist executive orders that are being um, that are being put out by Martine Bernal. And I want to suggest to please uh, fire Martine Bernal. Um, thank you. Okay, seeing no other members of the public who would like to speak to us, uh, that brings us to the conclusion of our meeting. Uh, Council Member Matthews. Quick comment. I had the same kind of um, difficulty that Candace Brown mentioned, downloading an, um, a single agenda item. The whole agenda packet just goes into a spin, and I can't get it to work. So something for IT to troubleshoot, maybe. I'll talk with them. Okay. That sounds good. Uh, you can talk to me. Who's, who's that? Bonnie. Bonnie? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, if there's no further, are there any further comments from council members? Okay, seeing none, um, have a good evening. And I think our next regularly scheduled meeting is for October 13th, and there might be a special meeting regarding the budget between now and then. But uh, thank you all. Council Member Golder. Last one, fill out the doodle, fill out the doodle so we can get those dates on the calendar. Yep, and to <laughs> everyone in the community, uh, please register to vote if you haven't already. It's probably one of the most important things that all of us can do. So thank you all. Have a good evening. <laughs>